Good morning all um, and welcome to the Digital World Built Environment. Um, I am your host for today, uh, Dan Rossiter, um, an uh, Interim Built Environment, um, Head of Built Environment. And before I go through and introduce the session and the main speakers, I just want to go through a quick bit of housekeeping with you all, if you don't mind. Um, so first is first. Um, today, uh, as if you've been to any of our other sessions, like our monthly webinars, this is a listen-only webinar that's being recorded. Uh, so the first part of that means that obviously you won't be able to unmute yourselves to speak, but what we do have is a Q&A function. So you'll be able to see that in your panel, you'll be able to post questions to us. Uh, and those questions can either be technical ones, such as, hang on, I can't hear the audio anymore, what's going on, or why can't I, I see what's meant to be on the screen, um, to technical queries that you want to put to each of the panels. Uh, at the end of each session, there will be the opportunity for, for Q&A and also during the uh, discussion panels, each of the chairs will have access to the Q&A at the same time, which means if you want to ask something in the middle, it may get picked up then or towards the end of the session. So do please ask your questions. We'd like today to be as interactive as possible. In the same way, the webinar is being recorded. So there will be an on-demand version uh, available afterwards as part of it. As you can see here, um, with your technical difficulties, you can work all that out. Uh, and then if you want to actually access the recording um, as part of the session, what you need to do is at the end of the webinar itself, you'll be sent a feedback survey. On completing that survey, you have access to the recording. And at the same time as well, if you want a certificate or similar for CPD, you're able to do so the following way as well. So hopefully as part of this, then at the end of it, you can get your CPD certificate, you're able to access the recording afterwards if you wanted to take more notes or grab any of the sessions that you've missed and are able to ask any questions of us during the day. And quite a packed day we have as well. Uh, so if we could flick through. Um, I've already said who I am, we can skip past my, my title slide. Um, it comes up enough today anyway. Um, so we are currently writing top item, welcome and introduction. So I guess welcome. Um, and we'll move through the various sessions today, uh, trying to attempt uh, some sort of narrative. So you'll see that what we have first is that we have the infamous Paul Morel, uh, who is going to be talking to us about some of the challenges that face the environment, particularly yeah, from a digital context. Um, because what we're looking for is trying to gain insights today out of what are some real changes that digital can provide to us through our sector and we're trying to do so through a number of means and you'll see that after Paul's session um, we have reshaping um, and disruption where what we've done is invited several um, sort of startups you've got Mohammed Sharma, Simon Elliott, George Smithy and Jade Cohen who have joined us to discuss actually that from a startup point of view how are they looking to reshape and disrupt current activities in the way that they are established and the way that they're working um, after a short break, we're going to hear from Margaret McGarth and Hamzim Danny on various bits and pieces on what we can learn from other industries, looking at the way that they've seen what's happening outside of the built environment, and some of the insights they can bring on where some of the problems that Paul might have spoken about um, may have been solved elsewhere and where we can learn from others, um, which will be quite an interesting session, I'm sure. That just takes us through the morning. Uh, and then in the afternoon, then we're going to try and have a more positive spin on things and look at actually where are the value benefits that digital can help provide. So what's happening is we're starting off with social value and we've got Gavin Summerson, who's going to be talking to us all about the way that through innovation and implementing digital, it helps us through um, supporting people and citizens, which will be a fairly interesting session. Um, there's a discussion panel on environmental value, particularly focusing on carbon management and net zero. And through that, we've got the likes of Tim Chapman, who's chairing with Helen Hugh, Adam Bell and Chris uh, Mortensen, who are supporting in that discussion. And as we know at the moment, you know, carbon is quite hot on the agenda um, as we you know, operate today. And then to round us off, then Jonathan Monkley and myself will talk about the economic value that digital can help bring there. So hopefully in addressing the problems, looking at 
the sort of different perspectives, particularly from a startup and from a pan sector point of view, and then focusing on different value capitals, we can get a fairly rounded view of the role digital can play in supporting, innovating, and ultimately transforming our built environment. So I hope that you all can enjoy today's session um, in the way that it's, it's been run. And please, as I mentioned, ask your questions. We'll endeavor to answer all the questions we get and any questions we don't answer, we all look to try and put into um, an outstanding question and answer document afterwards as well. So rest assured, we will visit and look at every single one. And I think to be honest, without further ado, you probably don't want to hear from me. Um, so what we will do is we will move uh, onto our next slide, please, um, which I believe, yes, should be introducing Paul Morell. Um, so thank you for joining us today, Paul. Um, and you know, as it says here, Paul is formerly the government's chief construction advisor. And I imagine most of you like me will be furiously scribbling notes, listening to what Paul has to say. Um, so without further ado, Paul, I will hand it over to you. Um, thanks, Dan, and good morning, everybody. Uh, I should apologise for my throat. I'm in the grip of something unpleasant. Uh, for those of you who fear that Bill Gates is spreading COVID through the internet, I have tested negative. Um, you will have to forgive my voice in the, in the meantime. I'm clicking like mad. There we go. So, so that's my challenge for the day: it is is to explore how digital can transform the built environment to solve systemic issues. And our issues are systemic, uh, and uh, one can't overstress that. So, wouldn't it be great if that annoying little paper clip that, that, that crops up in our? Um, uh, I'm struggling with moving slides on. Is that just me? Uh Okay. Um, wouldn't it be great if that annoying pet could actually do this for us? That's our dream, isn't it? That suddenly, you know, everything will be solved by by our IT. Um, but we do have special challenges as an industry. Uh, BSI have given me three: uh, our unique interface with the land, uh, the fact that we try to design for permanence. I think some of our clients might laugh at that, uh, whilst others clearly can design for obsolescence or at least allow for it. Um, and uh, although our clients have long-term programs, they continue to operate, on, for the most part, on a one-off transactional basis. And I think that last one is the clue to a much bigger series of problems, which is not so much what we do that's the problem, it's how we organise ourselves to do it, and the market in which we do it. Uh, and although I'm not a great fan of death by bullet point, uh, this is quite an important piece of context, I think, because these are the characteristics of this industry in terms of the, the market we operate in and how we respond to it. Um, and they're important because I think any proposition for change needs to be stress tested against these, these forces, uh, which I guess I could sort of briefly summarize, because unless one takes these into account, uh, some of the propositions that we make for advancing will be just dreaming. And the first is how extraordinarily diverse and volatile our demand is. You know, the industry covers everything from a nuclear power station to a kitchen extension in terms of scale. And, and the demand is also volatile as the investment tap gets turned on and off. So it's very hard to organize yourself for a long term program. And that impacts on security of employment, which in turn impacts on recruit, recruitment and so on. So this cuts through everything. It means that we're reactive for the most part. But we wait for the next inquiry. And it's forgivable for industry. If it's never going to get asked to solve the same problem again, why would it develop the perfect solution to it? So we, we t tend to just play it by ear a lot. And then the issue of fragmentation that I'll come back to, which is the extraordinary number of, of, of businesses uh, and their organization into silos. Uh, and uh, the, the difficulty that we seem to find in getting together to agree something uh, uh, collaborative and coordinated. We're not dominated by a small number of major players, which one might say is an advantage in terms of the market. But it does mean that if you want to bring about change, you can't get the six major motor manufacturers or the six major aircraft manufacturers and say why don't we do it this better way uh, because that doesn't work in construction and in a, by comparison with any, any other industry in retail and so on the big players still represent a very small proportion of the market we are highly dependent upon subcontracting which is a factor of the things above I, I, again if you don't know what you're going to be asked to do you don't train up and, and retain a hundred plus board installers if you uh, next week might get asked to do glass screens instead 
And as a consequence of that, the, the, the workforce is highly mobile. Uh, and a high proportion of self-employed. So again, hard to, hard to organize. The barriers to entry are low. If you've got a wheelbarrow and a bank account, you can be in business. Uh, and because for the most part, working capital is provided by the customers. Uh, interim payments, uh, even if they're not front-end loaded, but you only need enough to, to survive for a month. There are, this is a biggie. The relative protection from high levels of foreign competition. You know, that's what's transformed other industries. So we've had to change. Um, or, or we've been competed out. Still quite hard to import a building, although watch this space in terms of increasing fabrication. Remember, that's a revolving door. So we have low levels of innovation and slow take-up. I'm not going to be talking about that. We are, I think McKinsey said we were the second slowest industry. I can't remember what the first one. The second slowest industry to take up digitiz digitization. Uh, but that's a function of all the things we're discussing here. It's not like something we should get blamed for. Um, but the next one is a biggie too, a low understanding of how assets actually create value. Neither the supply nor the demand side really knows the value of the product. Uh, and that means that the next uh, driver, lowest initial capital cost, becomes the principal one. And we've seen the consequences of that, the so-called, the so-called, uh, you know, the dive to the bottom. So there are low, high levels of competition at very low margins. Uh, and then we get the game playing of trying to make the margin out of play in the contract which in turn means opportunistic tendering. Tendering, which in, in, in the worst moments in my career have been bids that people who made them know will not stand up, but they equally know they'll be able to pick them apart and try and make their money through, through uh, game playing later. And then uh, the, the, uh, another huge one, by comparison with other parts of the world, the absence of a feedback loop. How on earth do we learn? And God knows if Grenfell doesn't start to show us the answer to that, uh, then we deserve not to learn. We absolutely have to have a feedback loop. Um, and, and finally, low levels of independent oversight, um, you know, low levels of regulation, if you like, in the context of growth. So all, all of those factors uh, um, play into uh, the way we have to start to consider change. And I shared them in the context of some work I'm doing on Grenfell with a professor in, at Oxford University who specializes in the regulation of industries. And he said he had seen almost all of them before, but never in combination in one industry. So, again, all propositions for change need to be stress tested against the realities of how we operate. And we will not change the culture unless we change the drivers. So you can make up your own list of what you think the big challenges are, but uh, these are the ones which I think are closest in, in the stampede to, towards that. You know, the, the moment anyway, and, and for the foreseeable future. Input cost inflation uh, uh, and the problems that the uncertainty of being able to bid against any kind of stability of, uh, uh, of price. Working left to right, diversity uh, and inclusion, an agenda that affects every industry. Um, and although put it at the back, mental health and all the other issues to do with well being, um, uh, uh, care and respect of staff. Uh, climate change, um, uh, which we'll certainly be saying more about. And then and again, an immediate pressing one, the labor material shortages, which is a combination of recent uh, factors that we'll talk about, but also the aging working population with the, the vast majority or the, the highest proportion of the industry being between 45 and 55, uh, and those people disappearing and therefore the skills disappearing because we are struggling to recruit. And then uh, much bigger than it looks in this picture, the whole issue of building safety, which is very much in all of our minds. Now that's depends, of course, what you think the challenges are, which end of the telescope you look through. Those were our challenges, but our clients, which is what we should be thinking about, have all of those challenges as well in their own businesses for the most part. Uh, and they have challenges of their own when they deal with our industry. And the first is affordability. You know, we seem to congratulate ourselves when the price of construction goes up, but that means our clients can afford less of it. Uh, the market conditions they have to operate in are the same as ours, so their margins are under pressure. Uh, they face competition in the outside world. So investment in construction um, has, to, has to pay back. What I call the industry performance gap, which is how we practically never uh, deliver to our targets. Um, and so again, how do they make investment decisions is unconfidence. And then the building performance gap, which is that buildings do not do what we promised they will do. And as I always say, if, 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 if buildings were cars, we would have a 100% recall rate. Whereas a fraction of 1% recall rate in automotive hits the national news. So, so those are the big things. And then looking broad, 
to, to the influences that we're all living in. The, the twin influences are what I call Brexit 19. Uh, in, in our, you know, we can feel these in our lives every day, uh, whether it's in material shortages, staff shortages, and so on. Uh, so, and the uncertainty that that creates, the extraordinary uh, uh, growth of world population, and the pressure that, that is imposing upon uh, infrastructure. We hit, while I was in Goodman, we hit seven billion uh, and, and, and rising, and, and expected to top out at between nine and ten billion. All of those people demanding infrastructure. Um, uh, and by the way, moving to cities, uh, so, so more and more construction and so on, and all the time generating massive amounts of carbon in, in use of energy, which we can call just another form of waste. These are the challenges we face. And at a, a domestic scale, you know, those granite worktops that we all want, and we're excavating to the center of the earth to find them. So materials depletion, uh, when, when I was growing up, nobody ever said anything might run out, uh, but now it sure as hell might. And never how much we talk about these things and how little we get done. Even those who are talking about it um, you know, at COP and elsewhere are not making much progress. And there are countries outside that conversation altogether um, who, who need to come and, and, and join the party. So massive things. And then uh, remembering Harold Macmillan's famous saying of the thing that he feared most in politics was events, dear boy. There's always something else. There's always something else. So you'd be forgiven if it gets running screaming from the field uh, at this point. Um, but I'd like to calm things down again and talk about our industry uh, in the context of those uh, pressures. Um, and also the two things which are not being trampled underfoot here, I hope, but the technology that might help us. And standards, which I mentioned, not just because it's polite to BSI, but because certainly through the Grenfell work, and maybe for the first time in my life, I've appreciated just how important they are. And also, uh, sometimes we expect too much of them. So I'm only talking about the, the, the uh, things I'm talking about because of the impact of technology. And I do not want to put, put things like mental health and, and respect for staff in the background. It's a real issue. You know, depression in the industry, suicide in the industry. And you may have seen that very moving um, sort of tableau they put up at Leeds, I think, too the number of workers who kill themselves every year, 450 odd workers, construction workers every year. And, um, I, and I'm really put, putting that to the background because they are what I would call JFDI issues. When I was in government, I was asked why I didn't speak more about women in construction and, and, and health and safety. And the answer was because you just have to do it. it there, there isn't like an argument about this. There are two sides of the story. You just have to do it. But it's a kind of reminder that when we get carried away with our, with our technology, and we look to the future of half man, half machine. But over and over again, uh, the problem is not the half that's the machine, it's the half that's human. You know, we're kind of the, the, the problem laid over uh, the, the training conditions that I've already summarized. So I'm going to look back a bit as a way of looking forward. Um, I, I remember that um, uh, Ken Dodd once was to, uh, had his gig to play at Bradford Council because he hadn't changed his act in 25 years and I'm at the same point of my career so forgive me if some of this is familiar but it's it's depressingly familiar in so far as this is stuff started 10 years ago or more and and, it, and it's still with us and I'd like to try and answer the question uh, you know what do I think of it so far and the progress that we've made uh, isn't inconsiderable so for me, it started with a statement I made in, in, in September 2010, that if you wanted to work for government uh, six years thereafter, you would need to be able to operate in a BIM environment. And BIM was a convenient shorthand, I, I make no excuse for using it. Uh, but today we would call it digital twin or digitalization or whatever. Um, um, and that statement was made with no ministerial cover, I might say, but with knowledge that Francis Moore was totally committed to the idea of making progress through, through digital. Uh, and this is the opening slide that I used in, in that presentation of, of the forces that we needed to change. And it could kind of go starts to recap through those opening slides. Uh, my first day in government, I chaired a meeting attended by Peter Madelson, scary experience, uh, in which he threw down this challenge. How can construction effectively deliver a low carbon future? And, and you've heard all the stuff about construction being blamed for. It is the world's biggest consumer of resources and, and the, the single biggest the buildings we make and the people in them, of course contribute to the single biggest source of carbon so, so that was the question. But without, without time at all, the, the priority switched. 
uh, with the election of 2010 and the coalition government and the famous message left by Liam Byrne about the absence of money. Um, and because it's still relevant today, this was the slide, uh, the, the projection that the government produced then uh, of how it had to get back to a, to a, a level of borrowing formerly known as prudent, which is about 40% of GDP. And the answer even then was it's going to take till 2029 to 2030, which is, which is a lifetime. Um, and by the autumn statement of 2015, that's where we were. Um, and and uh, the very least you have to say, we were not in a good place financially, but at least the trend was going down. Uh, and, and against the background of that, Francis Moore's challenge to the industry was to take cost out to make construction more affordable. Because uh, in those tough times of no money, government still needed buildings. Uh, society needed schools and hospitals, housing. Uh, and the industry still needed work. So my my uh, aspiration then was to try and join together those two very difficult pressures. Um, but if you want to know where we are now, uh, in terms of where we sit in terms of uh, uh, debt as important GDP, we're up at that figure at the top of the screen, 109%. So, boy, is money still the problem. Uh, and we're in this difficult place. Too much money, uh, sorry, too much carbon and not enough money. Um, and we're caught between those two things. And those have to remain our major priority. And all the time, my question in looking at whether the industry can respond to this is what are those things which, which prevent it being more uh, responsive? And how could digital play a part in, in, in bridging those over? And I, and I can't keep saying this could be digitalized, but I hope you can kind of hear it behind the text. So the first issue is fragmentation. This was a, this was a slide produced for me when I arrived in, in Whitehall in 2000 and uh, end of 2009 about these are your stakeholders. Um, and, and you just think, oh my God, you know, yeah, I'll, be, I'll be out every day talking to people who never talk to each other. And, and it's, it's, just got, it's kind of more, more complicated than chemistry. Uh, and and the, the annual problem is that those people work in silos and, and still do. And to a degree, a consequence of our, of our class system and, the, and the, you know, the fact that the professions regard themselves different from those who do the work. Uh, but, but, but that too was a major issue on fragmentation. And so, and, Underlying, I say, is this hierarchy problem. This is a lovely cartoon I found, not about construction, but actually it does represent the way we are. You know, and we, we could call it the guano problem rather than the hierarchy problem. We appoint a kind of god architect or engineer who appoints a few co-consultants. And all the way down the bottom there, people actually do the work. Uh, this, this, is a, this is a real issue in, cha in changing things. And of course, it's, it's, it's protected by, to a degree, vested interest. Uh, you know, and I can see people over and over again when talking about change back in those days of 2009 to 12, uh, thinking not would this be better, or would it be better for society, would it be better for our clients, but how is this going to affect my business? And underpinning all of that is an extraordinarily conservative way of thinking. You know, uh, possibly because it's an industry dominated by men, possibly men not much younger than me, uh, conservative thinking still holds sway. And I, and I do remember kind of feeling almost dumb in my day job when I realized that the Game Boy generation had come to work and I couldn't really communicate with them the way they wanted to be communicating. Still a factor, I would say. So all of those things, fragmentation, working in silos, hierarchy within it, and vested interests, those all work together to make it difficult to change things. And so three things I think the industry has, has got wrong with it is upside down, first of all, by which I mean that people, as I say, who actually make the products and put, and put things together and, and do the work are not at the table for the most part when we make plans for change. And digitalization has an ability to reach past that because all of these, digitalization needs to reach all of these people. We're back to front, by which all I mean is in most industries, you know, what you produce is pulled by the value you create by it. Whereas in construction, we tend to just add up the cost and say, that's what it's going to cost you. Do you want it or not? And we don't really connect and allow an understanding of value to pull through. And we can hope the construction playbook will change that, but only if we have the tools to do it. You have a word about that too. But this again is the biggie. Nobody owns the whole crisis. So because it's fragmented, because it's hierarchical, because we work in, in, in silos, if you made a prospect for change, it, it would be problematic. So this is why innovation doesn't work in construction, but because it can't, because of all of those reasons, because when it could, it isn't worth it, because the reality is, because of the absence of foreign competition, and because our own competition and quality is, is quite slight, 
it, 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 you can survive without innovating. And when, in, and when all of that is not true, and it, it can be done and it would be worth it, you still don't have to. And, and, and it's a, an annoying slide, but I think it's, it's the reality of why we can say uh, construction is the second slowest to take up new, new ways of working. Um, you can't go on to say, as I said, it should put itself together. All of these factors need to be taken into account. And the big problem with this course is for clients, of course, is that because we're not in control of it, we make promises about what our product will do with our with our fingers crossed behind our, behind our back. And nowhere more so than in the building performance gap. You know, in, in, in top left and, and, and bottom left energy terms, you know, studies done on buildings, even buildings that were designed to be sustainable, unquote, have been shown to be two or five, or in one extreme example, 14 times the energy consumption after the work's been done uh, when they've been remeasured. And on the right, we make buildings that are expensive or impossible to maintain, and we give our clients a hard landing. And the only thing we can agree about, and I can use this slide on all, as an overlay on most of them, is it, it's somebody else's fault. And it may be. Yeah, um, it, it's the, pro the, the problem of a lack of, of a coordinated action. And the answer to all of that has to be, or one answer has to be integration and the use of uh, digitalization as a tool for integration and create the one, recreate the one unit of success that we know we have, which is a good team. Uh, and for all the frustrations one feels with this industry, constantly saying, why can't we recreate at an institutional or industry level, the extraordinarily high levels of cooperation and collaboration that we show at project level uh, in, in getting things done? So in one of my bad moments, I gave a talk called Integrate You Bastards. It's a very rude way of putting it, but I hope it makes the point powerfully that unless we start to get our act together, none of this stuff will change. And there, and there is an increasing threat uh, from overseas in increasing industrialization. And so BIM for me was kind of wooden horse uh, into, into producing you know, a, a digital means of addressing all of those big problems. So yes, you know, the truth has been heard it all before uh, in a series of reports going back to uh, my, my dad did one of them going back to uh, uh, just after the war. Uh, the messages have been pretty consistent about about what's wrong, and you don't need to read this. But the red arrow just means that digitalization. And I'm going to keep using BIM because it's shorter and easier to say with a sore throat. Um, mm -hmm. Impacts on all of those things and helps in all of those things. And so when we're looking, we're looking at it in 2010, that's why it felt to be something that needed to be made a priority. Needed to be made a priority. So it makes the answers of, of more standardization, more prefabrication, more avoidance of waste. The subject of today's talk kept coming top of the hits, really, is applying and helping all of those things, which is digi digitalizing, digitalization, and use of the tools. The big decisions that we had to make in those days. Uh, are worth looking at in terms of how relevant they are today. The first one was who's it for? Uh, and my view was it was not it was not for the front runners. They will carry on making these. You know, if if you people were talking about like 11 D BIM at one point, and, and God bless you if you if, if you're doing that. But let's let's get the basics right first. And nor was it, I'm afraid, for the back of the field. Somebody would always fall off. But we had to find a way of moving the whole crack of the field forward uh, in a consistent way. And that meant, for the most part, it's something that we still suffer from. That we you know we have to start being realistic about about whether it's understandable, you know, and how many acronyms you can swallow in a, in a day and still be able to talk and think, rather than again just run screaming from the field. So the lack of simplification and comprehensibility in this stuff remains a major barrier to improvement. And I'm not being patronising to say that in the end it has to be understandable on site where the work is done. The realities of doing stuff out in the cold or the wind and the rain. And, and by the way, why would you do it there for the first time if you could do it first and work it out you know, digitally, but you have to communicate it in a way that works in the mud. The only principle set downs uh, were, were important too. There should be no picking winners. You know, uh, more than one person said to me in 2010, why don't you just mandate Revit? And when everyone thought about Revit, that was never going to be an option. You, uh, apart from the fact that governments can't mandate things in that way. It would kill innovation, um, and and so that was another way. But we did want a shared platform, you know, a, a more of an, a, of an app world in, in many ways. It, it, that you shouldn't have a series of competing platforms uh, which which don't work together, and and the energy gets diverted into um, a, the choice of a system rather than the choice of approach. 
So we like the idea of an app for that. And again, you know, would your granddad guess that your uh, you have a mobile phone with an app that turned into a camera, and even that was ten years ago? If we should leave complexity in the supply chain. You know, oh, anybody making rules can't tell the supply chain how to organise itself to in, in a great degree. And that's the theme that will come back. And it should be simplified. We should really just not ask for stuff. Uh, and one of the scary things about, about digitalization is uh, that, that it can do so much uh, that it can do too much. Uh, and, and just because you can do something doesn't mean that you should or you have to. Apart from the fact that you shut the internet down, moving models around at this kind of scale, uh, they become uncomprehensive. And this is really still to me really relevant is whatever you propose should feel in reach of users. Uh, I'm going to hit back at that in a minute too. So the analogy I used then was uh, Kennedy and, and, and the space program. You know, when Kennedy said we put a man on the moon by the end of the 60s, he, he kind of knew already they could do it. He didn't announce it and then say, anybody got any ideas for a space rocket? Um, so we should work on the same sort of kind of basics, which is if we mandate something now, can we actually see how it could be done? And in, in 2009-10, the big issue was, Everybody working at interoperability, hard enough to say, let alone to do. Uh, and it was always a, a bit like you know, um, uh, nuclear fusion. It was always about to happen. It was always a few years away. And it felt like a holy grail that might not be worth chasing. And to be honest, it still does. Um, so how do you get past that? And we could have sat down then and said, you know, without interoperability, we can't do anything. But I'm a huge sayer and uh, believer in G.K. Chesterton saying that the things worth doing is worth doing badly. A principle he clearly applied to his hairstyle. Uh, it doesn't mean do it badly, it means get going, get started, and we'll start solving the problems as we go. Uh, and, and it's not a government's job. You know, government cannot reach under the bonnet and, and fix things. And, and this is the start of, 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 of a movement towards my final slide, which is about us taking responsibility for it. So, government can look at what it can push and what, it, and, 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 uh, uh, what industry has to pull, but that's good. We need to work on incentives for adoption, and we, and we still do. Uh, and we need to improve the quality of conversations with, with each other and between ourselves and government and what we expect of each other. But the offer to government has to be, if you do this, we can and will do that. And that has to have a social benefit, because although they sometimes forget, that's why people are in Parliament. So and another saying I quite like, you know, we make the road by walking it. We get going and we improve it and we improve it and we're still on that journey um uh, and, and the first steps were in starting to get a common understanding of what we're trying to achieve so the view richard's favor and, and, and massive debt to mark view and his people you know, improving this together but an understanding of what the journey might look like the, the, the famous wage you know and and the beginning of standards but if we're going to share an aspiration uh, let's share a, 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 an understanding of actually what, what we're trying to get to and so on. Uh, and a major objective was to balance, therefore, standards and protocols that produce some convergence of practice, uh, but, but, but no more prescription than, than uh, is necessary to do that without killing innovation. Uh, that, that was the balance we were trying to find. And it led to standards and publications, and we've updated to, to the new BS. And I would say there's plenty of criticism of, I, of 19650, and I find it very hard to get to grips with. But the important thing for the industry is unless you've got a better idea, we need to start cohering around some propositions uh, and work to them or we make no progress. And that too is the importance of um, uh, standards in the, in the process. What's it for? Well, when we began, it was just about getting building information modeling going and we had kind of and management in brackets um, because we had to get the stuff downstream and so on. And it was, it was great that the enthusiasm, you know, suddenly we kind of electrified the press, if not the industry, and everyone was talking about bim, 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 and it became not um, if or even when, but how, uh, and that was a good conversation to be having. And yet, and yet, was it really starting, does it really starting to address the issues? And what BIM is really has to be for is addressing these problems of build, buildings being late, over budget, uh, defective because of lack of coordination between the parties and so on. This is what they have to do. They have to contribute to modern methods you know, and producing uh, data that can go straight from the uh, computer to the manufacturer to the site, because that, although this to a degree is, has to be a, a market response to a problem rather than, than a, a government mandate, 
um, those demographic figures about the loss of skills are not going to go away. Uh, and unless you honestly believe we can have a massive recruitment drive, it will suddenly find people who replace those who are leaving. We have to find new ways of doing stuff. And they have to address the performance gap. And you might need to start, we start, start measuring and eliminating waste from the process. And finally, not going away, you know, the ticking time bomb of climate change. And the, the role of digital here is, you know, again, they're saying from my days in government, you know, if cash is king, we have to start counting carbon as its queen. And we have to start loading models with, with, with uh, embodied energy and future consumption. And we have to cut some of our own personal hypocrisy out of this. I, I subscribed to a traveler magazine, which did a feature, which was a sustainability feature. And in it was, a, was an article on, you know, we should all go to the Maldives. And if we did go to the Maldives, we would consume 30,000 gallons of, of, of fuel in each direction, um, enough to run your car for 200 years. So we, we had to start changing both our understanding and our intention in respect of getting energy out. And we have to have to do something about the horror of Grandfell and the lessons of Grandfell. And, 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 and a brief diversion onto that, partly because it's fresh and because it again shows the importance of standards uh, and the way that digitalization can start to help us. It's, it, it's, it's too complicated. You know, the whole world of, stat of, of how things are tested and, uh, and assessed and then brought to the market is too complicated. Right? And standards, therefore, play a critical part in that. You know, you, you can't test something unless you know what you're testing it against. You can't assess or advertise something unless you know what you're, like you're doing that again. Um, and an irony of uh, this is, is that our system is based on the European system. So if there is no European standard for something, we don't assess it at all in this way. So we have a standard for a urinal, but not for a fire door, an internal fire door in Europe. So the absence of standard, this, this is telling us the presence of. Um, and we need, where, we, where we don't have a standard, we need to uh, create one. And where it's not fit for purpose, we need to make it fit for purpose. Because some of those standards do not deliver what we think they will. Not BSI's fault it is what they were designed to do. Uh, and those of you who are old enough to remember Tom Peters' writing, Remember his analysis of, of the analogy of the concrete life jacket. You could make a perfect concrete life jacket every time, as good as the last concrete life jacket. Not a lot of point. Two new big features that we're going to need to understand how to measure um, um, uh, and how to keep track of right through the system safety critical products um, uh, and the general safety requirement being introduced. Uh, um, Possibly controversial, but I, I believe we will need to start some standards that qualify what general safety requirement means. Uh, that, that would not be a popular thought inside government because it starts to prescribe what it might mean and what it means is things are safe. Uh, but standards can only help. I wonder whether we need to use a bit more technology in the testing process as well. There has to come a point, I think, where we stop criticizing the way in which we test for fire. Uh, um, which is basically we keep burning things down until we can't uh, and start thinking about an analogous tests, which probably the most famous one is firing a chicken into a into a jet engine. You know, in what way is that real world? But it tells us what we want to know. Um, uh, uh, and in some, in fact, if you go to BRE, there are facilities standing almost unused because of the substitution of computation fluid dynamics, for example. You know, can we not learn an awful lot more? by more intelligent modeling of buildings and their behavior than we can by testing bits of them, uh, which when they're put to the building will be different anyway. But I think there's a lot of that as a way of preventing the, the horrible pass the parcel game, which the Building Safety Act is meant to protect, prevent, you know, by seeing stuff going downstream, but where in reality you take something on trust, which maybe shouldn't be trusted. And just to put that in context, I spoke at a conference in 2010 uh, for the LABC, and these were examples that Exova gave in the presentation. At the top left is, is a fire separation, a fire compartmentation wall, finishing about 30 centimeters from the soffit. There, there are, you know, fire stopping just gunged around members. There's a fire door you can see the daylight through. There's a, there's a fire door with a leather box that completely breaches the compartment, and so on. Yeah, how you keep all of that track. So the golden thread, uh, an expression which, which dates back actually to about 2013 or 12, 13, certainly the end of my days in government, as what we needed out of out of softer land, soft landings and government soft landings, 
uh, the golden thread needs protecting and that means it needs uh, uh, standards and watching and there will be increased regulation you know i think we have acted like we're not being watched uh, so far uh, i think that will and, and has to change so what do i think of it so far at one level it's bloody amazing you know uh, uh, when one sat down in 2010 and, and made that announcement uh, it was made against the background of knowing that what we were asking for could happen the software houses were there the products were there there were enough members of the industry some some, some fantastic trailblazers uh, and some goodwill uh, we knew it'd be slow to move the whole of government you know I didn't expect, expect the whole of it to move uh, so at that level it's it's amazing but are we nearly there yet mate um, and uh, although we get excited about COVID uh, the year that drove construction to embrace process automation uh, and a quote from uh, Aris Rissanos, um, a, a former war correspondent for journalists, that it was like the pistol shot in 1914, possibly slightly overstated, because in the end, you know, teams will not get buildings built. So we, we, we've kind of learned how to turn this machine on and talk to each other. Uh, but in terms of the, the hard graft, um, you know, people are not still entirely convinced that this has improved their working life. Um, and we are still, we still got to get to grips with the big issue. So what now? Well, we cannot leap at one level to digital built Britain. Um, and I, ha I have some fears about that. Uh, at, at one level, it's like a train set. You know, politicians love the idea of digital built Britain, that you can twiddle a few knobs and make the whole city work. And I don't belittle that. And, and, and Gavin Summerson's going to speak later about, you know, the interconnectedness of places and the importance of that. But, but uh, and we dream that maybe 5G could be the gateway to our transformation. No, it won't be. It could be one more tool. And we're all longing for the day when we can 3D print a robot who will pilot a drone to go out into the field and 3D print a building. But in the meantime, the reality is we've got to start down at the ground. Again, slightly lightheartedly in, in 2010, I, I, I referred to BIM for light bulbs. We were forming groups of BIM for retail, group BIM for housing and so on. In the end, everybody has to get into this game, whatever they make. Um, and, and we're a long way from that. We need to move from lonely BIM um, to integrated team working. Uh, that, that, that's essential. We need to move from the office to the site, you know, to, to the mud, as I put, put it already. Uh, we need to move to level two to level three. And my frustration, and it may be that I'm now out of date, is I can't quite feel what level three is. Uh, you know, we, we, we define level two as what we know how to do now. Uh, um, and I think level three, we know it means having to get data into the model and having to get down to the life cycle. But I personally can't quite feel level three yet uh, and, and how we add you know, to a dumb model and make it intelligent um, and the information that we load into it and how we get down to the asset in use. All of this, and I'm sure this will come up over and over again. Today, it's about data, you know, uh, and the chicken and the egg problem. You know, we, we can't populate models because we don't have data. We don't get data because we don't try and populate models. Uh, so we need to, you know, maybe we need standards about the data that we need, topic by topic, area by area, uh, uh, so that we can have a genuinely soft land. Uh, this is a slide given to me by Billy, who, who was the originator of, of Kobe. Um, and that, that's the maintenance manual for a hospital. And good luck with that. If your air conditioning packs up, the answer somewhere in that box. Uh, so, so you know, it has to be digitalized. The golden thread, you know, in the fullest sense, not in the in the building safety act sense. Uh, that's just one factor that you expect of the golden thread is to keep us safe. We have to get into the into the into the life cycle of a project uh, and have models that tell us not that the, the software is clever. You know, an engineer I spoke to in about 2011 said, you know, you're taking us backwards. We are far, far more advanced than that. And he showed me what, what, what they could do in designing steel work. And I just said, does it tell me when I have to paint it? To which the answer was no. I said, you know, I don't care how clever it was with the client, how clever it was for you to make it. How do I look after it? That's, that's what we need. So sunny up plans, not quite. But I, I, I think we can kind of see where, where they might be. Um, we know what the, the high road looks like. Uh, and what our, which is back to what our clients want, whole life value and quality with a lack of defect, that we use good processes to get there and let's call it high tech, but the, ma the maximum possible use of, of digitalization and low tech is the opposite, the low road. 
lowest cost, um, lowest common denominator design, and the fragmented process. Nobody can enjoy that, can they? That's the way I, I signed on. So how collectively do we do? And we need networks and we need leadership. Um, and if we have leadership, we need to we, we, to coordinate what we're doing. Uh, we have to accept it. We have to buy into leadership. So and I, and I have a, I have massive expectations that I still have of the construction leadership council because if that doesn't work, if we don't accept it as a way of coordinating what we do, who will we accept? Uh, and I, I've invented a new title for, for the CL, uh, CLC. Somebody has to coordinate this show and, and pull it together. And if they do that and show leadership and so on, um, and encourage us all to take ownership of the process, then I think the sunny uplets are in reach. I thank you. No, that was brilliant, Paul. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, so if it's like delay there, I was in the midst of, of finishing off my notes um, and we'll move on to some Q&A. Uh, so thank you for those who've mm -hmm. submitted some questions already. Um, everyone else, feel free to throw your questions in. Um, I guess one or two things I've, I've seen come through, which I think is, it's just slightly vague, but it's always a good one to start with, is that a few points in your presentation, you talked about how uh, we need to make sure that effectively the, the the actual doers, the teams on site, the you know the actual the physical change agents, more of a phrase, actually creating the buildings need to be bought into the change process. Um, but how do we do that? Given that if I went to you know, a local construction site now and I asked them who the construction leadership council were or who's on it or what do they do, they probably couldn't tell me. Um, how do we actually create that connection? Because while we have you know, professional institutes that look after the majority of the kind of on the consultant side and, the, and you know, several trade associations that kind of tie things together. Clearly, there's a drop there somewhere. So what's what's perhaps the answer there? It's, it's obviously a tier, it's a tiered thing. And the point of my of my jigsaw picture analogy of the CLC is that um, we need to put the pieces together and agree who does what. Um, my model for the CLC, and it's not my it's not my model to make, um, is that the best people the CLC has no delivery mechanism, um, and, and you can say so therefore it can't work. But there's fantastic good work being done all over the industry, yeah, usually for nothing, yeah, by good thinkers and good people. But the problem is they tend to address thirty percent of the problem, and usually the same thirty uh, percent, and, and it then goes nowhere. So um, using not necessarily literally you know, BSI standards, but if we said that this is the problem and this is what the answer looks like and what's the journey from here to there look, 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 look like, and who are the best people to do that? So the people would break down the institutional egos that exist currently and say, uh, this, this is for the CLC. X organization did this work for the CLC, for the industry. Uh, and if we got that jigsaw right, then at the higher level, the pieces of work going on. Then are the right people around the table? So you you can't hire the Albert Hall every time you want to solve a problem and say, all, all come and have a have a chip in. But you, we kind of know where the best people to solve any one problem are and who should be at the table uh, without killing it, you know, you know, without overburdening it and so on. And it's a cascade, isn't it? You know, uh, uh, in the end, stuff works because productivity improves, because margins improve. The, the, the thinking behind the BIM mandate was, at a time of no work, uh, the only thing that will really change the industry was tell them, if you want to get work, you have to work in this way. So using government's buying power, which has been a bit less clever, I think, of late, but it's still there. It was by far the biggest uh, industry client, uh, and it was therefore comforting to say, you know, magazine articles saying, well, you know, you're going to have to do it. So in, in the end, if people are persuaded of the benefits, it will, it will cascade down. But it will be slow. I mean, it needs to be realistic, it will be slow. Um, if you'd asked me where we would be in, 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 asked me in 2012, where I thought we'd be now, I would thought we'd have a pretty good idea of 3D BIM, um, uh, level 3 BIM, and that we'd be well on the way to delivering it. We're still a long way from it. So, so we need, we need some new mandates, I think, um, but to agree government set, stepped out, 
uh, and their attention has been focused towards um, a digital bill grid. But I think I think that's you put it together bit by bit. Um, so you've got a proper picture of what would work. That is how we're picking up these technologies and using them or finding that they are working for them. Um, so, so you need more evangelists who will say, you know, would we go back in that way? You know, we would just be adding cost uh, as opposed to thinking, I've got to buy a piece of software that's just a cost. So I think it will cascade. And I, and I don't at all underestimate how hard it is to get from a, a meeting room in Whitehall with two chairs, one from government and, and, and Mark Reynolds now from, uh, from the industry, down to a guy standing in the mud. But it will happen. You know, the technology will there. And of course, you, you, you know, it's, it's it's quite a long time now, probably seven or eight years since, since a lot of this stuff has been gone onto iPad and going out to the field and so on. It will be there. I just think everybody in the industry needs to look at where we're trying to get to. Um, and, and not look so far ahead um, that it becomes an impossible dream. But this is the next step, this is the next step, this is the next step. And I felt a slight loss of that in the great leap forward to digital footprint. Now, oh, that's interesting. Thank you. Um, we've got one or two things coming through, but if, as as host of uh, today, if I can't ask my own question, then then I'd be remiss of myself taking advantage. Um, and I guess one of the things for me, um, and I'll I'll admit my faux pas is I remember that when I came in the industry and when I first uh, met met Mark View and some others, um, my my idea for the future and how to solve it was actually to move to intelligent client contracts and actually something like the construction management form of contract where you need a smart client because all the digital stuff, all the health and safety stuff, you had to almost be a smart client and then you wouldn't need your tier ones, you would coordinate and it would do everything else. And obviously it's not it's not going anywhere near that. Um, I think because of having to you know try and compete out risk and, and move things around. But I think increasingly, at least still from my point of view, Interestingly, you know, when we talk about a lot of the the issues around needing someone to control, say, the performance gap aspects and coordinate and take ownership of the overall process, the incoming bids, I still keep thinking that an intelligent client sort of model would potentially help. And I'm just wondering whether whether you agree with that idea or actually is it more that move as we see now towards alliancing and project bank accounts and that kind of a shared responsibility is actually that better way forward. Um, because I think a lot of it is, is behavioral in that aspect, like you mentioned with the tendering where, and I've, I've seen it where I know people who have gone in on negative tenders to win them because they've spotted, you know, funny bits in the tender documentation that they know they can claim later on and then earn money afterwards. So clearly what we have now is antagonistic encourages antagonistic behavior and actually what what is the what's a more positive state we'd be in okay I'm first on, let me just say about competitive tendering we need it because how else do we measure what we should be paying um secondly i would say that the clients that i work with most and certainly the most intelligent clients would never use it as their only way of choosing it choosing it uh, a contractor or a trade contractor I mean, that tend to use it at a trade contract level a bit. So, yes, by all means, you know, who could criticize the idea of an intelligent client? But firstly, it's a poor industry that demands its clients going to be intelligent, otherwise they'll rip it off you know, and give it the effective job, which is why I feel that we have to uh, start taking ownership of this, um, start taking an alliance between the good and, 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 and marginalizing the uh, and in the context of Grenfell, I've said repeatedly to government, you know, that, that the idea that they're all rotten is, 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 is fundamentally uh, mistaken and also is not helpful. Because, because if you get shouted at the industry, you're all rotten, you will form an alliance between the good and the bad uh, instead of isolating the bad. So there is good stuff out there. There are clients who know how to, how to do a job well. Uh, I personally, I'm only interested in working in two ways. I tend to be a client more than a, 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 on the supply side these days. Uh, and I'm interested in the alignment of interests. And, and to my mind, only two forms of contract do that. You can play variations around them, but construction management, you take all the risk and you share it between you. Uh, but you align interests and you work together to solve the problems. Or oh, design build. Oh, well, which I have to call design, then build. 
where you are hostage to whether you're clear about what your requirements are. But in the end, it's a kind of hard money way of, of forcing collaboration between the supply side on the grounds that they can't make money by arguing that the design is out of sync with their requirements. All of those things are about being realistic about risk and, and what you can unload and what you can share. Uh, so, so I think you're, you're right in thinking that you know, an intelligent approach towards the subject and a, and a, and a proper disposition of risk uh, for big clients with repeat programs and, and, uh, um, is the way to go. And I must have said repeatedly to ministers in 2010 12. If you want a more intelligent answer, you've got to start asking a more intelligent question. And you have to know, you know, how built assets create value for the, for the taxpayer, that being their business, how you communicate those requirements, and then how you, you steer them through. You know, that's what an intelligent client does. But again, I would say that a good industry does not blame its clients for the fact that it's, it's left them with something that's less than they should expect. So it's, so it's ownership. And, and the clue is in the construction leadership council thing. But you can't lead people who won't follow. And, and, and to a degree, you don't have to follow to make a living. Coming back to my point about why we have no innovation. So not the whole answer. Uh, if if uh, for, for a big client, you would say, um, there's absolutely no benefit in not being intelligent about it. Um, but one's look, if all clients were intelligent and intelligence alone got you what you wanted, we wouldn't be having these kind of conversations years after. Uh, the launch of the so it's a slightly fudgy answer, but um, it's both in fact. No, that's all right. I mean, if if we could answer it now, I don't think it would be a an issue worth presenting on, to be honest. Um, and I think it's <laughs> it, and and seeing some of the questions coming through, I think interestingly, it floats back to that point you were raising then about us taking ownership as industry, because a, a few things I've seen come through are. Um, I guess what this is more of a comment than a question. We have to stop looking at government for leadership and get on with solving the problems ourselves. Um, we've got this way of actually, if um, there's uh, some international uh, people who have joined us today, uh, one from Italy saying that actually, if they haven't got government pushing for these things, you know, what's the motivation to start doing them? And I guess, you know, I think frankly, it's you, you do them for yourself, really, because if there's uh, for some of this, but I think it's interesting in that, and I, I take the point that you raised near the start was that we haven't really got uh, a monopoly or a, I guess I might even call it a polyopoly of key players in the sector who can drive that good practice. So if it's not government telling us how to do it, um, is the answer that we should be empowering the CLC to do it? through industry interventions or similar but who, who should who should be telling us what good looks like and what we need to do and if it's ourselves who becomes the face of that perhaps yeah. i think the clc becomes the face of it but it will put a different face up depending on the on the problem and on the, and on the subject um, you know, we, we just have to accept the idea that we want to work together uh, and one of the problems of, a, of a, uh, you know, although we read regularly of, of collusion with all, uh, 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 ring the pricing and so on, for the most part, the industry is fiercely competitive about everything. Um, you know, and, and the client the client suffers a consequence of that. And then they complain about the fact that we, you know, their clients buy by lowest cost. And I don't know how many times I've said in 2010, 12, do you, do you know how to sell by anything other than lowest cost? Show me the value. And I had, you know, the health service was saying, we keep being told we should standardize all of our doors. What's the gain? Yeah, when, when so when, whenever we try and do that, somebody will say, oh, I'll do that for less all, all the time. So uh, I don't have any sort of naive belief about the CLC. But if we have the thing called construction leadership, you know, what else would, where else would you expect that to come from? But we have to volunteer into it. Um, and the point I made about, you know, what I see as the complex ISO for, for BIM, which is much criticized, is a point I made generally. If you haven't got a better idea, if you've got a better idea, bring it to us. If you haven't got a better idea, this is it. Let's buy, let's accept an industry. This is the way we're going to do this. So yes, you know, the, the government mandate, I think, pu pushed things a bit. The expectation would be that people would find, my oh, word, actually, this is better than the way we used to do stuff. Um, I don't think they're totally convinced that it's better to get data about the operation of the building into the building the users have. Uh, and so that's, that's to me, that's the one massive great challenge. To, to me, level three has to mean 
models that have got data in them and data that's useful for, for operators, and that calls for a standard. Uh, but above all, it calls for an absolute determined intent on the part of the whole built environment uh, world to get that information into the hands of their clients. No, certainly. Thank you very much. And I think uh, timing wise, I think that takes us exactly to 10 o'clock. So thank you very much for that, Paul. That was really interesting. Um, and if any other questions come through, I will forward those on. But for now, thank you very much. And uh, if you're staying on, brilliant. If not, uh, have a good rest of your day and thank you. Um, any questions, I'll try and answer them. Thanks. Thank you. Um, in which case then what we're going to do is we're going to move on to our next session now. Um, so anyone uh, who have joined the panel, you're welcome to turn on your cameras and, and jump on now. Um, so we have got uh, our reshaping and disruption session. Um, and what I'll do is I will quickly escape and I will hand over to Mo. Um, so I'll leave that in your capable hands. I believe the questions, Mo, will come to you for this session. Um, and in which case I will say good luck and over to you. Awesome, thanks Dan. <clears throat> Hi everyone, really good to be with you today and thanks a lot for joining us. Thanks a lot to, to BSI and to Dan and the rest of the team for organizing the event today. And thanks a lot to my fellow, fellow panelists who are joining us today to share their thoughts regarding reshaping and disrupting the built environment. So before I start today, we just heard a great talk from Paul who introduced us to a lot of the challenges that the sector is facing, repeatedly said that digitization has a massive role to play or has a role to play within improving the industry, within responding to a lot of the challenges that the industry is facing. And really what we thought today is we'd have a panel discussion around how digital can help and what role do startups have to play within making the industry uh, facilitating the industry and making that transition and, and digitizing further. So my name is Mo. I'm one of the co-founders of Morita. I, uh, I, I previously worked in the construction space itself and I made the jump to the startup scene around three, three and a half years ago. And I'm lucky enough today, as I mentioned, to be joined with three amazing panelists who have all been on a similar journey in uh, one way or the other and that they've started their own companies they're trying to digitize different processes and uh, trying to make the industry more digital so before we we start before we we start properly today and uh, uh, move into the panel discussion i just wanted to reiterate that this is a semi-formal discussion and that we'll be having a conversation around different teams so we highly welcome any questions that can come through while uh, we're presenting. So please send us any questions that you have and we'll make sure to pick them up and answer them throughout the, throughout the discussion. So without further ado, I just wanted to again thank um, Jade, Simon and George for joining us today and uh, for taking the time to be with us. To, to, to start things off, I think uh, one of the one of the questions that I always find more most interesting for anyone who's made the jump into the digitization space within the construction industry is what motivated you and really what, why did you decide that this is something that you want to do as, uh, as entrepreneurs? What, what, what are the challenges really that you're looking to respond to? And why did you think that there was a a gap effectively for the solutions that you're developing. So I, I'd, I'd love to, to hear from all of you, but maybe we can start with Jade first. Well, thanks for that, Mo. Um, and hi everyone who's joining us on the call today as well. Um, I mean, as you say, Mo, like, you know, a lot of us in this call, like all of us, I think, come from um, a similar background in the sense of having that sort of on the ground experience uh, within the construction and design space, uh, and then moving into doing um, the various um, technologies and products that we're building now. I mean, for myself, the um, and my co-founder, the, the main kind of gap that we spotted and the main motivator behind us was the fact that um, despite uh, huge amounts of efforts that were going in during the construction stage, and there's still an awful lot of challenges around gathering the right data to inform strategic decision making on some of the sustainability targets that those companies were going after. So specifically for our case, that was around waste materials data collection, 
and making that as, as quick and efficient as possible. The industry is remarkably paper-based still um, and will remain paper-based for a while yet, we believe. Um, but not only is it paper-based, it's also got an immensely fragmented supply chain. I think one of the challenges that we've all had um, uh, moving in this space over the last few decades is how do we gather as much information and intelligence from the wider supply chain as consistently and easily as possible. So the main motivator for us and the reason why we kind of focus in this space um, uh, as Qflow was specifically around making infrastructure more stable, making it less um, resource intensive and less wasteful. Um, and that's, that's the kind of problem that we came in with. Uh, the main gap was very much around that inefficiency piece, which we'd experienced ourselves um, through previous roles uh, that we've been involved with as well. Awesome. George, I think you're country. I'm also standard, standard comment. Yeah, no, I think I'll I'll jump on the back of that. You know, I we I I mean I, we were almost selfish in a way in terms of the reason that we started, you know, building index. So myself and Aaron both civil engineers and both worked in industry ten years. The fact that we were having to at the end of the day go back and report to you know our program managers, to our quality teams, to our health and safety teams, to our commercial teams after a full day's work just you know it was it was ridiculous you know we were there until nine ten o'clock at night just writing reports keeping on top of progress you know working on crossrail which was you know the biggest project in europe at the time and you're just sort of thinking this is crazy and i'm not the only person doing this so you know we started building index which is you know it's a field tool driven by the induction process which then allows communication up and down the chain it was really off the back of our own frustrations our own inefficiencies um, and being selfish with it but then actually realizing that we're not being selfish we're actually just recognizing a really big issue and a really big stigma across the industry that is what we were doing on a daily basis so yeah i mean that's 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 my explanation behind it all thanks a lot for that george and simon i'm curious because i think all three of us here have had worked in the space before i know you've worked in a number of spaces and you eventually got drawn into the industry, so re really curious to hear from you on. Yeah, I didn't mind. Thanks so much again for inviting us on, for inviting one group on today. Um, so we focused on safety and compliance um, in the construction industry, um, much like some other panelists as well. Um, and it's about this ecosystem, right? So I had worked in different industries before coming to construction tech. I was in the digital transformation within within health tech, and the, the biggest problem we had, it, it sort of talks to what Paul mentioned um, in, his, in his opening address. Uh, we're talking about fragmentation and no one owns the entire process. So for us, it's about, and it was the same in the medical industry as it is um, in the construction industry, it is fragmented, but everyone has to belong to the similar ecosystem. They have to share information. Um, and for us, it's really about engaging the, the worker on site. Um, that's the problem we're trying to solve because that's why I believe digital transformation hasn't really taken hold um, in this industry. It's because we're not really engaging the people that hold the most data and the most, I guess, reluctant to engage in a digital process. And that is, you know, those on site, those that just want to get off processes um, and get on the tools and, and do the job that they need to do. Um, so we we saw an opportunity to engage uh, the, the site worker, do a bottom-up approach when it comes to safety and compliance. Of course, there's um, the the environmental impact, environmental impact you can achieve through through lack of paper, um, but but mainly it's about that individual, getting them to understand you know, what is their safety journey, um, understanding the importance for themselves and for others, so they can go home safe to their families, and so they can build buildings um, that that also are safe for others to 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 inter inter interrelate with, uh, you know, in, in that sort of lifetime that that, that building is 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 here for. Um, so digital transformation for us is not strictly in terms of efficiencies or savings. It's really about enabling safety professionals um, on site um, and, and, and off site um, so that they, you know, they can capture this information with confidence through a digital process, but they can really engage on a personal level to guide and form and probably create like that, that better outcomes for all stakeholders. Awesome. I guess everyone here in one way or the other is focused on data collection and, um, and reporting. And Jade, you, you mentioned the industry is heavily paper-based and, and um, 
in many ways. And even if it's not paper based, it's PDF based. <laughs> but the rea the reality is, it's a really analog industry where a lot of a lot of things are being done completely manually. I guess w one of the questions that I have on my mind is, when you think of um, disruption, effectively, do do you do, do you think that moving out of paper based processes and PDF based processes into this world where um, we have data is it is that disruptive in and of itself um, when you think of disruption do you think of it as a one-off event or do you think of it as something that will happen incrementally over time yeah it's a it's a really interesting question this um and it's something that keeps coming up in conversations as well um i mean it, people might find, assign different definitions to this but for me the disruption really comes in the impact that something is having not necessarily the technique that's used to create some sort of workflow change or otherwise in the sector and actually i think simon picked up on this point very nicely just now which is around you know we're, we're here talking about disruption and um digital technologies and and adaptations and actually digital transformation doesn't always just mean the implementation of entirely new methods or entirely new approaches or anything else um it's also around that culture shift of how we use and um manage existing whether it's data or analytics or other systems that we've that we've got um, and how we're, we're gradually adapting to those and i think that is a cultural shift that the industry is on its journey towards or on its journey through rather um and i still think there's, there's a little bit further to go with that but to come back to the original point of um what disruption actually is I mean, for us it's it's funny because cuba is actually um when you're looking on the surface it seems like a very bizarre workaround to a problem um the tool itself collects data on materials and waste and the way that we do that is by utilising existing documents, paper or PDF, as you've mentioned there, digitising those and providing a standardised um, repository of data for those construction teams to use for sustainability reporting, for as-built models, for various other forecasts that need to be made. Um, and actually, it seems um, it seems pretty crazy to use that as a solution because you know if you manage to get this data back from a, in a sort of semi-consistent format from the supply chain already, then there, there wouldn't necessarily um, be as much of a focus on this type of product. But um, the reality is that doesn't um, that doesn't exist. And for us, we um, our focus on innovation and driving change, um, which for us is, as I mentioned, around ultimately allowing organisations to move towards net zero carbon and much more efficient um, ways of working during the build phase. Um, and in order to achieve that, we've developed something that we know is going to be low friction for implementation. We know is going to adapt to existing workflows, which might not be optimal, but are very well cemented within this industry and we're going to use that to make sure they can tap into the existing data that they should already have at their fingertips it's just not very readily accessible um, and to us that's disruptive because it means that we now have access to data that we wouldn't have had beforehand and we can now do all these other amazing things with it um, and so to me the outcome there is disruptive even though the technology or the method behind it might seem a little bit bizarre um, and not going to the industry saying right completely get rid of you know, existing documentation workflows, let's do a new way of working because the challenge we see is that you then require consistency across the entire supply chain for that to happen. I don't know if that's something else to your question, but I'm sure there's um I'm sure all of us in this call actually probably have different views in terms of what what that actually means by disruption, uh, especially if you come from the space as well. I think I think that the one thing that resonates with me from what you just said there, Jade, was barrier to entry. And I think, you know, what we need to make sure and what when you implement a new tool is being able to have everybody in that vertical supply chain with the, the lowest barrier to entry as possible. So, you know, coming back to what Simon said, it's really important that the blue collar at the coalface are able to input information because that information is critical to, you know, the workflows of the project team and delivering the project on time on budget you know, all of these parameters that we set. So I think, yeah, you're exactly right. You know, it's a it's a transition and, you know, the transition from moving from paper to PDF to data points to, you know, whatever else we might move to in the future is going to take time. It's not a, a, you know, a workaround we're going to get over in the next couple of years. But what I believe and what's really important about, you know, the companies that you work with in your supply chains, we consider ourselves part of the supply chain. You know, we're just, we're a subcontractor, we're a partner, we're a, an innovator alongside every single construction company we work with. And it's about going on the journey with them. And, you know, we talked about this a couple of days ago, um, Nemo and Jay, and I know Simon, you're down in Oz, so we're in part of the conversation, but it's all about, you know, 
being able to go on that journey together and it might start off that it's incremental but it will turn into something much larger and that digital transformation we need to see it as a long-term goal rather than an overnight change so yeah i love what you said just then george about um about just being another subcontractor um, and that goes a lot to, to how we approach digital transformation i think um, in the industry because you know there is a there is a barrier there is a friction that happens um, when you try to change processes and uh, we we have to we have to think about evolution not revolution um, buildings will still go up without us um, we're there to prove ourselves um, on every job that we're on every project that we participate in uh, that we can we can do it a better way that we're a better hammer sure, definitely I think one of one of the key one of the key things that's coming out of everything that you're all saying is technology in many ways is another tool within the vast range of tools that we as a sector have and are used to and um, these tools effectively should be used to support the decision making and the processes that we currently have and it, it, it's not necessarily about completely rewiring the process as much as it's about making it more efficient or providing better tools in order in order to get the best outcomes uh, really i think what, one of the things that i was thinking about though uh, when also when paul was speaking highlighting that integration is one of the biggest challenges mm. i think the I, I think it, uh, there were multiple there were multiple comments that were made there. One, there was a comment that was made around COVID. In many ways, a lot of people say that has it's propelled um, a lot of the industry forward and a lot of industries forward because they've had to digitize. On the other hand, we also talked about integration, and um, to a degree, there was also a mention of automation. I guess from where I, from where I'm sitting and the discussion that's happening, I think immediately. The, the the first benefit of these types of technologies is we can improve the way that people start communicating with each other. Zoom and so on and for, so forth are examples of that. But then from what you're saying also, there are these tools that can support site and that can support office, that can break the silos that exist between them and that can enable that communication to help more seamlessly. But I guess, how do you think about communication and the role that, that you play there? And then where do you see the industry moving forward, going beyond uh, communication related problems and uh, moving into other effectively opportunities? What are the opportunities that you see beyond, beyond this? Uh, I don't know whether we just jump in there, um, Bo, but... The, the, the way I see the, the purpose of digital transformation um, is to shine a light in all the dark places, right? Um, and uh, yeah, that's that's what aids communication, reduces conflict, um, creates efficiencies. But we're, we're here just to shine a light on all the dark places where um, data hides and it's and you know, we surface it up. Um, I think communication then also goes beyond uh, just obviously you know human to human conversation. We're also talking about integration, integration between um, products. And, uh, and again, I just from past industries, I think you can learn something from past industries, but construction is fundamentally different, right? Um, and I think that's important to know is that um, it is an industry in itself. If we could just take lessons from other industries and just, you know, shoehorn it into, um, into construction, then construction would have been in probably a different place in terms of digital transformation factors. It is different, um, but, but taking that lesson of the that from other industries around the the big bang of one size fits all one big product um, versus an integrated um, stack of technology that needs to communicate that needs to integrate uh, for me the answer is, is is always there's going to be some form of integration and and the, the biggest the, we should be here to support the customer's tech stack right whatever they choose whatever products they've they've engaged with that they like to use to to digitally transform on their sites and within their businesses, we should be supporting the free flow of information between all our respective um, tools. Um, so that, you know, we're doing what's best for the customer and we're all sort of raising the industry as a whole. Um, I, I think that's that's the most important aspect of, um, 
of, of you know, moving forward in terms of digital transformation and, and products working together. Um, and I think that's the one lesson we can take from other industries as well. I think I'd yeah, jump in on the back of that, Simon. I think again, you know, coming back to supply chain subcontractors, you know, we choose specialists to come in and deliver groundworks. We choose specialists to come in and do M&E. The breakdown between those and why we're not efficient is almost always the communication and the ramifications of them working next to each other, handing on all that sort of stuff. It's exactly the same. If we've got two different technology stacks, two different technologies that aren't talking to each other, we've got a breakdown in communication. Therefore, you know, we're not gonna we're not gonna make the the, the process more efficient. So yeah, it's all about you know, and and everyone you know, it's almost become a one of those words that everyone sort of speaks about. You know, having that that API, that open API. Everyone always asks for it, and you know, just make you know, it is so important though. You know, it is something that is going to change the way that you know data flows we can't be good at everything um you know we have to pick what we're good at and then we need to rely on others to be good at other areas and that's how we're going to be efficient that's how we're going to you know do things better yeah definitely and i mean we've also seen this transition as well from companies utilizing very close systems to starting to use more uh kind of comprehensive but sort of integrated stack of different different providers i think the main challenge just presents is that and this is where actually where the opportunity lies as well, is that there then needs to be a central way for these organisations to start to work out where the data flows are going so they're not missing out on opportunities. The, one of the biggest challenges we see is that you know, we have a series of integrations and I think if anybody looking at new technology providers understanding that openness to this is absolutely critical. Um, but even with all the integrations that, that we hold at the moment, um, there are some um, you know, organizations that are so large, um, some teams within those organizations don't even realize integration exists or aren't utilizing it, and so therefore the value um, cannot necessarily get tapped into. And that's more of an awareness piece, and I also think that comes back to the culture around digital transformation and, and getting used to how these things can now embed themselves within organizations. Now you're dealing with what could be a wider range of technology providers rather than just one single one to do everything that's needed. So I think there's there's definitely a piece there around um, from a sort of organisation perspective who are utilising these different providers, making sure that there are methods and people within those organisations to manage that what could be um, a sort of complex stream of different data feeds going to different places, all with enormous value behind it, but it needs to be capitalised on, needs to be utilised in the right way. And that's also our job as well, is to make that as simple as we possibly can do um, and to make sure that that can be embedded uh, within organisations and, and and into those right workflows. Um, but a challenge for, for everybody in the supply chain, I think, to make sure that we're kind of fully on board with that um, and, and open to exploring some of those new channels that data sharing might present. One of, one of the points you made um, a few days ago when we were talking, Jade, was it's almost better to have, it's most important to check the culture of the company that you're starting to work with. So it's almost better to have uh, a company that currently does not have an API, so to speak, or does not have the integrations, but is willing to go on that journey and be really open and who it's going to integrate with and not, not really control the integrations in, in, in the way that uh, often happens versus just like effectively already having an API and, and having integrations. I was wondering if you could just say a, few, a bit about that because I thought that that, that was quite, an, quite a powerful way of framing the importance of culture and all of this rather than just thinking of the technical stuff yeah sure so so for context this was um so we were having a conversation around um what advice we might give other organizations in terms of uptake of new digital technologies um and there's a lot of ways you can slice this but one of the things that came up as you mentioned there Mo, was um this idea of data connectivity and interoperability and apis integrations etc and one of the things we've come across is that actually there, there could be, um, you know, technically integrations can happen. It's not rocket science. Um, I think it very much depends on the organisations involved and, and the vendors involved with regards to their openness around integrating, regardless of whether an API might already be available. So, um, yeah, there's a, there's a comment from myself saying, you know, suggesting that actually if you're working with organisations, small or large, we don't necessarily have an API already available, but are open to either developing one or making the integrations happen with other party tools, third party tools, then that was a better um, signal to look out for in a potential vendor, let's say, 
than um, somebody else who might already have um, existing APIs but have them on a closed down basis, um, which might mean that they're selective for integrating with certain other tools or, or anything else really. And I think a lot of this also comes down to um, there's another point we've been uh, it's come up in some of our other conversations recently around um, sort of building that trust with with new clients and new organisations that we're partnering or working with. You know, we um, they're trusting us to be honest and transparent with them, and we're trusting them that they're going to ultimately be able to get some value out of this tool, and and we can work with them to to utilise that in the right way. Um, but it also relies on us um, within the supply chain to be very genuine with the organisations we're working with um, to make sure that our objectives are ultimately aligned because that's what creates a really good partnership is when the objectives of the client organization we're working with and our objectives for how we're going to be supporting those are very much um, on the same page yeah 100% and I think yeah at least the, the ecosystem of the sort of the startups that we're all a community of you know having that ecosystem and knowing what each of us are doing is really really important as well I find because I've been on, you know, numerous calls with different clients, whether prospective clients or current clients, and asking, you know, actually asking for a bit of advice on, you know, what works, what have you seen working before, you know, do you think this would work, and being able to understand, you know, that transition of where the data flows and stuff like that is really, really important, but also seeing and understanding how other businesses will use that data and, you know, whether or not you can leverage it in a in a good way. You know, it's really, really important to yeah, build those relationships, have those relationships, but also have other companies around you supporting those clients as well. Yeah, it's it's great, great conversation, guys, especially around, you know, what you were saying, Jade, about the fact that, you know, if you've got a closed API or I like to think like no integrations are, 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 you know, are exactly the same. You might have an API, but it's closed down um, and there's it's, it's almost like just ticking a box, right? You're not actually really engaging. And, and what I'd like to say to my customers, again, just getting that concept that, you know, we're here to support your ecosystem. Um, I, I say to customers that, you know, it's 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 really, um, they're the ones with a lot of power, that, that if you're not willing to integrate, if you're not willing to come on a journey, if you're not willing to support our tech stack, then um, it may well be that we still need to use you now, but, just be on notice if you're a vendor and you and you close got a closed API or not willing to go on a journey with us that we may swap you out in the future. So if you want that kind of relationship, then that's fine because let's face it, we can't we can't change things on a whim. But you're just on notice because as an organisation, we expect that you as a vendor should support us in our in our journey, um, and that means integrating and that means being supporting us and 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 the way in which we want to digitally transform. Uh, not necessarily, which may not necessarily be the way in which you want us to digitally transform. That, that, that's actually, that's a really, the swapping point is, is a really, really good point. A lot of the clients that we've been speaking to are moving away from having one big system. Think of a, an SAP or like any, any, any system that's just one massive like system as, and what they're really looking for is moving towards more modular systems, a modular tech stack, so that they can take different pieces of the Lego effectively, which we, we end up all being a part of, and then they can have the technology that works for the specific purpose that it works for. And if they then feel that something else has come that they think is now more relevant or more useful, they they should be able to swap it out effectively within um, that system. So I I, re I really like the, the the way that you uh, described it there. I think one of one of the other key questions that I I suppose I have to you coming out of this is how did you go about building trust with your clients? You're just starting out. Forget where you're at now um, necessarily. We heard from uh, Paul, for example, mentioning like the government mandates and effectively trying to mandate people to use technology in, in, in one way or the other. You started the new technology companies. You had, I'm sure, to build business cases to get people on board. You had to establish trust with that client base in one way or the other as a new entrant to this um, complicated industry where also, many times the projects themselves will last far longer than us, 
as, as as companies in some cases. So I, I'm just curious, how did you go about building that trust? How did you start in that in, in that journey? And I, I think starting with Simon here would be interesting because I, I, I have I think some of it relates at least to integration and being really open and comfortable with integrating it in, in the get-go. Yeah, uh, thanks, thanks, Mo. And uh, again, a, a really important thing and something I had to, I mean, I've been in construction tech now for, for you know, going on six years. Um, so I had to, I, I just fell in love with it because I thought it was in the same place that, that, that the health tech space was 20 years before. Um, in some cases, the health tech space still hasn't, you know, improved that much either. But um, but but for me it was I I, I from day one um, I want to get on site um, and and just um, understand from the ground up what it was like um, to to work on site and to be on site and to and to be there at the friction points you know when you got the concrete pour and everyone's scrambling um, I, I understand you know that the real the the, the urgencies um, and the, and the times when people just get frustrated with different processes. And I've actually carried that through to um, growing, uh, you know, one breadcrumb. Um, so, yeah, this is the, the second company in the space, in the construction tech space. And I want to make sure in, in this company that I set a KPI um, around attending site. So uh, everyone in the organisation has to attend site, um, you know, once once a month at least. Um, and there's many reasons why you can be invited on site, and um, and and even if it's just to observe. Uh, because we're bringing in a lot of people into the construction tech space that may not have been exposed to what it's like to, to be at the coalface. And that's the only way you can really truly understand um, the whole ecosystem is if you see it all come together. Uh, and then it goes back to what George said before, right? It's about the uh, humility of the fact that we're not here to, we're not here to, to, to force, um, uh, you know, new change on, on the industry. We're here to be like any other subcontractor. We're here um, just as another another tool that you can use to be more efficient on site, more safe on site, more compliant, um, building better buildings, having better outcomes. Now that's what we're here for. Um, and that requires us to think of ourselves as a construction company first um, and you know, a, a digital change agent or a, or a software company second. Uh, and, and, and that's how you build trust. You, you, you're, you're, you're at the coalface, you go in with humility. You, you demonstrate also, um, you know, you, when you when we go on site, we make sure that that we're the the role models that we're trying to promote. Um, not everyone, for instance, will wear here in in uh, Australia. You've been probably the same with the UK. You've got to have long sleeves, for instance. Um, that's a requirement. Um, and uh, and there's lots of people who turn up on site with short sleeves, right? Just because on the hot days, it makes sense. Um, they they get away with it, but it's not compliant. We'll make sure that we always demonstrate. Um, and try to demonstrate the, you know, the role model for for what we're trying to encourage everyone to to, to do um, on site. So that's how we try to gain gain trust. Be there at the coalface, um, go on with humility, try and demonstrate um, that that uh, you know we're a role model and, and we're trying to improve the industry as a whole. Yeah. Go on, Dad. I think you were going to go. You go. <laughs> Cheers. Um, probably we're going to say something relatively similar here in respect, but um, but I yeah, there's a lot that I agree with um, something you just mentioned there, and I mean for us a lot of it was around yeah you know, for, for our very early stage customers, um, we had credibility in the space from sort of knowing sort of the problem space beforehand and having done literally the same jobs. And that helps to a certain extent. At least it helps you. It helps you listen better to those early conversations. So one of the things that helped us in terms of gathering that initial trust with customers, especially the, the very early doctors and Canary Wharf contractors were a fantastic group for us um, as, um, as our first customer to deploy the product. And um, I distinctly remember through very early conversations with them, there's, you know, we came in, and we were remarkably honest and transparent about the stage of our product and um, the stage that they were at with us in this journey. But again, the goals were very much aligned, the objectives were aligned in that they had a specific problem around materials tracking and we wanted to develop a specific solution that helped solve that problem and so they were patient to work with us we were transparent with them with regards to stages and timings and everything else and that helped very early days and even though the product has you know enormously evolved since um and that was the the sort of the initial sort of first release if you like um in that live environment it was um it genuinely solved 
it genuinely solve a pain point. And it solved a very specific pain point that they've been struggling with up until that point. And as we found with other customers that we've worked with since. And I think that ability to be transparent and to genuinely listen to what could have been quite an easily overlooked problem um, had you not been listening as intently, um, that was also what built trust because they could see that we were genuinely interested and genuinely wanted to help solve this problem for them because we had the same objective um, versus trying to create something that kind of solved a halfway problem or something that was adjacent to it. Um, and I think that's what that's what really helped us for earlier days. It's something we, we still maintain now as part of our own culture. Um, we very much make sure that similar, we, we take a sort of almost a, a construction first kind of approach in terms of, um, you know, we're very much um, as born from this sector um, and that's where our objectives lie as well. Um, but we we always make sure to, with existing customers, new customers, any discovery work that we're doing, um, there is such a focus on listening to what could be a hundred words and there'll be two or three words within that that really give you that understanding of what the actual problem is and some problems in construction are very easy to misunderstand uh, because the workflows might not make sense or there's logic somewhere but there's logic in, in the madness sort of thing um, and if you find that logic you'll then know how to solve it but you have to be very respectful of the way that construction currently operates to do that yeah uh, definitely, I, you know, I agree with with both with both of what you just said there. I think a couple of extra little bits on top. Um, I just sort of say is, you know, when we first got in, it was very much, you know, we we managed to convince someone to give us a go um, three and a half years ago, and really the way that we have grown um, up until very recently has been very much word of mouth. It's been someone's used us who's then either moved somewhere else or has said to a friend or said to a colleague the industry is really small you know everybody knows everybody um especially here in the uk obviously that's different when you when you go abroad but in the uk everyone sort of knows everybody so when they've got something good and it, and it adds value they tell other people about it so it's you know it's perfect it's its own little sort of sales cycle and it also breaks down that first barrier of that first conversation because you know, you don't have to have that first conversation. They already know the product is is, is useful and, and giving them ROI. Um, the other thing that we're really conscious of is we have aligned our um, organogram almost, let's, let's say, with the same titles as people out on the ground. So we have operations team. You know, our operations team are section engineers, agents, project managers, those sorts of people who have been there, done it. You know, they're, they're, they're very similar to the founding team. Um, we are all, you know, of the same mindset. We want to change the industry. We're really passionate about the industry. We love what we do, but we want to try and help improve it. So, yeah, there's a couple of extra bits that, that we really concentrate on. I think one, one question that I guess I have there is, uh, uh, there is a lot that's being talked about when it comes to having a mix of different skill sets within the industry and attracting people from outside of the industry. I think a few of us here are, were previously obviously in the industry and I'm, I'm curious, how do you think about that reskilling on, on the one hand and how do you think about startups and the culture, the diversity culture that they may potentially bring to the industry? Even if you yourself come from the industry uh, i suppose like how do you think about your team as a whole and and making sure that there is that diversity coming into the industry yeah so i mean look go on jade Sorry, go on. <laughs> <laughs> um I, I think that there's there's two aspects to this i think the the, the first that we've seen actually has been really interesting recently is that we've seen a few organizations we work with um clients of ours who have started to build up um either data analysts or data science teams internally um, and uh, coming back to the points we were talking about earlier, the responsibility behind that is to ensure that the sort of the, the web of softwares and data flows that they have across the organisations are managed and capitalised on. I think that's been a very interesting adjustment we've seen, particularly over the last 12 to 18 months. Um, and I think it's, it's needed as part of the wider digital transformation piece as well, because this is around, you know, we're ultimately um, adjusting the types of roles that traditionally sit within construction, you know, it's, there's um, being a civil engineer and then there's being a digitally enabled civil engineer. And actually the two can be quite different um, depending on what background you may have come from. So that's a definitely a really important point and one that we're quite excited to see 
um, interesting within our own team, we have um, perhaps similar, um, or not, not too dissimilar, we have, um, we have a, a, you know, a few people within the team who come from a sort of construction background or construction tech background. We have an awful lot of team members who don't at all, uh, who come from adjacent sectors. Um, but from a technology perspective, this is where lessons can, you know, the implementation on site, I think absolutely requires very, um, very good understanding of construction workflows, which you can come from the background or you can't, it can be learned, I believe, uh, but it helps if you come from that, that space, of course, um, with the learning curve. But um, I also think the blend with people who haven't experienced second before is enormous. We've seen that with regards to new product development. So there'll be workflows that, that we can kind of speculate on and make sense. Um, and they've been questioned in the right way by other members of our team who don't come from the space and other solutions have been provided because they've been utilised in other sectors, uh, whether that's um, you know, fintech or marketing or whatever else. And actually, that makes a lot of sense um, in terms of the way we can implement that into our own product. And we wouldn't have known that had we not had that element of exposure within our team. So I do think the blend is important, but I think from a certainly from a customer success or customer focused um, um, angle, uh, certainly getting as much exposure or understanding those on-site members in that space as much as possible is absolutely critical to any construction type of pop tech that's operating in the space. Yeah, I mean, look, to, to be a true innovator, you need to challenge everything, right? And um, to be able to challenge everything, you need to be able to receive questions from multiple different sources. And, uh, you know, just receiving questions from civil engineers, you're not going to uh, <laughs> you're not going to get many good answers. I, I don't think, you know, civil engineers are great. I'm one. But, you know, we need a, we need to be challenged by, you know, everybody. And the more challenging you can bring into the business, uh, the more successful the business is going to be, the more successful the industry is going to be. So. Yeah, and I think I mean I'm I'm lucky that I've got co-founders um, who who come from industry, um, and we. So I, I guess in that diversity aspect, um, in some ways, you know, construction and uh, and digital or or IT you know software doesn't generally lend itself to a lot of diversity, um, but um, we as a company uh, we we we've created a a, a a diverse team, um, and and, that's, and 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 anything again, we can. I, I think digital transformation opens up the door to to farm. You know, people who maybe didn't think of construction as an industry that they move into. This is another area now that that um, people who perhaps haven't thought about it before can can get involved in. And what is an exciting industry? Right? We all love to see buildings go up and, and being completed and being a part of you know, doing our small part to, to helping you know, great things happen. Um, so as I said, we to, to bring people on the journey, we, we get people on site, uh, we we draw on internal expertise um, and and we have have internal training sessions. We purposely go out and find um, diversity and, and hire for talent and for attitude. Um, and uh, and yeah, just we, we try our best to to um, to to I guess widen um, the, the, the type of workforce that is involved in, in the construction industry as a whole. Yeah, uh, with with us, it's actually quite similar. So I'm I'm the guy who comes from the industry and um, I had like very specific ideas. I think around what I want. I knew what problems we wanted to solve, and I had a specific idea of what the product would look like in the early days. And I was joined by my co-founder who worked in finance before, had nothing to do with construction, like just tech background. And I feel our offering as a company um, would have looked really different if it was just me um, rather than having that, like, especially I'm, I'm talking like the first year effectively in the, in the really early days. It would have looked really different if it was just my angle at it. The, the, the product took the fundamentally different shape because of the, because of the fact that we had someone from the industry and, and someone who's not in the industry. And um, mm -hmm. I think that that's also an important point because what, and we almost all of us touched on it in, in one way or the other. I think having under, an understanding of the nuances of the industry when dealing with it is important. So we need, there's a balance between having that diversity and having that mix of people and skill sets and experiences within the within a company but having some 
form of experience of what do these processes look like? What are the challenges? Having felt it in one way or the other uh, definitely gives an advantage in one way or the other because you're seeing a lot of tech companies that will like almost all come without industry experience and then they'll fall into some of the common pitfalls or some of the, 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 the challenges that they wouldn't have necessarily seen had they, um, had they actually been in the industry to begin with. So, so definitely agree with, with all of your comments. I suppose in, in, in relation to this, when it, when it comes to implementing your solutions and uh, guiding people to implementing them, how do you set them up for success in, in the best way possible? What tips do you have for people who are looking to implement either your technologies or other technologies more generally? to ensure that they're getting the most out of them and that these implementations are successful. Maybe George, if you want to go take that one first. Yeah, of course, yeah. Um, the implementation is is key, is key. Um, we always, you know, it's concentrating on making sure a client successfully implements the product because at the end of the day, they're going to stick with you. They're going to help you develop your product. They're going to get success from it. They're going to get value from it. They're going to stay with you as a customer. So, you know, everybody wins at the end. Um, in terms of how we implement, what we do is when we start working with a, an initial client, we identify one project. We say to them, look, let's ring fence this project. Let's say this is a project we're going to run index on. We're going to get a or probably, you know, one sort of main digital champion and maybe a couple of people out on the site, maybe the supervisors, maybe the sort of site managers who are going to be the people who sit below it and really get them to understand the product. Um, roll out on that one site over the first couple of weeks it's very much uh, you know spending time with the team getting down there um, seeing the product how it's working for them because you know it works differently for every business depending on how their operations sort of work and how the, the individual works um, sitting down with them over that sort of one three six twelve months and really, you know, defining what that product roadmap looks like together with them, because there will, will be, we've all talked about nuances, we've all talked about, you know, slight maybe configuration changes that need to happen, but trying to establish, you know, is this a, we're gonna go and roll out across the business in one month, in three months or in six months, and really just understanding because every customer is different and how you roll out across that business is, is different every single time. So it's building that structure, but then it's having, you know, the monthly or the bi-monthly catch-ups innovation partner we we throw this down people's necks we say we are you know we're working with you as an innovation partner we want to come on this journey with you we want to you know change the industry with you we want to make your business successful because then you stick with us as a client so that's the the main focus with us the implementation is is the most important part of the of the jigsaw yeah i'd um I completely agree with that. I think it's although it's difficult to um, have complete consistency between different organisations, as George mentioned there, I do think that's a relatively good blueprint to use for implementing um, sort of new ways of working um, any part of the business. Um, we do something similar in, in terms of implementation of Qflow, and it very much starts with um, setting those key objectives with the organisation we're working with, whether that's on a project basis or a company-wide basis. You know, what is the outcome they're looking to achieve? Let's make sure to begin with our objectives are aligned, that we know exactly what they need and what they're expecting and what we can deliver on and, um, and achieve with them. And that becomes quite critical. And again, sort of this, um, whether you have a single designated person or multiple within the organisation can differ, but usually we would um, work with um, either sort of key representatives or key champions, um, whether they're users or not, but ultimately those who are again partnering with us you know we are dedicating our time to making sure that we hit the objective with you and the organization the clients we're working with dedicate their time to making sure that we help solve their problem and if we do help solve those problems and achieve those objectives then happy days it makes more sense for the organization to utilize this across a wide spread of their portfolio so again it's a win-win for both partners in this case so i think that generally tends to work as, as a pretty good approach um but again you we also require um or any organization uh, will require uh, those sort of key champions or key individuals on the other side who are um, responsible and open to working with you as part of that journey. Yeah, I think both Jade and George will highlight the fact that what we believe as well is that you know uh, 
Um, it's about change management. Um, as much as we, we'd love to just say, hey, there's an app for that, download it, off you go. Um, the reality is that we're changing processes and we're asking, we're asking people to, you know, do something they haven't done normally or, or they normally do when they when go to site. And, and, and it's natural for people to, um, you know, the reptilian part of their brain says, hey, this is new, uh, it's danger, I don't want to, I don't want to do anything else, I want to do things, I wanna do things like, like I've always done it and then I want to get on my tools and, and, and just get on with my job. Um, so. So it's it's about finding, as Jade was saying, it's about finding, and, and, and George as well, you know, finding those internal champions. Um, George was saying, you know, finding that 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 site um, that uh, you know you're going to get you're going to get the biggest buy-in. That you're going to get you're going to um, you know work with them about what 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 change means for them. Um, and and the, and the, and the tool is what we will do from a, from a digital perspective. Um, it it, we'll have our we'll have our our preferred way of rolling out, but we're going to adapt it um, to the needs of our customers, um, and that's that's exactly what we do as well, right? We have a standard one month implementation plan, um, but you can stretch that out to two months to three months. Um, it, it's really about do we have the right people, and our, and and what's that digital transformation journey? What's that what's that change management journey look like for them? I guess in, in, in relation to that, or, or or a part of the question that I most also wanted to, to to hear an answer for is, what is the trigger point at which they get interested in potentially using the the product? Like, why should they even start considering it and start going on that journey? And how do you how do you get them there? Or do you wait until they realize that this is something that they need and they, they'll then come to you? Uh, so it depends on the stakeholder, I think, because as much as we might sell to a company and they might be the ones paying the bill, um, whether it be a head contractor, or sorry, you know, a general contractor or a, a subcontractor business, um, the, the actual change happens on the ground. So um, in, in essence, many of the, the the blue collar workers, you know, are just told they have to they have to use something, um, and 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 you you need to well, we, what we try to do is try to put it into the context of you know what's in it for me. Um, you're going to have to go through this process as anyway, but this is how uh, we can make it easier for you. You know, we un and also that we understand that um, you, you you don't want to be in a site in a site shed or or in, or in, a, or in a lunch room. Uh, doing these processes, you want to just get on and do the contract, right? To do the work that you're there to do, the, the stuff you're only just going to get paid for, um, and and you've got to just engage with them, understand their frustrations, um, and and bring them on the journey, uh, and then and then try to so from a site manager perspective, that's the stakeholder you're talking to, try to show that by digitally capturing this data, you actually you can actually have better outcomes. Um, it's really hard to show that to the to the individual. Um, Worker on site that that isn't in a management role. Um, that's that's the challenge um, in digital transformation and, and, and construction. But you can certainly show it from a from a site manager or, a, or an HSCQ manager or the, the people that actually have to collect this data. The fact that you have this data in your fingertips, um, you can you can show how how the efficiencies it can bring to the job, uh, and also how you can do your job better. Um, and 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 those are the aha moments that you're looking for. Uh, the challenge, and I think we—I'm not saying we've got it right because this is the this is the ultimate challenge—is bringing the those that that don't immediately see what's in it for them, bringing them on the journey. That's that's the challenge. Yeah, awesome. Thanks a lot for that, Simon. So I, th I think we're getting close to the end of the session. So it would be. Great to just hear closing remarks from each of you. Uh, if you have any points that you'd like to make, we'll be starting with Jade. Oh, thanks, Mike. Um, so I think it, it comes back for me. The sort of the main um, the main topic that we're focusing on with the organisation we work with now is is really a cultural shift um, in digital transformation. So um, I think you know technologies can be tried and tested. Um, implementation can be worked out, but ultimately it's around um, how we perceive 
innovating how we work in partnership um i think are some of the more important aspects for us all to be focusing on alongside of the skills change that's going to be required is required right now from um, organizations ourselves um in reverse as well uh, for understanding the um the ways these two sectors work together technology and construction that is so I think that's one of the sort of key topics that's striking me from this conversation, but also from previous ones we've been having as well. And that'd be an area that, that I will continue to have conversations with um, in terms of the partners and organizations we work with. Go on, I'll go then. Um, yeah, I think one thing that I've noticed over the last, I mean, we've been going nice three and a half years. And one thing I've noticed and maybe a bit of reflection on it is the journey and how you get how organizations how organizations organization yeah, how organizations go on the journey successfully and the the way that we see the most success is that when an organization they bring all the stakeholders on board so we have the initial call and whether or not that initial call is with the head of health and safety or part of the health and safety team but then on the next call you know they'll bring in the IT the legal project managers project directors you know and it might mean that the sales cycle is quite long but what it does mean is when you do then go and implement on that first project everybody's on the same page there's no one kicking up a fuss saying i didn't agree to this everyone is aligned everyone sees the potential and 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 get some sort of value from it feels as though they're valued as well and you're all going on that journey together and that is where you see this most success. So I think, you know, for, for any organization that's that's going on that digital journey, just yeah, getting everybody involved, I think is the most important, most important thing that uh, that you can do. Yeah, 100 uh, percent From my perspective, I think it's just so what a great time for startups to be involved um, in, in, in this industry. Uh, there's so much opportunity um, to, to create change and positive change. Um, and I guess if there's anyone in the audience or anyone listening in who's thinking of that next great idea to, to change construction for the better through, through transformation, then the opportunity is there today. Um, and I, I think all of us have a, just, we should be committed um, to, to working together to, to make it happen. Um, and there's just so much opportunity out there for, for uh, construction companies to really transform themselves and for us as startups to, uh, to be part of that change. Thanks a lot to all of you for taking the time today. I, 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 was, I really enjoyed the conversation that we've had. I think we've covered a lot of ground ranging from what are the different types of challenges that are being faced to what roles we can all play within them. I think one thing we can all agree on is that by making these small changes, by moving effectively and working on this journey together, the end result, the combined result itself, could be destructive for the industry and um, having this continuous journey of improvement really and using these tools for the better is really something that everyone should be working on rather than uh, looking for this big bang moment almost. So thanks a lot to all of you for joining us today and thanks for all of our listeners for taking the time out of their busy schedules and to BSI for organizing the conference again. Right, that's right. Thanks, everyone. Nice one. Yes, guys. Bye -bye. I'll hand over to Dan. <laughs> Brilliant. Thank you all. And yes, and thank you, Mo, for, for chairing that. Um, as you see on our agendas, um, we are precisely on time, um, which means it's, it's all going very well. So thank you all for helping us to achieve that. Um, what we're doing now is that we're going to have a short comfort break. Um, so we are going to be mics off, cameras off, um, but the session will still be live and active. So don't feel like you have to leave it or it's not intending to close. And we will resume at quarter past 11, where we're moving into our session, um, where we're looking at a different perspective on digitalization and what can be learned from other industries. So hopefully we'll have some interesting insights around what's happening outside of the built environment and how digital solutions in other areas can help us in the way that we adopt digital processes and technologies. So with that, I'll sign off now and I'll see you guys at quarter past 11. Thank you. We can start.
our next session. Morning, Hamza. Hey, Dan. Uh, it's Hazm. Sorry, Hazm. Um, Always good to see you. Yeah, good to see you too. Good morning, Dan. Good morning, Hazm. Good to see you good both. Good morning. And you? Good. Welcome aboard. Now, let's. Uh, I think the easiest thing to do is if you guys wouldn't mind introducing yourselves first so the audience can hear a bit more about you, and then I think we can start the discussion. So, uh, Hazm, if you would, wouldn't mind going first. Yeah, yeah, sure. Uh, so I think uh, the hat I'm wearing today is I'm a uh, one of the founding members of the BSI uh, DSAG, which is what we call it, which is the Digital uh, Strategic Advisory Group. In terms of uh, background, I, I worked at uh, Royal Bank of Canada. I'm a Canadian. I worked there for a number of years, mostly focused on large scale digital transformation, uh, primarily in financial services, a lot of fintech and exciting stuff. I've worked at Boston Consulting Group, also in financial services, kind of frontier technology st type stuff. I became a venture capitalist, which I've recently phased out of, and now I'm working with a number of organizations focused on uh, digital, digital transformation and, and stuff like that. So all the fun stuff we'll be talking about today. And it's good to be here. Thank you, uh, Dan and, and Margaret. Great to, to share the panel with you, and uh, thanks for the opportunity. Thank you. It's pretty hard to beat that introduction, Hazem, but uh, good to see you again. So uh, my name is Margareta. I work for Dell, Dell Technologies, or Michael Dell. Um, I've been with Dell now for the last five years, uh, driving kind of large scale digital outcomes for them. I run our global strategic partnerships, which is a bit of a mouthful, but essentially um, that's really connecting with some of our major partners. So that would be the likes of the advisory firms and some of our leading uh, consulting houses that install the technology to drive kind of business value and, and um, business outcomes. Prior to that, I was a management consultant for a long time. So I worked with PwC and EY doing large scale kind of strategic change programs, always with a technology lens or a digital lens. And that kind of led me into working with several different startups and helping them scale as well. So that's me in, in summary. Well, well, brilliant. Uh, I won't bore anyone with my much less impressive list, uh, but this is exactly why we've invited you guys along to have these discussions, which is brilliant. Um, and, you know, interestingly, we had, I think we, we talked in advance of this and there are some themes that we came up with and some, some ideas. Um, so what do you want to start with? Well, I think, first of all, like the, we're just seeing such a change at the moment and um, I'd welcome both your perspectives on this, but I think we're seeing a, a rapid change in terms of uh, business models, right, with digital engagement as we become more stabilised through this pandemic and we're learning how to live in a, a much more accelerated pace of, of digital change. So I think just talking about the changing nature of businesses and the role of ecosystems potentially is something to, to touch on. And I think for many of the audience, like, I guess I'd be interested in any questions that they've got around how they're working in an ecosystem, right, with other partners, with the public and private sector. Uh, but certainly from a tech perspective, from my side, we're just seeing this huge change around really advancing out complex ecosystems. Has a, you know, I'd welcome your thoughts around where you see that going. Yeah, yeah, sure. You know, uh, uh, the pandemic and, and COVID was almost like a, an adrenaline shot for anything kind of uh, digital transformation, transformation, transformative, and I think um, the large trend that I'm I'm seeing right now is is the kind of larger conglomerates and and multinationals and corporations. Sure, the kind of work from home and remote and all of that, but but more broadly speaking, the understanding that they need to have a data strategy, you know, uh, the ability to to connect all of their systems that are typically in kind of honeypot ledgers spread everywhere. Uh, around the world, opening them up to uh, to cyber attacks and stuff like that, but also the focus on on much more uh, traditional um, working conditions and, and and working environments that's that's now uh, changing dramatically because they've really understood that now in order to compete as incumbents, in order to compete with kind of uh, many of the lar uh, the smaller, sorry, earlier stage, let's say growth stage companies, some of which they're competing with, the only way to to compete to ensure that there's uh, client happiness, well-being, that they're delivering kind of best-in-class services, to ensure that their, uh, uh, their employees are also happy, right, and they're going to stay and they're able to retain them, they need to make this change. They need to be better 
more agile, faster, better understanding of data and information to inform decision making in particular, that is happening incredibly rapidly. The point that, that you just mentioned around ecosystem building is so fundamental because it creates new working arrangements between strategic partners that will be you know, geographically incredibly far away. And that I think is, is very, very cool because it has you know, an organizational element, of course, a human element, you know, first and foremost, and most importantly, but also a technological element that allows a number of different uh, parties and organizations to kind of collaborate around interesting things. We're seeing this in payments and financial services. We're seeing it in supply chain heavily, right, to cut, to increase efficiency, reduce costs, and so on, as well as a number of other areas. And and I think the, the kind of built environment uh, element is, is also happening. Work from home is one piece. The development of, of uh, augmented reality and virtual reality as well all of the talk around the metaverse the reason it's so interesting for large conglomerates and, and corporations in large part is is because of this phenomenon we're seeing it, it allows people to work together but also organizations to work together and, and build uh, uh, much more sustainable I think business models and, and ecosystems of collaboration yeah, no, I, I, I totally agree. I actually see, uh, and Dan, I'd welcome, you know, it'd be great to get your thoughts as well a little bit on this one, but we're seeing a complexity coming with managing an ecosystem, whether it's in the built environment or in the virtual environment, because supply chains and value chains are getting so much more complex and they're getting richer in terms of the outcome it can provide because you've got like startups, public sector, private sector, academia all involved trying to drive uh, a new kind of outcome, it does require a certain kind of skill set to manage this level of complexity as well. And so I think the talent profile that's involved in managing partnerships previously has changed, right? Because I did just think there's a richness coming through from multi-layered partner structures um, and how we deliver value and the timelines enabled or that are going to drive that kind of value um, takes longer or can be shorter as well. So I just think the skills, the talent, it's a changing, uh, it's, a, it's kind of an evolving um, wheelhouse in terms of capability as well, you know? I oh, know, certainly. And I think if you if you look back to the early, early days of construction, when I mean early, I mean, you know, back when, uh, you know, togas and sandals early, you know, we had things like, you know, the architect was effectively the master builder. And actually yeah. you had one person who controlled and overseed everything. But as, you know, as we've, developing technology we've been developing systems developing the way that we do things it's become so complex that it's no longer you can't be one person can't oversee everything you've gone to the point now where actually you almost need multiple people to just do the role that was traditionally one person's role and we're seeing for example now lots of regulatory reform in the built environment mm -hmm. with the Building safety yeah. act these sorts of things where we're now introducing competency core competencies that people need now actually up till now they may not have had and it gets into quite quite interesting elements from a business model side there where people may find themselves technically not competent for the roles they've been doing which is a good thing to find out on a mm. macro level but as you as a business that's a terrible thing to discover um while at the same time you know supply chains and those value chains have been getting broader and deeper because yeah. you know specialisms have become more specialized in that way and i think it's what makes and i think what's interesting from the previous session on the startup conversation mm -hmm. is is the communication bit because where those supply and value chains break down is where there's a, a, an inefficient bit of communication and if we said everyone was 95 percent efficient in the way they communicate with each other by the time you're four or five levels down that supply chain you know, you're starting to get to like a 20% kind of gap in information and it just gets worse as, as it goes down deeper. So I think some of the models certainly need to change, but I don't know if this is a problem you've seen elsewhere, but what I like to think is unique to the built environment is sometimes is that we don't really have very good forward planning. And what it means is that you build a team for a project, you don't build a team for a 10, 15 year program with a local authority which then actually means creating these, um, you know, really good, well kind of streamlined, multi-annual, more collaborative relationships isn't as easy because you're only with those people for two years and then you all scatter and then you all reconvene at a 0.5% profit margin on a different project a couple of years later. 
So, uh, you know, I don't know if other sectors have this issue of having such a volatile and dynamic supply chain. Um, so I'd, I'd be interested to hear what you guys have experienced that. Asim, do you want to go first on that one? Uh, sure, I, I can give it a shot. Um, there were a number of things, Dan, uh, to tease out there. I think one is the talent issue, really, and it's uh, namely that given a lot of the kind of speed and, and velocity of change right now, uh, there are a number of different uh, kind of skill sets that are required and that are needed long term throughout the life of, you know, even post kind of project completion. I think we're seeing that absolutely everywhere, right? Which is that the ultimate objectives and the goals of developing a thing, whatever it might be, it might be just, you know, organizational, it might be, you know, a, a, a new building or, or what have you. From my standpoint, the actual kind of project development phase, and you might see this differently, is collapsing. It's becoming a lot more faster to develop, but the kind of tail end of, uh, maintenance upgrades changing again i'm speaking generally because i'm applying it to, to different things has a much longer kind of tail there's a lot more parties involved a lot more connectivity across systems across this across that in many ways it's it's sad because it also means that a lot of folks need to continuously be retrained at a, at a pace that's a lot faster and, and and happening a lot more at the same time that also needs to be protected you know the the individuals that don't necessarily have that training still need to be protected, kept in the fold, continuously retrained, oftentimes at the dime of, of government and the corporation, that should happen, right? Uh, it's incredibly important. But also the, the objective of kind of the, the projects and project management is shifting a little bit as well. We're beginning in decision-making to take um, many more things into account. When we ask the question, you know, all things considered, what matters? What is the objective and the ultimate aim? that's continuing to get broader and perhaps that's that's a reflection to what you were talking about around value chains in particular the values we're introducing into what matters uh in any given project or in any given strategy is becoming broader and broader as well you know esg and sustainability is a key kind of obvious example of that i have my kind of qualms with, with some of the esg stuff that that i see happening in the market some of it is actually not good for the environment nonetheless those that are funding infrastructure projects, construction projects, investing in startups and, and growth stage companies and so on, and even you know shareholders and publicly listed companies when it comes to shareholder activism, more things matter to them than previously. One example is sustainability and ESG, but more so it's things like um, you know quality of life, happiness, taking into account a number of different SDGs, all of those types of things. And that makes decision-making a lot harder and a lot more difficult and requires a lot more substantiation when it comes to kind of data, accumulating data, being able to parse it, being able to run, you know, uh, uh, simulations, running algorithms so that we better understand exactly how those with money, uh, but also those with obligations to other parties, whether it's your partners in academia, public sector, private sector, how those are going to be met. And in many ways, that's also touches back to your change, Dan, that all the kind of physical objects and physical items whether it comes into interior design building new buildings building you know different types of centers that have been kind of on the rise over the last five to ten years uh, across the uk uh, when it comes to those things a lot of it you know needs to be tech enabled or quote unquote smart none of it is smart right but it allows it to accumulate data that can be used to achieve um or meet different types of objectives that are becoming requirements, sometimes legal, sometimes standard-based, sometimes uh, uh, just you know agreed by by parties uh, within uh, within the sector that they're in, kind of uh, you know coming together and saying these are the things we need to meet. So I agree with all of that, and I think we're seeing it in in most sectors. A lot more collaboration, a lot more values matter that need to be taken into account, and a difficulty around skill set recruitment and retention that needs to be protected. Right, the last thing we want is because you know certain generations and the way certain things were done to lead to folks losing jobs and that that training needs to be taken incredibly seriously it's harder said than done though you know Hazem, i completely agree with you um i think we're like i see from a tech perspective there's a lot of organizations out there that are quickly trying to 
transformed. They've obviously accelerated their digital uh, transformation. They're fully virtual. They've embraced hybrid working and they've upgraded their technology infrastructure. They're sitting on real estate that's quite, um, I guess it's legacy real estate. It hasn't been redesigned for this virtual world that we're in. And they're trying to scramble around and, and figure out how they kind of move to more agile business models, incubate new kind of um, supply chain partners or startups as well. And I just find that like there's a little bit of, um, as always, change fatigue, right? And organizations that there's just so much to contend with, whether it's like embracing, you know, sustainability, as you said, has them and, and building that into your procurement guidelines and into your ecosystem and value chain and making sure it's baked into the ESG goals as well, enabling uh, talent to be continually, um, I guess, upgraded and so that we're making sure that we develop talent in the right way. And then I think the other threats of kind of this virtual world, which is, you know, cybersecurity and the constant threat of ransomware and making sure that everybody is on alert and understands how to look after your data and protect it. So there's just a lot to contend with for organizations, uh, both virtual and, you know, physical. Um, and then obviously talking about Dan around where you started at the very start, which was the long term lens on this. Like, how do you plan for the long term perspective? Right. When many organizations are just right now, we're not even sure if we've got, dare I say, it, a stable government. But like the truth is, you know, we're just grappling with day to day and, and trying to reduce costs where we can. So I just think it's complex times where there's a lot to contend with. And I, I think a key part of that is strong leadership and keeping a calm mind and just making sure that you're clear on your vision and your purpose and um and they are open to trying to evolve your business model as much as possible i'm not sure dan if i'm fully answering the question but i do i do think long-term planning right now for capital projects uh given there's so much turmoil at a macroeconomic um even just in the uk you know it's hard like uh, and acknowledging that is important too totally okay. totally sorry go ahead dan no, that's right i would say you know it, it is hard and i have real sympathy for people to try and establish these things up and I think particularly in the last 20 years or so built environment there's been lots of changes that have been introduced into into our sector and our industry and you go for you know, the likes of you know transitioning into you know computer-aided drafting you know CAD stuff then moving into more database based like the building information modeling data driven design stuff you've now got uh, things like uh, more collaborative procurement aspects, like project alliancing. Um, you've got all the cybersecurity stuff. Interestingly, I think it was only a couple of days ago, I saw a news thing about there are some insurers who aren't insuring construction contractors yeah. because they have poor cybersecurity. And actually, we're now at the point where they can't actually get their insurance if their cybersecurity isn't up to scratch. But I think, it, and I think as soon as people start to get grips with something, something new happens. And you know, and what, it, I think it's it's about becoming more. I guess it's somewhere between agile and resilience in that way of mm -hmm. you need to be responsive to the change, but also that change isn't it doesn't take so much kind of entropy, not entropy, doesn't take so much kind of innate energy to start it, um, which is difficult. But, you know, sorry, that how do I cut across you? No, no, it's OK. Uh, you uh, uh, covered an, an element as well that I wanted to touch on, which is also just the difficulty that the, the macroeconomic backdrop provides right now. Right. Earnings are up. Supply chain is, you know, pretty distressed. Wages are, are relatively low. Um, you know, most kind of macroeconomic economists right now, some of, you know, there are two camps. One camp sees it, okay, you know, this is just cyclical. There's going to be a bit of a, of a recession right now, and then it's going to begin picking up. And then the other camp says, no, there's going to be a, a relatively fundamental change in, um, uh, in the kind of economic order, so to speak. And so it does make it difficult for large companies and small companies at the same time. I think it does go back to uh, uh, what Margaret, what, what you said, which is having a kind of laser, sh a relatively laser sharp focused strategy that allows execution. You know, one of the biggest problems I've seen with um, conglomerates and, and, and you know, many, many kinds of companies as well is that they continue to change strategy on a weekly basis. And yeah. so it goes to your point as well, which is being agile. Yes, it's important to pivot and it's important to change. Um, but you know, it also needs to be resilient and it needs to kind of 
be developed in such a way that it can take into account a lot of the things that are going to happen, right? It doesn't need to be changed every week. Otherwise, you're operating more like a uh, kind of government in the last year of term, which is which is not particularly useful or beneficial to anyone, whether it's your clients, your users, or uh, or, or your customers. And and I think that that's something that. Uh, Many of the companies that have continued to survive, you know, the the 99 and 2008 and so on, have continued to take into account and and uh, uh, and operate in that way. When it comes to uh, kind of buildings in particular, you know, a lot of organizations have, you know, even though they might be a tech business or a bank or what have you, if you take a look at their balance sheet, really what they are are real estate companies, and it's because they've owned so much real estate for you know, many, many different years. And, you know, the COVID pandemic, and this is another thing that, that came to my mind recently, um, the COVID pandemic has has seen a lot of that be a bit of a burden for their balance sheet. You know, if they're looking to build a kind of fortress balance sheet, that's been difficult. At the same time, those, there have been a lot of companies, and this is an interesting other phenomena that I've, I've kind of been trying to track. A lot of companies that have become kind of native digital only are moving into, uh, building much more physical pre presences. And this is across opticians, across e-commerce, and across many other areas. They're actually moving in reverse, right? They began digital, fully digital e-commerce marketplace, what have you. And now they're moving into having uh, physical spaces and, and presences. And for them, it's a lot easier, right? They're buying things relatively at a discount. Uh, many of them who are actually building and developing physical presences are using kind of um, uh, new builders and, and approaches to construction that are much more modular in, in approach, right? Uh, a recent one, I think this was three years ago in, in Cambridge, was, was the Bradfield Center. It's an incredible, you know, 600 desk co-working space for early stage companies. It's on uh, Trinity College land, I believe. And we've been there a number of times and it's a gorgeous building, you know, really kind of uh, at the forefront of kind of design and how it's put together. I think it was it was fully built in in six or so months. So there's still a lot of good happening, you know, kind of in in the construction space, in building, in developing. Uh, but it's a lot easier, I think, starting from scratch now. Whereas just like any company trying to upgrade their legacy systems, it's tedious, it's tough, and it's difficult. Um, and the same thing uh, is uh, I'm I'm seeing with kind of. Uh, a lot older buildings that are trying to take that next step to meet a lot more of the new requirements uh, that we mentioned already, but also kind of begin building in smarter systems, even potentially developing digital twins and, and stuff like that. I think that's a hugely exciting uh, space, Hazem, actually. I couldn't agree more with you. And I think it's kind of where the built environment is meeting the, the virtual world and embracing uh, the role of technology, right? And I think um, some incumbent organizations that have a lot of real estate are doing some amazing innovative work about transforming their estate right now and using technology for the better, right? Whether it's to build better experiences for consumers, for staff, um, looking at, you know, sustainability. But I just think they're and looking at the rich data sets they have as well and then trying to create the digital twin in terms of virtual models as well. So I think that we're kind of at this crossroads, right? And we've probably been at it for a little while as people are just trying to get over the pandemic and settle into this world of hybrid everything. Um, but I think technology and the built environment has come a long way in the last few years. Um, and I think, you know, I think leaders have embraced it. I think it's a bit exhausting, but all the same, I think, you know, the future is quite bright and actually, you know, it's a time to be quite positive about where the built environment is going to go and where architects and, and construction leaders are kind of going with um, real estate right now, you know, because I think everybody still wants to have that face to face interaction. If anything, we value it even more. But I think it's in a different kind of format, really creating very um, tailored experiences for individuals. That's both virtual and face to face. So, you know, it's a great time to be in the built environment. And I think with technology, um, it's even better again. I think you just all need to be mindful of the cybersecurity elements of that and data protection too, you know? Yeah, agreed. And I think the um, the digital twin piece is particularly exciting. You know, one, one, one group or organization, uh, which is the Center for Digital Built Britain at, at Cambridge, where, where I spend uh, quite a bit of time, is at Cambridge, not at this center, but uh, but the center has put out a number of uh, of interesting papers on uh, on the built environment. It has been working with with kind of government and and others, and they've 
obviously put in effort into building or beginning to build uh, a digital twin of the UK. And, you know, digital twins, I think, um, haven't come to the fore that much yet. Obviously, you know, just from a technological development standpoint, digital twins uh, for the audience really are, as, as Margareta mentioned, uh, building kind of virtual replicas, digital replicas and representations of physical objects. You know, it could be a, it could be a, the Elizabeth line, it could be a new building, it could be what have you that's connected with sensors and allows you to real time kind of see the changes and the differences in a digital space, you know, in a simulation online. And then you can run, you know, thousands of different, you know, possible uh, scenarios and outcomes to kind of probabilistically understand what's going to happen in many different scenarios. And that's very powerful, right? And allow, it allows you to kind of feed in design decisions and construction and building decisions earlier on, but also to kind of track and build the, uh, 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 the development on an ongoing basis, right? Because right now we're looking uh, at more heavily how to focus on building a sustainable kind of um, environment for future generations as well. And this is something that comes out in their papers. Uh, and so they're making progress on on that side. One one other thing is the EU is building actually a digital twin of the Earth for climate change purposes, and I think they began that in 2017 or 2018, which which is quite cool. But this goes back to one of the first points we spoke about right at the beginning of the call, which is the only way these things get off the ground is through well, a a lot of money from the public sector and the private sector a lot of support across public sector, private sector, and academia over a long kind of time frame. One group, you know, making a digital twin of one building is absolutely useless. What you really want now, contrary to 10, 20 years ago, is a kind of system level of view of how everything kind of feeds into each other, right? And, and connects with each other. And that requires a lot of that co collaboration, cooperation. BSI being a great venue to bring a lot of that together and has been doing quite a bit in the digital twin space as well. But that needs to you know, go deeper and go longer. And, and that's the only way to really take advantage of, of some of these new technologies, but also interesting uh, uh, business models for, uh, for collaboration. It feels yeah. like we're really in the time of partnership, truly, in every sense of the word, right? You know, collaboration, ecosystems, and um, Hazem, you and I have talked many times around the, the importance of trust and social value coming to fore with all of these initiatives and longer term partnerships. Trust is at the, you know, the heart of it all. But I think um, partnership, it just really feels that like we're entering an unprecedented level of, you know, of, of kind of engagement, both from, um, yeah, you know, just from different kind of partners, public, private, academia, startups, where, you know, there's a lot more openness to, to really drive kind of new innovative models yeah uh, sorry dan uh, did you want to jump in yeah sorry that's right it's um i think it's i think the trust one is quite interesting and this is where i think we're we're quite late to the party with some of this because i think you would have if you spotted um paul morales talk this morning and some of my questions back to him i yeah. think it we we traditionally have had quite um combative procurement processes where you know you you'll do this and we'll watch over you as you do it but you know, more recently, there have been um, activities where we've started looking at um, where you actually better align and work as a team, where you effectively become project shareholders on a project. And actually, if there's a profit made on that project, you effectively get an even share of the success. And at that point, then, you know, you are, uh, and that's where, you know, I think the term we, we typically use it is project alliance in. And you get this idea then that actually you're all part of the project and then if you know if there's a problem instead of it being well it, it's the fault of the the structural engineer over there you know he's not done his stuff right you know blame him we start finger pointing you're actually sat there going well hang on if i finger point uh, that's one thing but if we help work the solution out it improves our profit and you kind of get um nepotistic altruism for want of a better phrase where you know every, there's a greater good because people are being selfish in that way because yeah. it will help them and I think having those situations, I think it, it, it affects trust in a funny way because uh, there was something I saw recently about transparency and that transparency is the opposite of trust. Um, because if you become more transparent as a business, you're removing the need for trust because people can see what's happening. Transparent trust is almost what happens 
when there isn't transparency in that way. And I think it's that difference between believing in something and knowing something. And there's a being able to believe someone's going to do their work, do it right, and be competent is an important part of what we're doing. But you can do that through behavioral incentives, not forcing them to expose their their order books and and show everything to the to the to a finite degree. Yeah, really, really interesting. I'll I'll, I'll go a little uh, con controversial uh, for for a bit. I think that's genuinely fascinating and i do think right now we're living in a period of of a trust crisis and and i yeah. think that that is that's not the controversial point i'll get to that in a bit uh but we're living in a kind of trust crisis period and you know there's a fantastic barometer that measures trust annually all over the world it's called the edelman or edelman yeah. uh, trust yeah. barometer i recommend looking at it uh uh for everyone in in the audience it's really fascinating they have a fantastic presentation where they go through you know, with the public sector, private sector, uh, as well as uh, different types of institutions like NGOs, but also in different countries. And really, trust has just continued to, to go down. Part of it over the last few years was in many jurisdictions and by many organizations, the handling of, of the, the pandemic. But there's a number of other reasons uh, if, if you go further back than that. Um, and I find that fascinating, but it also meet, creates an opportunity. It creates an opportunity for organizations with you know consumer tilts to uh, begin rebuilding and finding new ways new interesting uh, aspects of, of engagement within their ecosystem and and with c customers really and I think that's great as as an opportunity I don't necessarily see kind of whoever mentioned it previously in the day that trust and transparency are uh, you know mm -hmm. uh, are kind of opposites in in many way I think um, one way of building or rebuilding trust is beginning to employ transparency where it matters most, right? Trust is kind of on an ongoing basis. They trust you, whether it's with uh, their data, this, that, or anything under the sun without knowing. I agree with that. But transparency really kicks in where it matters, your ability to kind of verify and validate that that trust is well placed. And I do think we need more transparency in organizations, uh, you know, continuously doing, you know, very very large share buybacks and 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 stashing uh, cash in accounts you know transparency does matter your point on kind of uh <clears throat> these project alliances i think is is phenomenal the ability to ensure skin in the game at all yeah. levels is fundamentally important what we're seeing now with the kind of gen z and and millennials is that actually yeah. they want skin in the game right all of this talk around you know um Kind of people just joining the workforce in the workplace, you know, uh, wanting to find uh, purpose and wanting to be promoted quickly. You know, I've I've always felt that maybe because you know we we were investing in in early stage companies run by you know 20 22 year old 23 year olds um, doing incredibly well around the world is that actually many of them just want skin in the game and I think these new models can take advantage of that and actually bring back a lot of talent that currently has been operating kind of freelancer and outside the mainstream. And they can be brought back in because now they can work on project by project basis by having skin in the game. And their performance uh, and their compensation is directly you know, kind of connected to uh, the, uh, the outcome of the project as a whole, working, working as a team. And interestingly, uh, the controversial bit is that that is actually a, a very socialist um, uh, idea, actually. You know, I think it was, uh, there's an economist who slipped my mind, but it's been written about for a very long time, where I think it was in the 1920s, and much more recently it's been introduced by, uh, I think, Yanis Varoufakis, who was one of the uh, minister, he was the minister of finance for Greece. He's an academic, he's written a few books. His recent book is actually on this idea, and he's a you know, socialist Marxist. But I think one of the difficulties we face right now, I'm not a socialist or a Marxist, but one of the difficulties we face right now is how we connect uh, different bits and bobs of capitalism with different bits and bobs of not just socialism, but many other areas to create new models that are sustainable. What we've seen over the last 20 years, everywhere around the world, is wealth and inequality continues to, you know, that, that, that's what happens ultimately when markets are totally free to an extent, but funded by central banks. This continues to widen. And now new models can begin to come in to try and adjust that. For example, there have been a number of experiments in the US where uh, you've had or complete organizations in the financial sector and in, in enterprise and, and in tech 
that are totally run and have very interesting government structures by employees. We have that yeah. in the UK as well with yeah. certain organizations and they work decently well also. And I think we'll be seeing more and more of that. The interesting thing with project alliances is they're, they can be much more short term and they're kind of much more project oriented. And that really brings it closer to the everyday user, right? Which is, uh, which is really cool. And I think these are not, not just great, but also really important because as as you recall we were talking earlier about the kind of all things considered what matters what are the values that matters as that continues to increase right. right as more and things more and more things matter to us as we move higher in kind of maslow's hierarchy of needs um things like sustainability trust all of these things begin to matter when we have shelter and food question mark on food and energy right now with everything that's happening but nonetheless more and more things matter and i think um if we just focus on profit nothing's going to go anywhere and some of the esg stuff that we're seeing uh out in in the market and in kind of the investment space isn't particularly conducive yeah. to genuine sustainability over the long term and so being able to come up with new models like that including at a organizational and decision making level will be fantastic in terms of balancing and taking into account things like trust things like sustainability things like happiness and well-being in addition to profit without forgetting that Sorry for the, the spiel. Adam, I, I always love talking to you because you have such gold nuggets, really, of, of wisdom. Um, there was a really great piece yesterday in the Financial Times on the nanny employer and whether employers are going too far in terms of looking after employees remotely and offering too many of these kind of essentially well-being, mental health initiatives to look after employees. And so some employees are pushing back. And so there was some stats actually quoted by LinkedIn recently in a survey saying, 66% of Gen Z and 55% of millennials want more organizational investment in their well-being, in their built environment, in the technology that they use. Um, and then on the other side of that, you've got others saying, actually, they're encroaching too much, which is that nanny state of. So I think we're, we're seeing a quite a shift and change in organizational constructs, Hasm, which you've just touched on, um, and the role of purpose and real authentic purpose, right, rather than just the greenwashing or the um, kind of well-being washing that we do with some organizations and I think it's really authentic led kind of initiatives in the workplace that are, are kind of the ones that are going to last the long run right so I think we're going to see a move towards flatter structures I think we're seeing much more focus on multidisciplinary teams I think we're seeing a much greater focus on partnerships and the ecosystem which we talked about new models of creating value um, and I think it's not always about the top line profit. I think it has to be laden with purpose all the way through. That's authentic. So I just think it's a really phenomenal time to be kind of driving value in the built environment um, and then overlaying that with technology as well. And then, you know, purpose led values is key, too. So I agree has them on, on the trust elements. You know, I think it just the, the FT article was really interesting around are we pushing it too far in terms of in, intruding on people's privacy um, and I, um, potentially we're not you know so I think there's just different schools of thought depending on what stage of career you're at but also where you're located um, and your social economic background. Yeah Dan do you want to say anything or should I jump in uh, again? So I'll, I'll jump in on the value bit first because um, I, I, I think this is an interesting thread to continue on um, with the dynamics there. I think that that purpose-driven value bit, I think is really important, something that we traditionally haven't had in the built environment. And it's always yeah. been, you know, I need I need a school and it's been, right, who can who can give me that school for the least amount of pounds? And then, yeah. okay, you say you will, right, we'll, we'll take that. And what that hasn't done is two things. One is it hasn't looked at the outcome, which they want to achieve. And the outcome is actually for this particular geographical region, we need education facilities. And actually, there's no there's no opportunity for innovation there to say, well, actually, instead of a new school, could we make the other schools bigger or could you transform yeah. what you're doing? Could you have a blended learn? You know, so there are lots of, you know, so there's because it's not outcome based. You know, people are selling light bulbs. They're not selling daylight. Yeah. Um, actually, what people need at their desks is enough light to do their work. They don't need light bulbs. Um, so I think it's and there's some interesting models where I think you can contact people like Philips. And actually, you would have a contract for them to provide your office with sufficient light levels at desks. 
And I think it's trying to have more of that outcome based approach is one thing that we need to start looking at. You know, you don't need a bridge. You need two modes of transport to intersect. And, you know, that could be a bridge. It could be a tunnel. It could be a turntable. Yeah. Um, the other side is that there's been quite interesting work done through um, the Construction Innovation Hub. They've just come into the end of their three years of work yeah. where they've been doing a lot around value definitions and actually trying to help create tools that allow organizations to try and actually establish what their values are. And it's kind of based on the on the cover capitals work. So you know you have those different kind of value-based elements in them. And some of these things around well-being are part mm. of that. That's part of that kind of social capital. Um, yeah. Because you're right, and people want to know that these organizations will provide them with security, with safety, um, with 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 I'll call them well-being perks for now, only because I can't think of a yeah. better phrasing for it. But people don't want to feel like you know a number in a meat grinder. They want to feel you know respected and developed. And you know, you're finding situations now where you know with your people are being judged by uh, organizations being judged by the way that people move, and people leave organizations who treat them that way. And there's a very quick turnaround of staff, and then you get back to the problem we had before around skills and you know the depth of supply chains where actually if you invest in your people there's a better likelihood that they'll stay and then but that investment isn't just in take this training course follow these standards you know do this thing it's actually invested in their personal development it's invested in their health and work-life balance um it's it's all those different bits and pieces in there as well so i think it's weird that it's such a novel thing for us is that we've created this idea of what instead of saying what's the cheapest what is the option yeah. we have that gives us the best value and you know that's novel thinking in the built environment which is fantastic in one way but quite scary in another it is and and also like how do we treat the ecosystem around us how do we treat our partners are we delivering social value to local communities around the school so it, it extends far beyond the one entity i think it's much bigger and it goes back to that point that hasn't made on trust and actually transparency greater disclosure i think all of that really matters and i think like I'm so grateful that we're in this time now where it welcomes greater openness because I think 10, 15 years ago, there probably wasn't this expectation that, you know, from the built environment, from leaders, that we want to focus much more on the social value around uh, new initiatives. Yeah, I, I, I absolutely love what you just said. I, I think it's, um, I, I see it totally the same way. One of uh, one of the things as well, Dan, that that you mentioned, which I really appreciate, and I think that's that's how things need to be ultimately. Which is uh, this is my takeaway, and I might have misread it. Which is being able for organizations, small and and large, as well as kind of contractors and so on, to be able to question the status quo and come up with new ways to solve existing problems. I, I like the bridge one, which is well, what we need is a form of transport from point A to point B. And I think that that's that's great, right? You know, a lot of the innovation that's happened, I think, in, in the UK and in particular with, you know, many, many of the, the different companies, one of the crown jewels being Arm, which, uh, you know, was sold in 2016 to, to SoftBank and recently tried to be bought by NVIDIA, but failed. That's, you know, really in, in Cambridge, it's, it's a fantastic story of exactly that kind of thinking. And I think uh, the UK as a whole, and I want to press this point on that type of thinking because that's where innovation comes out and new business models come out. Mm -hmm. And I think mm -hmm. the UK in general, and this was reflected in the UK uh, digital strategy that came out on June 13th of this year. The biggest problem, if you go through it, is actually recognized there. And ultimately, it's that we do not grow uh, big enough companies that are owned at home. That, that was the biggest problem of, of my takeaway, big enough kind of digital uh, focused and technology businesses. Ultimately, they'll get a bit big, then they'll be acquired and amalgamated into some organization overseas. And a big problem with that is, sure, the lack of capital. It's also a cultural thing, and it's also a kind of push around this, this kind of thinking. And so I think what we'll need a lot more in the future as well is more government and public sector involvement around partnerships to whether it's you know embedding uh sensors in the roads in london to you know for the purposes of self-driving cars or building digital twins you know actual digital twins that twins that get 
uh, real-time feedback and, and data that's able to then be used or whether it's better funding organizations directly from the public sector. This is this should be and must be a, a digital priority. Everything we're talking about, I think, in this call should be uh, in many ways, uh, sorry, a, a national priority for the UK because otherwise you get left behind, really. You know, we do not onshore a number of the different, um, whether it's commodities or critical aspects of, you know, supply chain like lithium and, and stuff like that, that get fed into a lot of the electronics that are used or many other kind of raw materials that, that we need in order to function. And so a big question arises, which is, well, what are we going to do around building and growing fantastic new companies at home that are able to become market leaders, let's say globally or regionally within the UK? And that's a massive problem that needs to be a lot more effort and time and diligence needs to be put in. Because if they can't work with the, if earlier stage companies can't work with the government here, well, they'll go somewhere where government works very, very closely with them in order to grow them. If they can't get funding here, they'll go elsewhere. It's very simple. It's a, you know, it's a, it's not rocket science. And then that kind of opens the way for new and new models, new innovations, and new uh, values that can be taken into account um, in uh, in decision making. And I think these things, by default, add tons and tons of social value in in the long term. And I think that innovation stems from a number of things. I mentioned capital. I mentioned partnership. I mentioned whatever but it's also diversity. And I think that's been my biggest takeaway. I'm currently writing a book on uh, technology sovereignty. And really I come down to innovation and growth and all of these funky things, growth question mark, you know, it's, it's not a good measure of most things. Um, but a lot of it comes from diversity, not just diversity of color and, and background and so on, but diversity of ideas and thought. And you know, mm -hmm. as far back in history as we want to go, innovation, has always taken place through diversity. You know, even if we look at the scientific methods and we look at their history over 600 years, it's through diversity that it developed into uh, into what it is. Now, that kind of diversity period gets truncated into very quick, you know, one-year processes developing certain things. The UK is fantastic when it comes to R&D. We're great when it comes to starting new companies, but we're very bad when it comes to kind of growing and scaling and supporting them with what they need, whether it's ecosystem building, partnership, working with government and funding. And that needs to be a national priority moving forward. No, that's, that's interesting. And I think that the bits you talk about with, about innovation are interesting. And I will, um, I'll, I'll, it's, it's a funny one because obviously we as, as British standards, we get we get the flack quite often that, you know, standards hinder innovation. Um, and it's and it's an interesting phrase because because one, I don't agree with it. Um, but I was I was trained. My background is an, as an as an architectural technologist. And the way I was taught around design is that actually innovation happens between constraints. And if you were if you were told, you know, go do whatever you want with unlimited money and limited resources, you're almost in analysis paralysis, where actually, if you are told, I need you to design a hospital on a site that traditionally is only a third the size we need with half the budget, but it's still got to be able to do these things, well, you're going to be innovative or you're going to fail. And I think that actually, it's it's interesting when you build some of these constraints in. And at the moment, I think that for, for us in the built environment, we haven't had, you know, too many of those constraints, but we're now having large regulatory reforms. We're now having... Mm -hmm. Um, the fact that organizations like John Lewis, IKEA and others are starting to kind of creep around, the, you know, they will provide an extension for you or a conservatory that you can drop in. So you get into it where retail is is muscling in on the edges of, of our space as well. Yeah. And, you know, they are they're innovative, innovating in the constraint. What is how do they expand their existing market yeah. shares, market businesses and be more successful? And I think we're we're not um and i think it's it, it's an, an interesting bit of where where that comes from because i think going harking back to paul this morning you know we don't have half a dozen companies who are the monopoly in our sector who who can do the innovation for us yeah. um you know so it's it's very hard to work out what will take critical mass and what will go forwards and we've had big change programs like the innovation hub that's been looking at you know modern methods of construction bringing in manufacturing led approaches and i think you know, while while some of the research is fantastic, how we get that to the masses and to become an innovation that we pick up as an industry, I think, is going to be quite difficult. Um, 
and I don't that that hasn't really got a question at the end of it. It's more of a, a, a depressing observation. But I don't really particularly want to leave that there. Um, I'm just conscious of time. So what I what I would ask uh, from the both of you um, to finish off then is that I think this has been really interesting, and I think what should say you are talking to the face of built environment right now. Mm -hmm. Um, which isn't me, but a, a, a conceptual face. Um, what would what would you advise them that they need to learn from from elsewhere um, as something that needs to be integrated into the way that we work now? If, if the one or two things from each of you would be brilliant, and maybe Margaret, I'll start with you. <laughs> I think uh, I think. Look, I actually I don't want to go back to your last point, but Dan, I just do want to touch on. I think there's so many opportunities for those that are sitting on large amounts of real estate or in the built environment uh, to to innovate really. And I would challenge them hard here to say, actually, I think you guys are sitting on some incumbent real estate in some of the most amazing parts of the country. Uh, you know, there's a lot of virtual startups that would really be quite jealous of the real estate you've got. And I think it's down to you guys to figure out how you innovate. So I think the key one um, is, I think obviously we've seen a major focus, thankfully for me, sitting inside Dell Technologies on technology, taking a, a new form of relevance. And I think, you know, that presents lots of opportunities. I think there's also a real risk here that a lot of organizations are, they've kind of got a bit of a magpie syndrome. They're going for the shiny things, the AR, the VR, the cryptocurrency. And I would just advise all of them right now, please look after your data and protect your data. Like ransomware attacks are right up and we are seeing cybersecurity like taking an unprecedented level of importance across all verticals, all sectors. So I think invest in the technology wisely, but I also think talk to your partners. Like I, I think talk to your tech partners, talk to your startups, and, and look to really build out an alliance and a true ecosystem, right? It's no longer a transactional relationship. It is truly a partnership driven approach and collaboration and trust sits at the heart of that. So I think the changing nature of that relationship has changed significantly in the last few years. And I don't think enough organizations are reaching out to their providers, their vendors, their advisors saying, can we look at how we work together? And is there a way to deepen this relationship in a, in a much more meaningful purpose led way? So I'll hand over to Hazem on this one. Yeah, sure. Uh, who am I who am I directing these points to, uh, Dan? Again, if, if um, the built environment had a face, was that was that the yes, the the, con the conceptual right. the person who could be the change yeah, agent? The figurative, the right, right, right. Okay, well, I would I would ask them first and foremost what their uh, their innovation strategy is. You know, very broad. How are you taking advantage of um, R and D and innovation? How are you integrating it into your existing business model? Are you investing in early stage companies? Are you working with early stage companies? What are you doing around innovation just generally? I, I you know, I want to know how are you leveraging tech? What are, when are you going to start leveraging tech? What tech, blah, 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 all of those things. Second, what are you doing around trust? You know, maybe we, you know, uh, uh, coin something new on this call and call it a trust strategy. You know, maybe every organization and uh, or alliance needs to have a trust strategy. What are you doing to rebuild trust with uh, with your stakeholders, whether it's shareholders, um, whether it's uh, uh, government, academia, partners, clients, et cetera, et cetera. I think that's important. I think the companies that really win, forget the technology race and this race and that race, right? They're all enablers to developing excellent customer experiences and client experiences and uh, being true, I think, to the values that, that they believe matter. Um, so I think what would that trust strategy be or look like? And lastly, how are you going to empower your customers or contractors or whoever uh, to really take what you're doing seriously through the kind of new skin in the game models uh, that we're talking about? And I think those three things, if those, those three things are the kind of uh, main, uh, you know, uh, light of fire under under folks's toes to to think more deeply about and begin developing uh, things as they have their regular strategies and business models and so on then then i think that's uh, that's a fantastic use of uh, of everyone's time no brilliant thank you both very much um if you're if you're staying on i hope you enjoy the the rest of the sessions if not um i'll reach you i hope you have a great rest of your respective days thank you thanks dan for a great discussion Thanks, Hazem. Thank you both. It was a pleasure, and uh, thanks for the opportunity. Take care, everyone. Yeah. Thank you. Good. Thank you very much. Uh, so before we break for lunch, um, I'm just going to do a quick roundup um, and uh, on the sessions that we've had this morning. 
Um, so obviously we started with Paul Morell, who gave a very interesting uh, whistle stop tour around the built environment with some of the key um, drivers, issues and bits and pieces in there. Uh, I think in particularly talking about how you know the, the demand for, for new building works is quite diverse and volatile. Uh, and this idea that, you know, due to the, some of the unique aspects of the way that we work in the built environment, we are protected from competition in some areas, particularly from the foreign side. Um, but as a result of this lack of um, incursion on the built environment, if I can use that phrase, it means that we typically haven't really been at the forefront of trying to innovate and speed everything up, which is why we end up quite low on some of these league tables when it comes to digitalization, innovation, and other aspects as well. And that, you know, due to this, this can be seen as both, you know, the problem of why uh, things need to change, but also the opportunity that digital has in getting us to a point where we can start to use these things for the betterment and to resolve some of these issues. Um, in particular as well, some of the things that Paul uh, spoke about was about some issues we have with the way we kind of treat our workforce. And this has actually come through on a number of the sessions is that mental health, diversity and inclusion and other bits and pieces have been, you know, hot topics throughout. Uh, and some of the shocking figures like how around 450 workers take their own lives annually um, as part of that. And just seeing then from the session we had with um, Hamzin and Margareta there about the point of actually what we need to start doing is, you know, to start to empower that people talk, communicate, pull people together and, and build and build trust. So there's a lot of the sort of the soft skill elements that actually need to come into the way that we work to make sure that people feel safe, secure, and valued in the way that they work in the built environment. And particularly when you read things like Mark Farmer's Modernize or Die and similar, where we've talked about this issue of labor shortages and lack of people coming into the built environment. And perhaps if we applied more value onto those individuals that they and you know, we improved the investment that we put in them, it might be a way of bringing more people in. You know, from a client point of view, we know that people want uh, aff affordable projects. And what was quite surprising, and I found it particularly shocking um, from Paul as well, was this idea that some buildings have been 14 times uh take 14 times more energy than expected um and while i appreciate that you know we often joke about the you know the performance gap um, i hadn't realized it was that systematic and then actually you know if buildings really aren't performing well there there are some real conversations need to be had about whether it's looking at buildability whether it is um, skills issues in terms of the way we create it or whether systems are becoming too complex or not fit for purpose in there um, so there's some really interesting things in there and, you know, some pictures that brought it home in that way. And ultimately, you know, what we want to do is solve with technology. And this is where that second session in particular, where we had Mo and the other startups talk about, you know, a lot of interesting things there. And you know, some of the bits that I pulled out in particular were things like um, this idea that, again, communication is important. And what we need to keep doing is talking between each other and also through the supply chain to grab things. And something quite poignant, I think Jade raised, was this idea that you could listen to someone for, you know, five minutes and hear hundreds of words, but there are two or three key words in there that actually might help expose what their problem is. So it's not just about listening, but it's about active listening and trying to pull out some of this useful information. And often the problem, it will be cultural. And this idea that, you know, we, uh, if someone isn't from the built environment, there can be resistance there. And it seemed quite interesting that the majority of those on the startup discussion panel have people with a construction background in their organizations. And I think it's one way of both understanding the unique way that the built environment works, but also allowing someone to be able to transform new innovations into the language of the built environment. And actually by being hearing them in those same sort of ways, it allows people to easily more accept them. And that through digital, we can actually use these to, to solve many of these problems. And we heard about how things like Zoom and Teams and other things have been supporting the way that we communicate. Um, but what we need to start doing is breaking down some of those silos and some of these tools can do that um, and achieve some of these things because ultimately what we've got to do is look at ultimately changing processes 
and by going in and working with organizations to uplift and change the way that they work as opposed to kind of disrupting from a native stance we can actually build and pull some of these things together so there are quite a lot of things that I came out of there and interestingly then sort of floating between the bits this idea of ownership has come out of today as well in the sense of who owns the problems in the built environment and who can we empower to, to lead and provide insight into how we change them and you know, a lot of discussion at the start focus on perhaps that's the construction leadership council but also equally from questions that have come through yourselves as well as some of the thoughts from the teams is that actually you know it's up to us to to be our own change agents and to make these changes in the built environment um, i've always liked this idea of kind of selfish improvements and whenever i've spoken to people about things like uh, building information modeling or bim the idea is to find the bits that benefit your business first and then through that you're then able to start the journey on something that's going to be a something with a clear return on investment and then could build on the competencies and other bits and pieces afterwards as you start to bring people along for hopefully what are the easy bits that appear to kind of improve on uh, you know productivity efficiencies and other bits and pieces um but you know as we move into other wider digital bits and pieces it can sometimes be more difficult to to see what those returns are you know if you've improved decision making through better access to, to in data and information how do you quantify that um, and hopefully some of the sessions we'll see this afternoon will will touch on some of that because we'll be talking not just about productivity but about economic value and about social value for things as well. So I think it's been a really interesting session with some key takeaways, mostly to, to talk and communicate, whether it's talking to uh, people in your organization, to, talking to stakeholders, talking to trusted partners. It's about actually working together, being less transactional and more collaborative. And I think that what we're you doing is using digital as a tool that helps us achieve that, where traditional methods, ways of working might have inhibited us to do that. So hopefully over lunch, um, we can have a think about that and then see how it relates to this afternoon sessions. So with that, um, I will leave you there. Um, we are gonna hit lunch now um, and we'll keep the whole thing live during lunch, just like we did with the comfort break. So feel free to stay on or pop off and jump back on afterwards, but the WebEx session will stay live for the whole time. And we'll see you all back here at half past one, where we will start to look at the drivers and how actually digital can have a real positive impact on the built environment. Thank you very much for listening and I'll see you all this afternoon. Just for the, the lunch bit, if that's all right. Um, I just wanted to make a quick note that hopefully you've seen it on the screen there, um, but as part of what we do here uh, at BSI is that we do have monthly webinars uh, and they have uh, particularly focused in on the built environment, which are at lunch times and focused around CPD. So they tend to be more informative um, than they are commercial and they tend to be quite interesting. So just to let you know of some upcoming events we've got that on the 19th of July, we have an event focusing on BS 99001, looking at quality management in the built environment. In August, we're looking at collaborative reporting for safer structures. Um, in September, something on the launch of BS 8644 part one, looking at the digital management of fire safety information, um, as well as an event on competence um, for the fire safety professional. So we have an awful lot of different events on. Uh, so please go to the link you can see there, BSI group slash events, if you want to find out more about these events like the, um, today's event, they're free to join and you know they tend to be quite interesting ones that myself and other members of the team um, host, manage, and then engage with a specialist to share information out into the wider sector. So please do join us. Um, and on that note, um, I will uh, continue with today's event. Um, apologies for that last minute um, swap over there. So welcome back. Um, I hope you've been enjoying the session so far. Um, I certainly have um, from hearing from our panel of speakers. And as I mentioned, the way that today has been working is that the morning was more of a focus on the issues and the barriers. So we had Paul Morrell speak around, you know, what are some of the systematic issues that we have in the built environment, um, focusing on some of the things that are unique to us. 
Uh, and then we had some really interesting sessions from startups who were looking at some of the challenges in terms of getting behavioral change within an organization, as well as then hearing about what's happening in other sectors and how we can try to uh, incite change in that way. And while we've been focusing on the problem this morning, this afternoon, we're moving on to a much more positive tone and we're going to start to focus on um, the value that digital can bring. And, you know, we truly do believe that it, it is a value bringer. And what we've tried to do is structure these sessions around some of the value capitals. So for those of you who looked at things like the construction innovation hub work and some of those other bits and pieces, um, some of the terms we're using to break this might be familiar. Um, so we're first off going to have Gavin Summerson from the Connected Places Catapult. Uh, Gavin's going to talk to us about social value and how digital can help, you know, particularly around people and citizens, but that idea of actually where digital supports people and social, which often can be missed uh, from conversation. After that, we're going to have a chaired panel session, and it's going to be chaired by Tim Chapman uh, from Arab. It's going to focus on the environmental value. So looking at carbon management and net zero, and particularly, you know, since um, COP last year and, and even much before then, you know, climate, carbon management, low carbon materials and other bits and pieces are hot on the agenda in the built environment. And seeing how digital can support these is certainly going to be a, a valuable session to, to be engaged with. And then to finish off the day, um, Jonathan Monkley from WSP and myself are going to talk about the economic value that digital can bring. So focusing on um, streamlining productivity, efficiencies, and those sorts of things there to round us off. So hopefully then as part of a kind of a whole package today, we've heard about some of the drivers, uh, sort of the issues and barriers, and then focusing then on the benefits afterwards, which hopefully, hopefully well rounds everything together. And really, that's all I really wanted to say as part of a welcome and an overview. Um, if anyone's just joining us this afternoon, I'll just do a quick reminder that these webinars are a listen only um, mode. So you're not able to unmute yourselves, but what you can do is use the Q&A function on the side of the screen. Uh, we've done, had quite a few questions that we've managed to weave into the discussions today. So thank you for those so far. Uh, and in particular, then, if you have any questions for Gavin's session, I'll drop in afterwards uh, to do some Q&A at the end. And what will happen is through the discussion panels um, afterwards, the idea is that if you put your questions in, we will weave those into the narrative. So if you don't hear them being directly addressed, it's because we're looking to pick them up as part of the wider discussion. Likewise, if you have any tech problems, uh, you start to unhear, they can't hear the mic or wondering what's going on from a visual point of view, feel free to pop those questions in the chat. Uh, and without further ado, um, I think we should probably carry on on today's program. Um, so if Gavin is available, I'd like to invite him to join me up here. Ah, there you are, Gavin. Good afternoon. Afternoon. Hi, everyone. Good. And in which case, then, um, I will I'll I'll jump out of the way and I'll let you do your presentation. Um, good luck. I'm excited to hear what you have to say. Uh, and please feel free to take it away. Gav. Thanks a lot, Dan. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Nice to uh, join you. Uh, delighted to uh, be talking at this um, at this session. Um, Move on to the next slide. Um, so I'm going to be talking about the um, the opportunities and the, the benefits of, of digital in helping um, improving lives for people and citizens. Talking about social value. Um, my name is Gavin Summerson um, from Connected Places Catapult. Um, I am construction innovation and standards team lead within a uh, built environment. Um, about us, we are uh, one of um, the, the catapults. There's a number of different catapults around the UK. Our role is, is that we are UK's innovation accelerator for cities, transport and place leadership. Um, the work we do is around connecting to market.
Well, we'd be here, be here, uh, we appear to be having a slight technical difficulty with Gavin. Um, so what we'll do is we'll give him one or two minutes uh, to reconnect. Um, as I see that his computer might have uh, gone awry. Um, obviously, with social value being so important, I mean, what's probably happened there is that um, his computer can't handle the key value he is trying to share. Um, so what I will do for now while we wait for Gavin to pop back on is I will share some of my thoughts around social value and some of the bits that hopefully Gavin will, will look to address. Um, and as he comes in, then we can talk about that. Um, so interestingly, um, I have mentioned a few times today already the work that's been going on in the Construction Innovation Hub around the Value Toolkit and the various bits and pieces that have been happening there. Um, there's quite an interesting piece of work that's been done by the Value Toolkit, uh, which looking at value definitions and the way they break out. And as a key part of that, they have a social capital, which looks at you know some of those key areas under social. Um, the first being influence and consultation and the idea is actually ensuring that the the right stakeholders are related to decision making in a process and we've actually heard today already a fair bit around making sure that you bring the right people into the conversation in terms of what's happening there um, as we heard that both from you know the startup conversation from paul morrell and from our conversation around what's happening between different sectors as well and that how important it is to get the right people involved with what's happening in a similar way, um, there's a key point there around equality and diversity. How do we actually ensure that there are equal opportunities and equal access for all within the built environment? And particularly, you know, I think from a city's uh, context there is that when we're trying to support citizens and having things like active transport and engagement in all the facilities that a city or connected place can actually have, it's about ensuring that they are, they are fair and that there is uh, equal access available to everyone. And you know, that involves actually looking at how do we you know, improve deprived communities? How do we provide provisions for marginalized parts of society and other bits and pieces as well so that everyone has their chance there. And you know, ultimately another third part of that is around networks and connections uh, to ensure that actually it's not just about doing your bit in silo, it's about pulling everything together in that way to ensure that different things can be addressed and achieved. And particularly, we had a lot of this when we talked through the supply chain and some of the bits that were going on in the conversation, both with Paul and with uh, Margareta and Hamzin, talking about the importance of the supply chain and that kind of wider value chain and how they get engaged with in a more kind of collaborative way. And these are sort of a lot of the kind of the social benefits um, that we can have in the way that we work. Uh, in the same way, it kind of feeds into that kind of more human side of things in how we help people. And you might have seen and those of you who might have been exposed to some of our competence work is that when we look at people we can split things up in several different ways and skills and knowledge is a key part of that um, ensuring that there's high quality training and skills available to people and your know, digital is is no different to that and i think it's been quite interesting how we can see how organizations are provide um, expect someone to show up with professional training you know they are a structural engineer by background perhaps and they've gone through um, structural engineering training but do they actually have have they been given excel training do they actually know what all the buttons do i'll be honest i maybe know what six buttons do in excel those six buttons work very well for me and i can do an awful lot of good things with them um, but i certainly haven't been trained on how to use excel i have been trained in how to use outlook uh, but they are you know, day to day software tools that we're using. And when you think of them, when you move into more complex things like Revit, Tecla, um, Archicad, um, Revitzo, other bits and pieces, there's a myriad of software out there that people are using that they don't necessarily have had intensive training in. So how do we ensure that they actually can use those things properly and effectively? Uh, you know, we hear a lot about the brain drain and actually, you know, from a digital point of view, how can we ensure that experience is being captured? And Paul mentioned this quite importantly, that there isn't a feedback loop effectively in what we do. And actually, how often do projects properly collect, you know, the real success stories, the pain points that people felt at the individual level, not at the project level, you know, what's this project over budget, but actually, what was that one frustration for that team? that meant that they weren't able to do what they were meant to do. And you know, through actually using you know, 
digital to capture feedback throughout the process in case of discrete deliverables, the way information exchanged, how we've dealt with client, you know, some sort of project diaries or similar, then can get fed back into um, almost like a project relationship management tool. In that way, then we can actually capture what are, you know, the, the frictions that appear, because actually it could be throughout all the projects, the same frictions are occurring and without some form of data analytics to pull those things together, it actually can be quite difficult to understand those and make systematic changes within your organization. So there are several things there that can happen to resolve these things and it all focuses on that people and social side of it. In the same way, we've heard a lot about health. You know, how do we ensure that people are healthy and happy through digital? Um, and I, most of you, I imagine, probably have something like a smartwatch or something on. You know, I've got my Fitbit and taking real time, well, not quite real time, right time data analytics about my health back to me so I can actually log it and have a look at it in the way that I'm trending um, on certain bits and pieces, particularly like my resting heart rate and the amount of steps I've done, which normally isn't enough in a day. Uh, but actually, you know, how do we ensure, you know, the health and well-being of those we are involved with? And we've heard from Paul that actually, you know, there are some difficult parts of the built environment. It's a high stress environment and it often isn't long term realization of what's going to happen in the way that we work. So in which case then we're having to sit there and you know work in quite high stress environments. And uh, for those of you who come to our regular uh, built environment webinars, you would have heard from the Architects of Benevolent Society a couple of months back about uh, mental health and some of the you know shocking facts and figures there are for the built environment. So anything we can do to support health, both physical and mental, ultimately is quite an important thing. And then one of the things that we found um, from our um, you know, looking at other sectors panel when we were talking to Margaret and Hamzin was actually about employment and how do we provide a meaningful work for people. And it's quite a difficult thing to to give meaning in that in such a way for some things, particularly when they are quite transactional, but actually looking for the purpose driven bits, making people feel invested in their organization, helping them to achieve things like the mission and vision and other bits and pieces allows them to push these things through so that they actually feel that value from what they're doing. Um, and in the same way, how the organization invests in them. So how does the organization safeguard their welfare? How does the organization provide benefits to them in order to realize these sorts of things? You know, and these are all part of building that social value aspect into what we do. And hopefully when Gavin reappears, um, I imagine his computer might have exploded. Um, we'll hopefully then hear from him about those social values from a kind of catapult context. Um, but they are quite interesting. And I think that work from the Innovation Hub um, is there uh, to work these things out. So what I'm going to do is that I'm going to um, jump off camera for a minute. We're going to have um, the slide will go up for just two minutes so we can see what's going on. Um, and then I will report back to you on whether we're going to change the program around or anything like that. So please stick with us. It'd be great to hear from you if you do have any questions. Uh, we've had a good array so far today. Um, so I think that any questions you do have would be greatly appreciated in the way that um, in things that we are talking about. Welcome back, Gavin. Hello, that was the possible worst timing I've got. So I, I have, um, talking about social value uh, and the use of digital, um, for the worst possible time, our builders turn off the power in our house. So I have no connectivity. But I am back now. <laughs> That's right. Um, so just in case it comes up in your presentation, um, I, I, I briefly spoke to everyone about the um, CIH's value toolkit work around the social human capital and some of it there. So if you happen to do a deep dive there, you might be able to skip over it a little, but otherwise I will leave it back with you, fella. Thank you. Thank you, Dan. Apologies, everyone. <laughs> um, so um, I'll take you quickly through um, key, um, key, key messages. Um, so, yeah, a bit about Connected Places Caspol. I'm not quite sure where I got uh, turned off, but um, yeah, we are the UK's innovation accelerator for cities, transport, place, leadership. Um, and our, our kind of role in, in, in digital is, is, is how can we help with prosperity? 
Um, so improving economies, um, improving uh, the rollout of next generation services and solutions. Um, and there's also a huge kind of connection with um, well-being and how we can um, we can improve well-being, um, address net zero. Um, talking about social value, so much to talk about. Um, so I'm just going to touch on a, a couple of key areas um, to condense um, what I wanted to talk about. Firstly, we have um, I think I think Dan, you may have already mentioned this uh, the definition of so social value. So it's thinking about personal and collective well-being, short and long term, which is quite uh, quite key things to, uh, to to remember there. And in the built environment, think about the impacts of our buildings and places on well-being and um, how to improve quality of life. Um, so, kind of two areas I want to touch on really. Firstly, um, there's there's the role of digital improving um, in, in in providing social value in, in the way we design our homes. But there's also kind of the wider place making agenda. So, how we can use better data driven decision making on how we shape future places. Um, so, one thing is that cities are very complex ecosystems. You've got different connected systems of, um, of, of resources flowing, knowledge flowing, finance, people, um, carbon. Um, and I, I, I like this graphic. It's, it's a nice uh, illustration of the different systems involved. Um, and the role of digital and, uh, is, is here is helping to connect and consider these different impacts um, and independencies um, and how, how they all relate and, and how we can um, impact upon social value. Um, this is taken from PD8100, which is a smart cities uh, overview guide. Um, and another thing I want to talk about is, is and our role of data is uh, in the built environment, we're still using a lot of uh, analog systems, whether it's in planning applications or a lot of our data in the built environment is, is locked up in, in PDFs uh, distributed in many locations. Um, so I think one kind of key message is around the need to better utilize the data and think about how what 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 is the data that might be generated and how can that be can be better shared um, and um, some work we've been doing on um, looking at um, a key process in the built environment sector is is in environmental impact assessments um, key opportunity to influence um, social value um, but there's many opportunities to improve this process um, for example uh, how we can uh, better access uh, the, the, the data, for example, HS2 has 25 different uh, environmental statements, a huge amount of data that's kind of locked up in, in many of these um, impact assessments. Um, and how can we use better digital tools to, um, to, to, to great gain more value from these processes? Um, <clears throat> this is a project we, uh, we worked on, digital EIA. All of the, um, the papers are, are online, and this is looking at new um, digital solutions for, for increasing the impact of, of EIA processes. How can we uh, improve uh, the use of EIA to have a, have a greater impact? Um, but localized um, community level data is, is, is also um, really important. Uh, and we saw this a huge amount um, during COVID, be able to, uh, be able to respond to, to local circumstances. Uh, and this is a really important thing for for local planning um, and so work we've been doing with Hounslow to look at defining what is a 15-minute neighborhood for the borough of Hounslow has been very driven by understanding localized uh, context so how can we engage better with communities and citizens and using localized data uh, to understand the needs of a, of a community to um, improve their needs what are, what the citizens want so I think one opportunity with digital is how we can better engage with citizens so how we can develop better processes for, for the citizen engagement um, and, and use that to, um, to, to deliver social, social value. 15-minute um, neighbourhoods uh, about helping to uh, neighbourhoods to meet their everyday needs within a short walk or cycle of a home. Uh, benefits include improving economies, people's health and well-being, improving social connections and communities and tackling climate change. Um, Portland's had a very uh, data-driven approach uh, to this. Um, they developed something called the uh, Complete Neighborhoods Index. So a great use of kind of digital for looking at how to improve uh, the neighborhood. So this has had a, a heat map to look at areas with fewer amenities or, or those with have higher amenities and safer streets. So using different kind of data to, 
target how to um, interventions at a community level that can then have um, impacts on, on social impacts. So I think that's a really important area is how we how we kind of plan and, and design communities. Um, and we worked on these uh, guiding principles around uh, 15 minute neighborhoods. A key one there was around improving kind of data rich neighborhoods. So improving data collection and analysis at a, at a neighborhood level um, and, and using that as a way of focusing exactly what do places need. So having a very having being places focused on the needs for everyone, um, people centered streets and mobility, um, access to, um, to, to, to all their needs. Um, and also the role in accelerating uh, net zero uh, and biodiversity in, in, in neighborhoods. Um, so second kind of example I want to use is around, around homes. Um, healthy aging is a, a really big uh, topic. So just some kind of key, key issues really. So within the next decade, 20% of the total population in the UK will be over 65 years old. Um, by 2050, that will be increased to 25%. So we have a we have an aging population. 80% um, of the UK's uh, elderly population have very limited housing options. So many of our homes are just not suitable. So that that results in many many people not having to go into care, not being able to live independently, or there are issues arising um, in the home. Uh, and 1.4 million older people class themselves often as lonely. So it's a real a real stark issue. Um, we've been running a program called Homes for Healthy Aging. Um, what we're doing is creating a set of test beds on five locations in the UK to test out digital solutions that can address many of the challenges from uh, loneliness to improving housing conditions. Um, it's building kind of replicable solutions. Um, also looking at how we can influence the built environment um, industry. Um, just to give an example, so one area where um, thinking about how we can design better design our, our homes around damp and cold homes, um, many damp cold homes um, around the country, um, and in many cases they're going into hospital or respiratory conditions um, several times before that kind of cause can be identified. So many people suffering from this issue, but what it is, it tends to be a reactive process. So the opportunity for digital here is how can um, how can digital help to make this more of a uh, less of a reactive and more of a predictive issue, uh, and it has cross-cutting impact stamp. So landlords, additional maintenance, health practitioners have to keep prescribing treatments and increasing prescriptions. Local authorities have to have more services on social care. Charities have increased demands for their community services, and res residents most uh, significantly respiratory diseases. Uh, it can be a, uh, a cycle of, of causation and treatment and intervention. And um, so what we've been doing uh, here is looking at kind of testing out solutions with the market for digital solutions. Firstly, identifying where is at risk of um, damp and cold homes, which properties are at risk, uh, confirming and, and management. So looking at solutions that can confirm that damp and, and mold and, uh, in the home. And then also innovative uh, physical interventions. So the, that intervention there was a was a was a new type of uh, air brick um, that could be more responsive to uh, to damp conditions. Um, these were the SMEs that we were we were um, working with. And just one example from Urban Tide. So they've been working with smart meter data um, in order to predict um, areas where homes may go into uh, fuel poverty. Um, so this is using smart meter data to look at that to help better planning of of where interventions may be best targeted. Um, so that's a really great um, uh, example. Um, and I think just a quick sort of summary really is that um, you know, the way we design and manage the built environment has many long-term impacts on people. So that may be from a, a community level in terms of how you get to work or, or the opportunities you have. So the 15 minute neighborhood um, opportunity there is, is using digital for designing better neighborhoods that meet communities needs. Um, but also with homes using data digital to, to move towards um, more predictive um, maintenance or preventing issues. Um, and then, yeah, data is a common thread in, in many of these issues. So better informed decisions, improving lives. Um, and just a, a one thing I wanted to share as well is a really useful kind of tool to think about all of this in terms of the data you might need and, and how that can support uh, decision making. Uh, if Dan hasn't already mentioned, um, the BSI Flex um, 390 uh, value-based decision making is out for consultation at the moment. So that's a, a good, I can vouch for the technical author, Falavi, who I used to work with. 
Um, so yeah, that's uh, definitely worth um, have it, having a, a look at. Um, but that's a, a quick uh, fly through from me, kind of some different perspectives from a community, um, from a home uh, angle. Um, so I'll pass back to you, um, Dan. <laughs> no, that's pretty, thank you. There's, um, it, that was, that was, yeah, very quick fly through, which is interesting. And actually we've had, we're getting a couple of questions in on some of the social value stuff. So that will be, it'll be helpful to go through some of those. So as long as you're in, yeah, your, your internet and power hold out, I'm sure yes. we'll, <laughs> we'll do okay. Um, so I, the first question um, that's come in is that um, you sure showed some of the examples around the damp and cold interventions and mm. whether you could speak a little bit more about the interventions around the loneliness bit, uh, and actually how are how, you know, how are you helping with the with that angle on the elderly and lo loneliness? Yeah, so the loneliness aspects, um, the some of the solutions that are being um, looked at there are, are things like community services. So those are trying to it's not necessarily a like a social uh, media network, but looking at people within the community that might be happy to help um, those that are lonely. So it's kind of matching volunteers that are, are happy to talk to uh, people in the community that, uh, to, to provide company to uh, those, uh, those that are lonely. So that's one of the solutions we've been, we've, that's been trialed. Um, other solutions are, are actual, one of the challenges with many digital solutions for older people is, is there is there accessibility issues. So we've been trying, uh, that's been a lot of the learning from the programs how to design solutions that meet the needs of older people um so we've been trialing some um applications uh with um for example um e easier to use kind of video conferencing for example zoom many, many struggle with using things like zoom um so easier to access um uh, social media uh, and, uh as well um so yeah, we've been do we did a sh showcase event um, in Belfast uh, with many of these solutions. So there's going to be more kind of dissemination around um, some of those solutions. So I think a lot of it's just about the design, like designing effective solutions that, that people can use and doing that kind of engagement on it. No, it's interesting, and I think that selfishly building on it, it's a, it's, a, it's a phrase I've come across quite a lot. I don't know how much you see it. Is this idea of digital poverty? Yeah. Yeah. And actually, you know, as it's it's that double barrel, doesn't it, of, of that digital side of it, as you say, where you know, um, and you you get poverty both in the skills and in the technology. And uh, the anecdote I'll give, which you might have actually seen almost in person with some of this, was that um, a, a friend of mine's uh, grandfather, we uh, they got them an iPad, and they were really struggling to use it. Uh, mm. And we, no one could understand why that he was struggling to use his iPad. And it turned out that when he retired. Uh, well, before he retired was when keyboards had come in. So he had never actually used a QWERTY layer keyboard before. So the, the reason he was finding it so difficult, he was just physically sat there looking for which letter to use. Because back when he was in work, you know, you know, he would handwrite a letter and the secretary would type it up sort of thing. And he's just not had a computer. So it's quite surprising sometimes when you get to those older generations how they haven't used some of these technologies mm. before and you know we've seen in the pandemic it's all been qr codes um mm. for restaurant menus and you've then got to register an account with some pay system to, you know it's all for someone who hasn't been exposed to some of this technology it can be quite difficult so i think mm. there's, there's a learning curve there and that's even if you own the right tech and you know there was a, a surprising fact which was something like 40% of people with broadband can't afford to keep up the bills for it or something like that. So there's mm. um, when you add in needing smart tech and the fact that the, a lot of these um, products are designed to fall apart within three to five years, actually it's, it, it's, quite, it's quite difficult to get the balance right between the benefits, but also then you know, some of these issues there. I don't know how much of that have you been exposed to from the capital side? Yeah, so we've been we we did some work last year with uh, Birmingham City Council on their uh, digital city strategy, looking at what they want to do uh, post COVID to help grow the economy in in Birmingham, and 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 there's been they've seen a huge amount of transformation in lots of businesses around the use of digital. So you know, a number of restaurants and shops that now have have digital tools, but also the number of of um, you know 
there's there is a huge kind of disparity between different communities um, within within uh, within the city. Um, so many just do not um, do not have kind of access to um, to, to to the IT system. So you know many people without 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 computers. Um, but, uh, but data policy, yeah, as you say, was was like a real barrier. So then many of people are on pay-as-you-go contracts. So you know you can't have access. But then if people are um, do have kind of the, the the internet access, they may not have someone quiet to work. You know, they may be sharing with eight others in their um, in in their household and and having somewhere quiet. So um, I think a lot of work in in many cities are looking at how to improve that digital kind of inclusion. To um, if because people are getting stuck, you know, in, in poverty, you know, they can't, you can't get, you know, if you don't have the the, the funds to, to to get access to to um, connectivity, a quiet place to work, you're not going to be able to get yourself out. Um, so looking at how we provide things like co-working or uh, access to uh, to Wi-Fi in public areas and things like that, so people can access services. So yeah, I think it's a yeah, it's a big 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 issue. No, great, thank you. Um... One of the other questions we've had in is around um, one of those hot topics at the moment, which is ESG. Um, and I guess the, the question vaguely is where it's around whether ESG processes are, are part of this digital world. And I guess, interestingly, you flagged up some of those smart city documents and those relationships. I uh, guess the question maybe first is where does ESG fit in from a city or kind of community level, which I think is actually, as opposed to organizational governance, we're looking maybe now at the city and place governance more generally, and then also then how does digital maybe help support um, that kind of environmental social governance aspect? Yeah, I think so. I think there's a real opportunity of ESG in that the, there's so many kind of, there's many community initiatives that, you know, um, where Communities have have ideas and initiatives that, that for, for which may be around climate action, you know, maybe biodiversity, maybe other social uh, related um, kind of um, initiatives. Where um, and and it's one of the things we again reference with, with Birmingham is, is the, it was the idea of of how you can match. Um, so we were looking at how you might be able to match some of the um, investors that are looking to um, to create impact with communities that want to are able to actually mobilize so i think there's a really nice kind of opportunity there for looking at where are the opportunities and, and how could uh, how could that esg kind of investments support those local initiatives i think that would be that's quite a i think quite a powerful kind of opportunity there okay good um we've got a couple more coming through which is good so people keep keep throwing your questions in um for gavin while we have him um there's one here about more details around the um you talked about those digital environmental impact assessments and actually i think there seems to be some interest in that so if if you could elaborate a bit more and maybe tell people where they can find more about those yeah so so the work we did on digital eia we we did a whole um, mapping of the entire digital uh, the environmental impact assessment process um so that's kind of the, the process from start to, to end and looking at all of the um, the key pain points, um, it, it was really it was really fun um, because we got um, uh, people from across the industry, uh, and we had them um, playing with Lego and uh, and Play-Doh to to help us understand the system. Um, so we were ma mapping out how the system currently works and, and where the pain points are. Um, and some of it is is just that your there's there's things like if you think of air quality um, impact assessments. It's done almost on every single um, project, you know, or most projects. There may be um, air quality um, assessments carried out in a project. That information then goes into a report, um, but it doesn't get shared with anyone. And then you have someone else in another building project that may be next door doing another air quality assessment. So it's things like that. How could you? How could how could that could that data be made open, or could you use other people's sources? So that's kind of one area and, and, I, and one of the issues we found is people just found there's a lack of kind of trust so people were do, just doing things again uh, producing more and more information evidence because it's fairly self-regulated um so we're getting this what we call a obesity of, of of eia data there's so much produced because people are justifying themselves um and that's yeah and that's causing quite a big 
but it's also very hard to navigate you know the the, the pages and pages of information if someone in the public wants to understand the impact of a project really hard to grasp that from the number of like reports you'd have to go through so again uh, um, another opportunity is how to actually better better engage communities in environmental impact of projects um, I think is a really important one so how can you visualize things better um, and, and make things and I think streamlining and standardizing these processes as well so um, what what does a report look like um, what goes into an environmental statement um, there's a huge number of kind of opportunities uh, um, around that well, no, I, certainly. And I think before we move on to uh, another question, I think the interesting one there is, so, so you'll, I mean, Gavin, you'll know personally, that I'm, I'm a big fan of standardizing deliverables in that sort of way. And, mm -hmm. you know, uh, for those interested, you know, we have some, some of the most beautiful standards on how to do good construction drawings. Um, and, you know, in particular, things like line weights and font style. So when it comes to doing design work or engineering work we've put an awful lot of detail in how we convey that information to someone mm -hmm. but when you then move into something like as you're saying an environmental impact assessment or um you know or, or those more nuanced things we haven't gone to that same sort of level so actually mm -hmm. like you say from a from a digital point of view if we are able to standardize those um not necessarily in a british standard you other other places and locales and mechanisms are available but you know this idea of, of we could agree between us that you know these are the objects we describe these are the properties about mm -hmm. those that we want to capture these are the metrics we want to use it would allow you to start pulling that information together like you said to actually mm -hmm. start pulling some of these things together um i remember i won't be able to find it now but there's a there's a Welsh government website that shows I think some of the noise volumes they've taken from many of the roads, and then you almost have that kind of noise spillage kind of data. So you can look at you know domestic properties and work out actually how loud the ambient noise will be from the roads. Mm. Um, you know, and that's open data, and that that's fantastic. As you say, as a visualization, it's almost like a heat map of showing well if it's near the M4, you know, don't bother. Um, but you know, unless that's your thing. But you know, I think it's it's having access to that in a in a relatable way to provide that social value. And I appreciate it comes off it a little, um, but it's there in the same way. Is that how does this is also relevant to building safety, isn't it? Because actually, mm -hmm. there's a lot of conversations about residents and access to the right sort of information. So in that work you've done with Berman and others, have you found that people feel empowered when they're given this stuff, or do they feel overwhelmed by it? Yeah, so yeah, I mean, when we, when we kind of looked at, um, when we did some work with, um, uh, well, well, MHCLG or, D, or, or DLUC, so we were specifically we were looking at kind of a golden uh, golden thread initiative, and, and we so we did some specific engagement on that on that piece. What information? I mean, and people are yeah are overwhelmed um, at what what information what information is used. So I think there's there's definitely you need to test this out. I think don't don't kind of create things in you know. In industry silos, I think you need to create things with people. So I think that's kind of the key lesson that we we applied is, yeah, you need to kind of if you're looking at it to engage, you need to test this out. And there's a there's a big piece of work that um, Department of Level Up Communities, um, it's a long acronym, key luck, uh, are uh, <laughs> are doing uh, the Prop Tech Engagement Fund. Um, this is funding a number of uh, solutions for how to engage with citizens in placemaking. So. Watford uh, Borough Council have got a, a new website they've been uh, trialling to help you to look at planning applications, which has 3D visualizations. And you can just add a comment like you would in any other kind of platform. It doesn't have a complex planning application form. <laughs> it's just add a comment. Um, so yeah, I think you need to think about how to present things in a yeah um, a way people will understand. We use a lot of industry terms that not everyone understands. <laughs> No, that's that's great, Gavin. Um, so I, I can't see any other questions who have come through at the moment. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to pre-warn the next session that I'm going to ask them to come in a couple of minutes early. So I, Tim and others, I can see you're on the list now. So as a warning, um, I'm, I'm going to ask Gavin one final little question to present to me on, then I'm going to jump over. So I guess we've talked about a fair few things here. Um, what, what do you think someone's takeaway should be from this event around social value and i appreciate that's a really broad question but you know from if they're if they're trying to think of using digital to improve social value for themselves what should mm. they think about as you're kind of 
closing statement before we uh, we, we jump on the rest of the sessions. Yeah. So yeah. So so for me, I think it's um, yeah, I'm really kind of keen on the community level angle. Um, so for me, I think engaging with communities. Um, I think the power is kind of when you can get those stories, those community stories, um, working with communities on those specific sorts. You know, solutions. What do communities want? How can you work with those initiatives and create create impact in your in your local community? So I think yeah, engagement um, is is a key one for me. Um, design design things with communities, um, and and think about the different users and stakeholders that you're going to be impacting on um, and working with them. So that's, that's a key one for me. No, it's interesting, and um, I don't know if you were here earlier, but that that seems to be a pretty consistent theme for today because I think. Uh, all the sessions have, have effectively almost used digital as a as a synonym for communication in a way and actually what it's doing is it's helping you connect to other people and that kind of stakeholder analysis or you know bring, uh, the ability to bring people together it, it seems mm. to be a key part of it and it, it seems to be carrying on throughout the day which i think is, is quite an interesting thing um no that's brilliant thank you very much gavin thank you um good right so i will release you for the rest of your day thank you very much for that um, and then what we will do is we will look at starting the next session. Um, thank you, Tim. You seem to have got my prompt, which is excellent. So thank you for that. Um, and uh, what I'll do is I will relinquish the stage and I'll hand over to you if you don't mind. Thanks, Dan. Hopefully you can all hear me. Um, yep, thumbs up, Dan, if you can hear me. Sorry, good. I fell I'll off. But yes, Tim, I can hear you, yes. Excellent, good. Um, you're all very welcome, and this is actually I think, a fascinating session because we're going to bring together digital and net zero carbon together. So I'm really chuffed to be joined by a very high quality panel with me. Hopefully they're online as well, and um, I'd be delighted to bring them into the room with me. Um, great, Helen, um, and Chris, and Aidan. So we have about an hour and 10 minutes, I think, to be with you. Um, we have lots to cover in the period. Um, and um, what I was going to do was actually ask each of my fellow panelists to introduce themselves, um, and then I'll, I'll, I'll go forward. Uh, but to actually make it more difficult or to make it um, slightly more intriguing or difficult for them, I'm going to ask each of them to introduce themselves, but also come up with a bit of provocation um, about where they think this is a really tricky thing. Um, uh, there's lots of areas in this that we all get irked by or frustrated by on a regular basis. So to make this real and to actually share very important things with you, um, Helen, would you mind starting? Briefly introduce yourself and what you do, uh, but then also could you actually introduce your provocation as well? Yeah, sure. Uh, so I'm Helen Hoff. I work for Bride and Wood and I'm Head of Sustainability there. So for those of you who don't know, Bride and Wood uh, are designers, uh, mostly made up of architects and engineers. So on a day-to-day -day basis, um, I work with both the architectural and engineering teams working towards net zero carbon buildings. So that's looking at the whole life cycle of the building. Um, so the operational energy, trying to reduce that, uh, and also the embodied carbon as well. Uh, but we also try and balance that with occupant comfort and well-being. Um, so my background is in both engineering and architecture, which is quite interesting and it gives me quite an interesting job and viewpoint now, I guess. Um, so provocation, um, what I've been thinking quite a lot about recently is how we can reuse buildings. So that is obviously critical to achieving net zero carbon. Um, but quite often we find that buildings are demolished. Now that's either because they're at the end of their life and that's possibly quite a justified thing to do. Or actually, we're not finding out enough about that existing building um, through poor fact finding mostly, but also because information isn't available. Um, so what can we do now to make sure that doesn't happen in the future to the buildings that we're building today? And I think it's all down to sort of digital, um, digital design and collating information. Um, we need to make sure that we're designing buildings that can be adapted easily simplistically um, to suit either changing usage, changing work patterns, different climates, that kind of thing. Um, and that comes down to making sure the information is really easily readable for future teams. Um, but also we need to build in that adaptability and flexibility, but without over-designing. 
So we need to be really clear about the design conditions that we're using, the material choices, things like material passports. Um, but anything we can do to extend the life of the building, that's a really good thing. But how do we make sure that we're not using additional materials now that may never become beneficial in the future? It's a question that I don't think it's got a very, very clear answer. Thanks, Helen. I totally agree. Um, I, I, and I think um, it could bring in the whole aspect of sort of circularity and how we sort of um, uh, minimise use of virgin resources from mining and everything else. And we look at the volumes of concrete that have been produced um, um, and we use every day. And actually, you then look around the whole world and you sort of say, well, China has now industrialised and have sort of raised our carbon emissions hugely on the planet. If India and Africa and South America industrialise in the same way on the same Western trajectory, then basically it's game over on climate change. So I think it's a really neat microcosm of sort of the overall problem of where we're at. Um, Chris, you're next up. So if you could do the same, give a quick introduction to yourself and actually why you're here in a way and, um, and then give us your provocation. Thanks, Tim. Hi everyone, uh, my name is Chris Mortensen. I'm uh, one of the co-founders of Modulus and uh, Chief Product Officer. Um, for, for those that, that don't know Modulus, we're a construction technology company. We were founded about four years ago. Um, and our, our vision is really to empower society to, to help solve the housing crisis while protecting the planet for future generations. And, and we, we do that through a combination of technologies, both physical and digital. So we've got a, a digital software that marries along with a, a physical uh, offsite product that helps us move towards that, that sustainable, healthy, um, affordable housing product globally. Now, um, w when we were thinking about provocations, re really it comes to back to like our ability to hit that 1.5 or maybe not hit that 1.5 that, that we all agreed um, was was that upper limit uh, at Paris Agreement back in 20, 2015. And and back in 2015, the, the five-year look ahead was there was a 0% chance of, of that happening in the next five years. And then fast forward to 2020, and that became a 20% chance. And then just this, this year, the Met um, said there's a 50-50 chance now that we're going to breach 1.5 in the in the next in the next five years, and when we look at the ambitions that we have as an industry and as a government, 2050 for setting our our ambitions to getting to net zero is just too far down the line. We're just we're just kicking it further and further down the line for next next generations to fix the climate mess that that we've created. And so when we think about how can we actually deal with this for for us, the elephant in the room is supply chain. As designers, as consultants, it's it's we, we can get to net zero operations, we can get to carbon neutrality, um, but 95% of those carbon emissions in the construction industry are through supply chain. And, and how are we ever going to get to net zero without getting the supply chain to, to embrace that uh, scope three emissions reduction? So f for us, um, that that's a huge, huge part of the net zero story. Brilliant, Chris, and I agree absolutely. And there's actually bits of that I want to touch on. Um, and I think housing is one of the really big things I was in a meeting this morning with a, an MP, uh, a Labour MP, because the other ones aren't around very much at the moment. Um, and we were talking about the big things that were hitting um, the future. And we were saying, what, what are the main ways that we, the built environment, could support um, uh, politicians? And she was saying the two critical things are housing affordability, which actually is about volume of housing, um, and cost of living crisis are the two huge big issues that she is seeing in her post back at the moment. So um, there's a short term, there's a long term, there's a big current societal issue. It is all about um, what we do. I also might um, broaden your point, Chris, later on uh, to talk about the infrastructure around housing. Like it's all very well building a, a very well insulated box in a particular place, but actually we need to make sure that the people in those well insulated boxes can um, live in a very low carbon way. And too often we actually shove them at the end of towns where people have to actually be very car dependent and things like that. So I think we, we, we the, the, that's what we do in our built environment is also actually how we enable people to um, live better, li better low carbon lives and how we make that appealing. Aidan, um, you um, please introduce yourself and give your provocation. Um, I'm really interested to find again the overlaps between where we're all coming from. Hi, yeah, thanks for that. Um, my name's Aidan. I'm a co-founder of a company called EnviroBuild. Um, which is a company which is essentially looking to lower the embedded carbon of certain initially niche building products, but just building products in general. 
Um, historically, I have been, a, I guess, a serial entrepreneur. Um, the first company I set up was a specialist subcontractor and the installation of solar PV panels back in about 2009. Um, and prior to that, I had worked in academia. So I've got a PhD in um, nanomagnetics. Um, in terms of where, which I do not use at all in any way anymore. <laughs> uh, <laughs> in terms of my um, provocation or pro prevarication, which might be provoking, but it's not meant to. Um, like as a company, um, we sit sort of on the supply chain end of, I guess, the building, uh, building supply industry. Um, and we've been lucky enough to sell product into probably up to about 90% of the top residential builders in the UK as the main contractors. Um, now for a couple of years now, we've had sort of life cycle analyses and the EPDs available for our customers. Um, and I can say as an entire company, only once in that entire time have we been asked in advance of winning a contract for that data, which obviously says to me that they actually don't care. So for any of the marketing that exists around what people might be saying, if they were using it as a basis to make choices, they, they by definition must have asked for it in advance. Um, so as a company, we, we have to rely on sales and the standard routes on sort of quality, on service, on price. Um, and that is what we see to a prevailing culture within the construction industry, uh, particularly cost. Um, so my one is how can we actually hope to achieve more, the more difficult cuts in carbon emissions? Because the ones we're making at the moment are the easy ones. Um, and as has previously been said, primarily within scope three, how can we do it without legislation? And if so, how? Thanks, Aidan. And um, I think there's an awful lot to get there. I think there's actually a very neat thread that runs through all three of your presentations so far. Um, just to introduce myself then, um, uh, I thought I'd go last, even though I was the first one to speak. Uh, my name's Tim Chapman. I'm a director in Arab. Um, I've been in Arab for only three and a half decades, um, so I'm quite new in Arab terms. Um, uh, I, um, I, I was originally a geotechnical engineer, therefore dealing with risk. I then moved into dealing with big infrastructure and then decarbonisation of big infrastructure. And more lately, I've actually pivoted my career working via the Construction Innovation Hub Value Toolkit um, to uh, be about getting, making sure we set up projects to succeed at the very beginning. Um, uh, and in my world, to go into my provocation, the thing that really irritates me, which touches actually on what some of you have said, is uh, net zero as a term being used really badly. Um, there's various aspects of how the term net zero is used badly. Uh, the, 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 the two that probably get my goat the most. Um, the first one is net zero is meaningful on a planetary level. We need to reduce the overall flux of greenhouse gases to zero um, instead of the roughly 50,000 million tonnes that sort of emanate from the earth upwards and don't come back down again. Um, um, and that's roughly translates into um, national boundaries. We have sort of territorial emissions and consumption based emissions. Um, and the UK is beginning to go in slightly different directions in both of those. We're reducing our um, territorial emissions well, but not our consumption based emissions. We're importing more stuff than we uh, should do. And this goes back down to building materials as well. But especially um, what a, a bit that really irks me then is the fact that we then try and make net, every project net zero. And the fundamental flaw in that is if I tell you to reduce your expenditure um, from X thousand pounds a year to half of that, uh, you don't reduce your expenditure on champagne and tin sardines equally. You probably actually buy more tin sardines um, and less champagne if you're rational in how you do this. And my worry is that sort of on net zero, trying to make everybody reduce by the same proportion, we're actually missing an awful lot of tricks. It's absolutely right that if you build a new bank, it should be net zero. Your imposition on the rest of society is such that it should be. And actually offsets, and again, we may touch on offsetting later on, um, is a way to do that. Um, but if you're actually building a hospital um, or if you're building a new transport system or even a new nuclear power station, it's bonkers to expect Hinkley Point C to be net zero in itself. It facilitates switching off all the coal and gas-fired power stations, and therefore it's a really good thing, but it won't be net zero in its own, within its own red line. Um, and therefore, uh, how do we create the infrastructure systems? How do we invest to save? How do we um, do the things that we should be doing rationally with our carbon to make sure we produce a low carbon future? And don't, because actually the sum of making everything net zero is a very, very slow reduction. And we need big systems change uh, to do this. So I think it fits in actually with the conversation we've had so far. Um, uh, but, but again, um, it's a general appeal to all of our listeners uh, please do um, put questions in the chat bar. Uh, we really look forward to seeing them. Um, and I'm going to 
mine those later on for future topics for us to be discussing. Um, Chris, there's quite an overlap actually between yours and Aidan's talk, and you're basically talking about the same problem from slightly different perspectives. Um, I'm just wondering, do you want to actually come back on that and maybe even uh, reflect back on all four of our provocations? And do you have anything that's sort of how they come together in your mind? Yes, I mean, ultimately, the idea of, of the scope three and supply chain, and I like Aiden's question, how do we do it without without regulation? I don't think we can. Um, I think we're starting to see Part Z start to push us towards having having some kind of modeling that's required. I had this discussion uh, at a previous panel with with um, uh, Brittany from from her um, her partner presented earlier today about who's ultimately responsible for making these decisions? Is it the end user, is it the developer, is it the economic buyer, is it the designer? It's kind of all of us, but but regulation probably has to drive it because we're, we're, we're not good at making the good decisions. Um, it, we, we kind of drive towards these economic gains rather than the, than the things that, that, that matter if we're looking at net zero. And so, I mean, my simple answer is, I, I think it needs to be regulatory driven. We're not seeing a huge, driver from the supply chain. We had a session with with a, a, a potential supply chain partner that, that we won't we won't name obviously. And they were really chuffed that over the last five years they, they had a two percent um, decrease in, in their carbon emissions. And we went, two percent <laughs> whoa you got to get to zero <laughs> right like and and for them that was monumental. So so there's a lot there's a lot of education that needs to happen. There's a lot of aid that needs to happen to get to get companies on board and and you know 2030 I, that's where that's where we're hanging our hat but but we're going to fail unless our supply chain gets there and so we're working both upstream and downstream with the developers with local councils but also with their supply chains to try to to, to get them there and and Tim to your point um, it's difficult to try to do this on a singular level it's it's like again this is another conversation that that we've we've had a lot over over the course of the last years, but it's 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 too it's too difficult to look at each thing as an individual entity, as an island that has to have everything onto its own. And as you zoom out, there's more opportunity there. And so if you zoom out at a at a um, master plan level or town planning level or a city level, like you have more opportunity for for the net zero projects or um, um, uh, energy production product projects to help. Uh, to help balance off the others that add whether social values you might have for the project. So I, I think all four of the, the provo provocation, I slip that word all the time, um, they, they are they all all very, um, they all touch each other, don't they? They do, Chris. I'm going to actually come to Aidan and Helen and I, I, whichever one of you indicate first, I'll, 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 uh, I'll come and pick on you. But actually, to some extent, I think we had Paul Morell um, earlier on in a slightly husky but very well colourful uh, presentation talking about the introduction of BIM. Um, and BIM was interesting because that wasn't actually a, um, it wasn't mandated as in regulation, but government as a client said that we want this to be done on all of our projects. Um, and therefore, the industry had to become BIM ready. And I think that's both, there's some interesting good and interesting bad lessons in that. I think the good lesson is that they did make the, better part of the industry that wants to work for government wake up and realize they had to suddenly equip themselves. The bad side is I think the rest of the industry didn't bother um, and also most clients didn't actually really want it in the end either so didn't know what to ask for and couldn't tell the projects to be BIM ready. And um, the other interesting one I think is actually the Heathrow um, uh, February 2020 third runway being um, overturned in the courts and for my infrastructure world that had a huge effect a lot of clients, I think, probably paid lip service, a big infrastructure client paid lip service. They said the carbon was important, but actually when push came to shove, money was an awful lot more. After that, I think carbon became a currency that was almost equivalent to money, um, and the logic of it became very strong. I was going to touch on two standards, actually, um, as we're here from BSI. Um, past 2080, um, I was involved with both conceiving and writing, and I think it's both been, it's been a monumental improvement of what we do in the infrastructure industry because it actually sets up this concept of invest to save. And it sort of gets away from the scope, scope three sort of bit of being loosely defined. And in a way, people trying to dump ownership of their own bit of it, um, because it looks at the asset base only in terms of capital carbon, um, uh, uh, um, uh, 
Oh, she had mental block. Um, uh, the uh, user, the, the carbon in running it, and then the carbon the, uh, by users. Um, and I think it, the whole concept of using, sorry, OPEX was the term I'm looking for, um, and OPCARB um, is, the, is the phrase. So you've got capital carbon, um, um, OPCARB, and use carb. Um, and you can actually invest to save on those three. We also have Flex 390, uh, BSI Flex 390, which again I've been involved with, which is the uh, standard that's just been produced that mimics the construction innovation of value toolkit about trying to buy for broader value. But we won't go into that now, but I just want to actually flag those two standards as BSI are our host today. Um, Helen or Aidan, do you want to come in and probably respond to what Chris has said or add anything else to our discussion? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, okay. Um, so in relation to regulation, um, I was at a talk yesterday about Naples. That's all to do with operational energy in, well, specifically office buildings, um, but it can also apply to other buildings in Australia. Uh, there's now the UK version that's been launched in the last year. Um, and it was, there was a conversation there about should neighbours or something similar become regulation um, so that we are regulated, unregulated energy users. And I think the thought in the room was, it would be better to have no regulation than to have a bad a bad or very undefined regulation. Um, so I think the idea of like, if you're gonna regulate it, you need to do it properly is quite interesting. But also there's nothing to say that the industry can't be pushing that forward um, and all, almost leading the government and saying, this is what you need to do, which has come out of part Z. Um, but there's a lot more that we could be doing as an industry, both from the design side, construction, supply chain, um, and the more that we show that it's doable and that we want to do it, the more the government are going to help in that regulatory process. Um, but the other thing I was going to say was that Neighbours in Australia came out of the government um, leasing office buildings, being one of the largest leasing people in Australian cities. And they said, well, we want a Neighbours rating. So it wasn't regulated as in there's equivalent building regs, but it was um, just the office leasing market that really pushed that through and now it's really really commonplace in Australia and um, hopefully that will happen in the UK as well um, but the similar idea could um, be brought across into the body carbon market too. Thanks Helen. Um, Aidan your thoughts? I mean I guess starting with your thoughts in terms of should all the industry reduce at the same time I mean, I guess it's obviously not like you don't want to look at the embedded carbon necessarily of a solar PV panel at the same time as you're looking at a coal fire power station for the exact reasons that you specified. How how that is divided up, I guess, sits within every territorial plan, like when it gets to the UN and they're saying this is the amount we're going to give up and agreeing entirely on your point that it's done probably on the wrong thing rather than on consumption. It's done on how much like. I think that's definitely wrong, but I don't sit in the seat of power to have any particular influence on that. And I think the West has got, I mean, it's obviously in the West's favor to not count it that way. So the biggest polluters aren't going to necessarily put their hand up immediately. And we've seen that when it's even just looking at the amount of money they say they're going to give and then they don't give. So staying out of the international politics side of it, um, yes, within the UK space, it would obviously um, be sensible within our plan to have it broken down by sector and then within sector by most no noticeable part. But here is where my ignorance is, is like, I'm not actually sure if that's what we're currently doing. Like, and that's a genuine thing. Like I assume we've looked at it on a sector basis and said, farmer has to do, farming has to do this, construction has to do that. I don't know at a level above where I sort of tend to read around if the, uh, we are looking at, um, yeah, the impacts of Heathrow compared to whether we actually even still need it with the reducing like travel. And if anyone's got the guts to say, actually, we don't need this anymore. Um, after having given permission and just suck it up. Um, in terms of reusability of building materials and how that is identified, um, oh, it would be great. Like I've I've been involved in, one of the things we've been involved in a lot as a company is the selling of materials onto balconies. So we sold a lot of materials onto balconies, which obviously after the um, disaster tragedy at Grenfell, all had to literally be ripped up and re remade. Like that, so but everything that we had, everything that we had sold, um, we'd sell. We could sometimes sell back onto the same job, but you knew it was just getting skipped. So you knew it was stuff that had 60 years worth of life on it, um, realistically, and nothing. It'd been used for a year, 
but you knew the economics of it didn't work um, for anyone to really recollect and have sort of essentially secondhand cut to different lengths. How can this, how can you find a job for this? No one's going to accept it as new. Um, you see a few industries where they're trying to make it work, sort of like in, in some stuff in vinyl it worked. I know in gypsum they worked very, very hard with government legislation to force it to be recycled in certain ways. But the economics of small amounts being reused, I mean, where do you store it? Do you have these huge warehouses mm. that wait for the next job to come along three, five, seven years away? Like, I would love there to be a truly circular economy. I have the answers are really, really complicated. And without huge storage of materials, I, like, it needs to be talked at at an industry level because there needs to be an industry understanding that if something is to be reused and is to have a value, then it actually helps everyone. It's the only way society and an industry can get there. But it is the top 50 main contractors sitting down together through the various associations they have and getting it done because yeah. nobody else really, like they have a reasonable length of power and they're reasonably concentrated. There's not actually that many of them if you want to get to 80% of the construction industry. You could probably do it in 40 or 50 of them um, for big builds. So yeah, like Helen, I'd love that to be true. Um, but, but, <laughs> but again, don't know how, and in terms of, uh, how Dan and I have talked about the same thing from scope three. It's like, yeah, 95% of the construction is scope three. I had the flyers around from, not the emails around from Travis Perkins being like, you've really got to get your scope one and scope two sorted within the next year and a half. And you're like, okay, we've got five years to make all these changes. And within a year and a half, we have to have accounted, not even changed, but accounted for the first 5% of our emissions. And you're like, okay, we're nowhere. Like we are so <laughs> far from being anywhere as for it to actually be farcical. Um, and if you were to go through the supply chain and see how many have accurately mapped out their scope three and done their LCAs and done their EPDs, let alone have it done by somebody who understands what they're actually doing as opposed to putting it out, and let alone having the information used by the top, top the genuine CXOs to look at that information and recognize it's something they should be doing and adds value. Like you can tell that I'm in a quite negative mood at the moment. I'm not quite sure why. I think I was more positive <laughs> yesterday. But obviously, um, scope three accounting needs to be done more seriously. The timelines are not fast enough and it needs to have teeth, like without legislation putting a value on everything we're trying to do, there will always be a company outside it not doing it. And there are a few main contractors who are going like really trying, you can tell, and clients, there are a few clients and main contractors who are really trying, but because the majority simply are not, it gets dragged down to that level for the majority of jobs. I, I would say on a more positive note, yes. there are some clients that are really, really trying. So you, you've got clients that might own and manage like millions of meters squared of offices, and they know that there's a turnover of things like floor tiles and um, raised flooring. And because they are owning that estate and they also operate it, they're able to store um, things like the raised floor at the end of the tenancy when the next one comes along, they're able to reuse it. So I think there are examples of where that circular economy is coming. But I totally appreciate that that is such a small proportion, but they're the people that we can learn from. Could I, I, I ask two link questions? Sorry, I'm going to ask two link questions and just go around all of you with them. I mean, to some extent, the last 50 to 100 years has been an aberration in humankind where we actually, everything had to become new. Um, uh, before sort of 1950s, we were very happy to repair things, both actually in terms of building fabric um, and even in terms of all the things that we buy ourselves. After that, we got into sort of consumerism and we stopped, it became really bad to buy, to, to mend things. Clothes been a really good example, um, where now we, it's fast fashion, we buy new clothes, something gets a small rip, something gets what needs a patch, we never patch it, no one knows how to sew, um, it's cheaper just to go and buy something new. Um, same in buildings, um, uh, there is this sort of thing of, uh, we, we rip out every item and replace it rather than repair it because it's too difficult. Before, we didn't, because actually the economics meant that new things were too expensive, and especially even with resource scarcity after World War II, um, uh, there, was, there was very much a make, do and mend. Likewise, actually, how we use our cities. Um, cities have been around for 2,000 years plus. Um, we have, um, we coexisted with very nice, cute buildings that we, that we now view as classical and beautiful, and we list them. Uh, but then in the sort of early part of the 20th century onwards, we then start ripping all these down and putting in car parks and putting in large lumps of um, sterile, anonymous um, concrete blocks, 
all of which are were, were built for a single use, got demolished after 30 years, went back in, put another big building on the site, got away from the whole thing of designing to last. I mean, we now design them in code to code uh, for a 50 year life rather than a 100 year life. You look at the Victorian hospitals that still actually have some good in them um, 150 years later. I'm just wondering, um, the economics now shifted too far to, uh, if, towards the new um, and shiny and oh, reusing old is actually much more expensive. It needs higher skilled people. It needs much more um, both to do the design and to do the, sort of the craft work that's required to make them live longer. But actually, potentially, we're doing something a, a, a favour to society by trying to do it. In, I'm, I'm just wondering, um, how could we change the economics to make circular economy far more positive? And then, given the fact this conference is meant to have a digital theme to it, I'm just wondering about digital passporting and things like that that might be a way of actually trying to facilitate this. Um, Chris, are you? I interrupted. So I'm going to let you go first. Um, it's probably the difficult one. Uh, then I'll go around Aidan and Helen. Uh, so your reflections on those provocations. Yeah, well, I, I, the idea that we, a lot of us are building into the to the new designs and and what we're creating digital twins and material passports so we can have treat buildings as material banks. But to your point, if we build a new building now and it it sees out its lifespan, that's fifty, sixty, hundred years before those come back in, right? And and we have a problem now, um, and and it's the carbon we're spending now that's 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 you know that's the issue we're going to fall off the cliff very soon so all all the things that we're doing now is is helping for the future so we're we're laying that groundwork really what what something that we've been talking a lot about is trying to figure out um, some sort of platform for those reused materials and certification process our biggest problem right now is is for our our, our physical product we're uh, a hot rolled steel frame solution we're multi-family multi-story with you know, post Grenfell, we can't go with mass timber. It's just, it's just not, it's not a, a code compliant construction methodology. And so then how do we, how do we look at steel, which is, you know, a, a virgin steel as it's, it's a high carbon content material. So we can start looking at some of the zero, the, the, the um, hydrogen um, fueled uh, steels that are coming out, but that's still, you know, mined ore. Um, and then, there was actually a really great talk. Um, I was down at the Footprint uh, Festival down or Footprint Conference down in Brighton a few weeks ago, and the folks from Elliot Wood did a great presentation on um, some of the work they're doing with uh, uh, Great Portland Estate and and having a donor building and utilizing the the materials within that for a new building, right? And that's that's beautiful if you're working on on an estate level where you know within your portfolio you've got you've you can you have your almost your own database but actually it's looking one level up and having a database of maybe donor buildings that are coming online to marketplace rather than materials because i don't think we're nuanced yet enough as an industry to go okay we have this much steel that's been certified that's now open into the market it's probably one or two levels up at a level of developer or estate owner that knows that buildings are coming to end of life having a monetary value affixed to the materials within that, and then having a platform that allows people to to buy on an open marketplace. So we're not having to go back and 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 buy virgin materials that that come with an economic and and uh, societal cost. So uh, uh, <laughs> I'm a bit like Aiden today. I'm feel, I'm feeling the, the 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 kind of weight <laughs> of it because it's it's such a massive like you pull at a string and it just you know it, it goes in every direction. And so the idea of circularity is amazing, but we have to, we, it's not something that we can prepare for for 100 years from now. We, we actually have to figure out how we can inject circularity in, in the kind of dumb non-digital assets we have today. And, and that's, you know, maybe that is at, at, um, at a state level. Thanks, Chris. Aidan, challenge for you is to um, re reply like Chris did, but in a more uplifting way. Positive reply. Um, what you laid out in the original question, Tim, is exactly right. We've become too efficient at manufacturing things, and we've made it at a level where to be to repair things, you need to be so highly skilled that your day rate is much higher than the machine worker who's involved in the initial manufacture, and all of like, and their efficiency is so much lower. So uh, the crux of the problem started with Adam Smith, right? Um, <laughs> where do we? I mean, how do we go back on? 450 years of specialization in, a, in five years or 10 years. Um, 
it's I unfortunately do often fall back on the um, the only way to economically price it in is through is through legislation. Um, whether that like whether it be carrot or whether it be stick. Um, but I think the cost of this is going to be like the cost of it, it can be done. It just needs to be costed. It just needs to be that if you're using something secondhand, you get a, you get a tax break of some description or you get a, uh, something happens enabling it to happen or it's a taxation on new materials being bought. So actually for virgin materials, particularly virgin materials that you identify out early as more polluting, there is an, there is this um carbon tax type proposition placed upon them that's the only way i can think of doing it which potentially shows the limit of my imagination um <laughs> because i would love for everyone to work together and for all the companies to come together and figure something out but i i don't know i've wanted that for 20 years i'm probably the only person here who's old enough to remember milk bottles um but that worked fairly well um uh, where you pay the deposit the um, yeah okay <laughs> Um, but, but 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 actually, to some extent, the simple solutions may be the ones that actually are there, where you you pay a decent deposit. Helen, I'm going to come to you in a second. I just wanted to actually check with Dan, uh, who's hopefully still online and doing things. Dan, I'm, look, I'm checking the chat bar. I think we've had no questions in yet from the audience. Um, first of all, if I'm right on that, the audience are encouraged to ask some. Uh, but Dan, we just make sure it's not it's not user error rather than uh, audience error uh, in this. Um, so, Tim, I'm always listening, and uh, I'm listening with great interest. And it's it, so I think what's happened is people have probably been stunned into silence and in listening to the, the <laughs> very interesting conversation. Um, but you know, as you've invited me in, I will ask a question. Um, it does go back near the start. So I think there was a really interesting point. I think Helen, that you made around ensuring that buildings are adaptable. Um, and an analogy that I've always enjoyed is um, the conversation of what I used to call, um, I stole this from 99% Invisible, um, which was the, whether buildings should be sheds or duck hatcheries. Um, and by that, what I mean is, do you just design something as a blank box that you then customize within it to suit your purpose, or do you make a building fit for a specific purpose um, and obviously the way that if you have a duck hatchery building it can't be you know a telecoms office um, so I guess in this situation here and if I'm going to try and hold the side of architecture and architectural technology I like the idea of buildings being fit for purpose but where do you strike the balance between adaptable being soulless for want of a better phrase and some of these uh, the concepts we're talking about now because I totally get the idea that in um, let's say 20 years what IT infrastructure we place into a building will be totally different and actually we've gone from cables to having <coughs> pardon me, to having hubs to which could be something else and actually you know are we going to put 5G antennas somewhere or do what you know there's there's all sorts of things that could change where and we'll have to pull out all of the the coaxial cables we put in everything and all the ethernets because no one's going to use them anymore. So there needs to be a level of adaptability, but where, is, where, where on that spectrum is the right place if you're also trying to bear in mind this idea of, of circular economy elements? And what do you do with 12 miles of ethernet cable that no one's now going to be using? Uh, and then with that, I will I will pop off the screen to allow you to discuss that. Um, but <laughs> we, audience members, you know, Tim is asking for questions, and I'm sure yours are just as awkward as mine. So please throw them through. Thank you. Yeah, Helen, keep on doing. But uh, don't, rest assured, I got many, many more questions to keep us going for the uh, 40 minutes. So, uh, uh, um, but it's good to get a few more coming in. So, Helen, over to you to ask to answer Dan's uh, uh, difficult provocation back. I think it's really hard. Um, how how can you decide what needs to be adapted in the future if you don't know what the future holds? So we take COVID as a really, really good example. Suddenly, overnight, every office block was empty. And then now people are going back to the office. Some of that office space needs to be used again, but not all of it. Um, and actually, how adaptable are office buildings to change what they're going to be residential, retail, um, sport and leisure, whatever it might be. Um, but I think there are some adaptations that we know we're going to need. So if you just look at the change in climate, we know that um, the UK is going to get hotter. Um, so being able to adapt your facade really easily, um, 
will only be a good thing. So whether that is to allow additional solar shading to be put on, um, to change um, window panels and replace with wall panels, um, to allow rooms to be moved around to suit um, orientation. So where we might have south facing um, meeting room, for example, at the moment, as the climate changes, our cooling modes are going to go through the roof. So how easy is it to change that onto an east facade and remove a solid wall panel, put a window in so that we get some daylight. And it's those kind of things that we can think actually in the future, if we have an adapting climate and an adapting usage, how easy would it be to marry those two, two things together? Um, I think there's other examples where we know that MEP services last for 20, 25 years compared to a building that's going to be lasting for 50 plus years. Um, so when we're installing, making sure that we allow for easy replacement of services, and that's not necessarily light for light services. Um, we've seen a massive shift from gas boilers to electric heat pumps over the last few years. Um, and what's to say that in 20 years time, the heat pumps are now are going to be replaced light for light. So how easy is it to enable space planning so that all those services can be replaced but adapted at the same time. Um, so I think there's an element of what we can do easily um, through simple design choices, things like um, componentized facades, um, additional space on the roof or ground floor level for plant, um, allowing holes through beams for additional services in the future. You know, there's a lot of stuff like that. Um, but then there's that element of you don't want to over design because that just uses more materials. So if you're designing your loadings for a certain use, do you then allow for additional loadings just in case a room is going to be using an electric theatre instead of an office? Um, and that's really hard because it might never be used. So is it worth it? And the answer is probably no. But how do you make that decision? How do you, where do you draw the line? And I don't think there's any really clear decision making process, but you've just got to be sensible and look at what the additional materials are versus the potential benefit. Um, yeah. It might be that allowing a more digital design where you know a bit more about the building, you know how the structure works. If you wanted to make some of those choices and upgrade the structure at a later date, if you have more information about what is currently there, you might be able to do those enhancements more simplistically in the future. I'm working with some of your colleagues on the new hospital program and Paul okay. Morell this morning spoke about um, the fact that serial clients have got a uh, almost an obligation to change the industry more than anybody else because the whole of the industry has been characterized by too much one-off clienting. Um, you buy a hospital, you then employ a different design team to build a different hospital and we actually don't um, progress but if we could sort of change the um, how we do hospitals, how we do iPhones and we have sort of a generation one, generation two, generation three, um, and the first generation is done as well as we can do. We spend a lot of time working out, to, to give you an example of what we're talking about this week, was actually almost the front doors to a hospital. Um, are they pivoted? Are they, um, uh, whether they're sort of circular one or whatever else, actually it should be one answer for that in the UK, whether you're in Bournemouth or Blackburn or Blackpool or wherever else, because um, you're trying to marry a series of constraints. You don't want all the hot air to go out or cold air to go out of the hospital um, uh, when you open the door. Equally, you want it to be very easy for um, uh, people who are less able to get in and out and make sure it's very accessible. And those two things are in direct conflict. But at the moment, we have sort of 48 hospital teams designing that particular answer 48 times and come up with 48 different answers. Um, and therefore, we never standardize, we never improve. But especially, um, we can't improve sequentially because if we at least put the same one into all of the hospitals, we would discover there's a better answer and we could progressively improve it. And actually, bringing digital sensors in, we could actually have lots of sensors in the hospital to work out where are the, which bits are more used, which bits aren't used. And then pick up Helen's point, were we to make one area much more heavily laden or capable of taking much heavier loads as an example, we don't know what, print, what treatments are going to happen in 20 years time or 50 years time or 100 years time. We don't, we don't know what the patient flows are going to be. 
but at least we've got lots of sensors in, we can actually then progressively learn and work out that corridor was far too wide, that corridor was far too narrow, the lighting in this area is too bright. It was actually cost effective to put in circadian lighting to actually improve everybody's moods and improve, help both staff be more efficient and patients to recover better. Um, and um, giving us that sort of database um, uh, area to actually improve things. And you might conceive of uh, one thing we're playing with the moment is do, do we move towards the 100 year hospital, which is ultimately flexible because actually pre hospital treatments will change over a 50 year life. So why not build a hospital that's actually capable of having a 100 year life? And when you do that, pick up Helen's point, the M&E needs to be replaced maybe twice in that period. So maybe you put in enough redundancy in the M&E to make sure that the hospital can survive while you replace the M&E kit. You don't have to actually close the hospital down when you're doing these things. So these sort of thinkings, I think, are really interesting. I'm just going to actually go around each of you and then we get with that as a sort of fresh provocation um, into the mix. Um, Aidan, coming to you first, what, what are your thoughts about how that might change the environment for your products and your thoughts? Yeah, I mean, standardizing buildings feels like something that was uh, rolled out quite widely across the Eastern Bloc of Europe through the communist era. And that I presume that they learned quite a lot as they built their massive concrete shacks and they look different. I think on one-off buildings, I think like if you've got 48 different hospitals around the country, I don't think anyone would mind that. I think if you start to get to residential blocks in central London, people distinctly mind that. So I think where you have described on a hospital or probably like a secondary school or primary schools, actually that's incredibly sensible, particularly when this is funded from the private purse that is not even competing, there's not even competing interest to try and sell it. So yes, I mean, tick that down to a very good idea that sounds like it should work. Um, and then just adapt to the, the slight difference in locations, be that the footprint or whatever. And as you say, the learning on the type of door, the learning on the type of window, everything around that sounds very, very sensible. I think as you get more private sector and you've got landlords competing for office space or landlords competing to sell their flats, then I think that learning actually becomes part of almost the IP of a company. Um, insofar as if they have a mechanism that makes their building more habitable, um, look nicer, more efficient, they're probably they're probably not that willing to share it. Um, so open knowledge transfer programs, I mean, it happens anyway because people move between the companies and they go, we did this here, we did that there. So actually over time, it, it always comes to everyone. So maybe as an industry to just say, this is the environmental best practice um, and have that as an open forum chaired by whichever august society be it reba be it one of the engineering ones which everyone thinks is the most august and they can sit there and have it and run it and that sounds super sensible to be honest tim like it sounds good ideas from you and helen just checking actually chris moving on to you um aiden raised an interesting point it's almost as a thing of innovation and innovators getting a um, payback for what they're doing versus ip and keeping things um uh uh, making sure that sort of uh, we keep things, the, the whole industry can benefit. Do you think there's a sweet spot on that or something we can learn from somewhere else in that field? I mean, I think as an industry, we're, we're, we're all too protective about information that isn't, they're not exactly trade secrets, are they? How to design a flat, right? <laughs> but a, a one bed flat or a two bed flat, most developers now are going to national space standards. So if, you know, if the design is slightly this way or that, I don't, you know, I don't think there's, there's that much in it. And, and I mean, to, to Aiden's point around big communist blocks, like that's, that's, I think standardization's got a bit, a bit of a, a kind of like prefab as, as well, right? It's it's a bit of a, 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 a dirty a dirty word. And for me, standardization is absolutely the way, like around sustainability, around efficiencies, around um, driving towards truly affordable housing, um, around reuse. If we have standardization utilizing um, uh, material sizes and we start to, to look at waste reductions, there, there's, there's a whole lot in, in standardization. And it doesn't necessarily mean you pick from a building and say, right, I'll have that. I'll have three of those buildings and one of those. You know, it, the standardization could be at, at apartment level or or, or block. Um, I'm starting to use in, modulus language. To, you know, you know, compartmental level, and you could still dress buildings in from a standard palette of facade treatments. And so every building could still look unique. It's just built from standard components that are that are well 
thought through that the efficiencies are built in and, and it's digitized. So at end of life, we could demount and reuse those things. Now, I, I'm, I'm just thinking back to one of the things you said earlier, Tim, and it, and it flows into the standardization. It was around how do we move from buying new to, to make do and mend? And, and I think one of the things that we saw a few years ago, Philips had, had introduced this idea of light as a service as opposed to selling fixtures. And I think the more creative we get with things, so if you can imagine uh, Mitsubishi or, or one of the HVAC providers moves to cooling as a service, right? So then they're incentivized to one, provide cooling nonstop or heating nonstop, but also they own that, that equipment, right? And it changes the, econ it changes the economic drivers in, in um, reliability and, and the ability to fix and repair things. And that, and that same, methodology can be translated across lots of things. We were talking with with um, a supply chain partner who who has a material. And when you put it together with, with a couple other things, it's a new product. And they went, oh, we could actually do that whole thing and then provide that as a service. And in the city, every three years, commercial tenants, they just tear down and then they, they rebuild because they do, right? They want to refresh stuff. But rather than tear down everything, we can take that, rehab it, and then put it back into circulation. And so we're already starting to see this idea as things as a service, as opposed to just selling it as, you know, uh, 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 buying that product. So, you know, I think standardization at a, a, at a material level, all the way up to kind of block level, building block level is the way forward, and then digitizing that whole process, and then moving from a from a purchase to a service in certain sectors is is, for my money, like, that's starting to get us towards towards a better place. Thanks, Chris. I'm going to come to you, Helen, next, because Brighton would have done a huge amount on these sort of ideas and with a range of areas. Your role in particular is about actually the decarbonisation one. Um, so I'm sure you've been wrestling with lots of the knotty issues that lie behind some of these implications. And what are your best insights um, from a decarbonisation point of view of how well these work, but also where the um, big roadblocks are? Um, yeah, so we've done loads of standardisation work, um, residential, office, hospitals, all sorts of different buildings. And you start off having a really, really standardised solution. And then by the time you get to trying to put that across the whole building, you end up with so many bits that are non-standard. Um, and often it's the client that is driving it. So I'm not going to blame the client, I think. Um, but... The client has a view of how it should look um, and that results in non standardization on maybe a corner or just one end of the building. Then you've got to add on sort of the planning. So you can't build on that part of the site because you're going to overlook there or you've got rights of light issues or that kind of thing. So that then means that your nice square building becomes a bit of a weird shape. So you've got a non standard component there. So I think um, you need everyone to agree that you're going to have a standard approach. Or standardized approach everyone needs to build in and um, buy into it at the earliest stage and then you can follow it through a lot more clearly sensibly and get a better response at the end um i know chris mentioned about sort of demountable um things and people ripping parts of the building out every few years uh, particularly in the city um and i think one of the answers to that is to design in deconstruction from the start so if you're able to have bolted connections rather than welded, not only do you take the hot trade off site, but you and you allow um, lower skilled labor, which opens up a larger pool of labor as well. Um, but it also means at the end of that part of the building's life, whether it be an ME component or a whole steel frame, it can be demounted, deconstructed more easily. You've obviously then got your digital component that tells you exactly what that is it can be reused you, you then back to that circular economy aspect of where do you store it where do you use it um but you are able for your standardized approach to build all of that stuff in earlier um i think uh, yeah there's a lot lot of learning but for me it's you need to incorporate this right at the early stages of design if you try and do it later say you've got to stage four you've got a detailed design and then you want to apply a manufacturer's system it makes it really really difficult and um, the earlier you can do it the easier it becomes 
I agree totally. And um, I had uh, the good fortune and misfortune to be the client for our new headquarters in London um, and uh, working with 3,000 other designers, all of whom had strong opinions about what it should be. Uh, was an interesting experience. But actually, we got everyone together and I was very determined to make sure that we didn't have change during, um, uh, during execution because I think clients tinkering with things on the way through is one of the biggest enemies of actually what can go wrong. And therefore client discipline of saying, this is what I want very early and being clear that it is really, really what they want and facing the client through all the various parts of making sure they have brought all their key stakeholders with them. I think it's a large part of this. I think our industry has been too accommodating. Again, Paul Morell was talking this morning about the fact that if we were the automotive industry or basically compared to automotive, and every one of our buildings basically would go back to the garage within three months for a major overhaul um, if we were making cars. Whereas while we do blame cars, they have become hugely more productive and better from standardization. Um, and the same sort of thing happens in other industries. I mean, it used to be defense was even worse than construction for uh, cost overruns and program overruns. They're slowly getting their um, house in order. Um, and I think one of the things that I'm very impressed with the new hospital program is the leadership of that is trying to work out how we stop massively overspending on hospitals, how we move away from a world where every hospital is delivered sort of a twice the budget sort of several years late and can actually turn them into products where not only do we get rid of the wildly um, uh, bad um, overspends and program overruns, but we actually make sure that they work first time, work out of the tin. Um, and have a very disciplined set of designers bringing in disciplined sets of changes that are only to us making it better. And again, Helen, your colleagues are working out in each of the cohorts how much MMC we can actually bring in. But I mean, hopefully bringing in an optimum amount. So one of the controversies at the moment is actually how we get the next cohort uh, to be more disciplined uh, because they're all ready to go designed as eight different hospitals with eight different things. But we need to, as an example, bring in ground source heat pumps make sure there's no um, uh, fossil fuel combustion on any of those sites whatsoever, because once you do that, you're actually tied into 350 grams of CO2 per kilowatt hour forever, and not tied into um, the grid getting better and better, and heat pumps giving you two or 300% efficiency as, as well. Um, Aidan, in your multiple uh, careers before, I was hoping you were going to say you were actually going to do uh, heat pumps because um, solar panels in 2008 is almost the heat pumps of now. Um, and how do we stimulate the industries that we require to happen in a way in advance of government making it uh, mandatory? So we, we have various indicators from the CCC that heat pumps will be part of the future. Um, well, sorry, a huge part of the future. Um, and to some extent, I think might offset some of, sorry, we'll use the word offset, displace some of the um, hopes that hydrogen going into the grid will mean we can, we, 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 do, we have enough green hydrogen to replace all the methane, which I think is going to probably not happen in my lifetime. Um, and I do hope to live to be old. That's not a, 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 a health prediction. Um, how do we set up a whole new industry like heat pumps? I would love to know a good heat pumping store in my area to actually replace my boiler. Um, and I'm sure there's hundreds of thousands of people in the same place. But, but again, this is a nascent industry that it's going to be massively short of parts, suppliers, technology, know how to do it efficiently. What, what, any insights from the solar panel um, uh, um, revolution of 15 years ago? Yeah, well, I mean, firstly, I mean, the slight apologies to Chris in terms of I didn't mean standardization would make everything look like the old Eastern Bloc. That wasn't what I meant. So. <laughs> Apologies, I'm very much, I am very much in favour of standardisation. But on that point, yeah, solar PV. When I joined the industry, it was before Ed Miliband had brought in the feed-in tariffs. So we were selling, we were selling systems for fourteen thousand pounds to individual homeowners, and promising them returns of around two or two and a half percent on their investment. So it was, it was, it was certainly to the converted rather than those looking at it. I mean, the way the PV industry. T um, caught off globally was essentially driven by Germany introducing a feed-in tariff. So they essentially said to individual people um, through through central tax support, not central, through central payments, that if you do this, you will make a guaranteed return. It was literally, it was literally all carrot. Um, there was no stick in the early solar. And then lots of other countries looked at it, including the UK, and realized this is actually something that we could do to stimulate it. And as you say, like our grid has gone from when I first started out, I think it was 0.568 kilograms of CO2 per kilowatt hour. And now, as I, I don't know the number now, but it's probably down at about 0.26 or 0.27 or something. So it's it's, it's, about, well, it's about 0.18, I think, on average, or 180 oh, wow. grams of CO2 per kilowatt hour most of the time. 
So it's fallen 70% since I was doing it at the start, which is actually in and of itself incredible. Um, and one of the biggest wins that society has had in the last sort of 15 years. So, but actually, once the incentive was there, the industry trained itself up incredibly fast. I remember looking at Ernst & Young reports and McKinsey reports of how fast the, glo uh, the global solar industry would grow and every single one was wrong because it went much, much faster. Um, because the moment there is a profit motive there for people, they'll get it done. Um, and there was, we were training up, um, we were training up electricians, we were training up roofers um, at really high speed. And you would find a huge drive um, for training up the ne uh, necessary plumbers, the necessary heating engineers. Um, if you're looking at ground source for the necessary people to create the um, the deep, I've forgotten, the, I want to say bores. Yeah, the boring specialists. Oh. <laughs> um, the boring specialist to get the like down fast enough it would come really really fast there'd be a there would be an element of initial cowboy unfortunately um where everyone's trying to train up too fast and there's a few people slipping through the um qa like there would be but most of the, most of the time if these things are done badly it's not truly catastrophic and having a few things going wrong isn't the like the odd fl house flooding isn't the end of the world if you're getting 800 other ones done correctly and reducing the impact like it is a it is one of those things that happens with a, a nascent industry so if there is any form of incentive then an industry will train itself up very very fast that's my genuine view especially just at the on, moment as it, sorry so i was just going to say just on the incentive the new building legs are going to be a soft incentive to move away from gas boilers so naturally, it'll be a move towards heat pumps, but it's but not I, a direct incentive to install the heat pump. I think it's also where solar came through, as it was all retrofit. So what what interests me on the what interests me more on heat pumps is how we go about retrofitting all the existing houses we have, because if we just, even if we built everything new, brand new, net zero from now, we'd still miss our targets, right? Like we have to figure out the harder thing of going back to Victorian stock housing or 1930s housing or 1960s housing and making it firstly airtight. Like that's your first thing. And then once you've made it as airtight as you can without damp, but there's solutions available for that. Once you've done that, then how do we heat it more effectively? Like that is the, I mean, that's the crux of it. And at some point, someone will look at their spreadsheet and realize they have to do it. And at some point, an incentive will come and at some point, the industry will go up around it and it will do it really, really fast. And it'll do faster than the predictions have said it will. Yeah. Uh, Chris, I'm going to ask you the same question now and get your thoughts on it because I'm really interested in your also product side of things. Um, then for our last 10 minutes, I've actually just had a message. Um, apparently, Boris is um, auditioning for a new construction minister. Um, and I'm going to ask each of you three to um, uh, give me your uh, pitch um, in two or three minutes for construction minister to make it the biggest bang for our buck over the next five or 10 years to make sure that we really turn the dial. So you've got a free hand on legislation. There's a majority of 80 waiting to vote for all the measures that you actually want to bring in. Um, and you're going to have a free hand to tell us how to change the industry. But before we come on to that, Chris, and I'll go around on my screen. So I'm going to ask Helen, Aidan, Chris that as our, as, as our finale. Um, Chris, but I'm interested in your thoughts on the productization of things like heat pumps and what we can do to accelerate those industries. I, I mean, I, I broadly agree with Aidan. I think I think where there's opportunity there, um, pe people will, will move towards that economic uh, opportunity. I mean, it's every time this happens, it, it's a it's a bit of a mini gold rush, right? And you're going to get some cowboys who who mess things up and make it a bad name for it. Um, I, I think the difficulty. And we saw this with the feed-in tariff is sometimes these programs are too successful um and when they're too successful like the government panics and then they close it down which is what we saw the feed-in tariff right it like it the, the the usage went like this when the predictions were like this and then they went oh crap like and, and they just had the backpedal because it, it just wasn't funded to the same level um with, with the new heat pump incentive the five five thousand pounds per you know it's wonderful. I think we saw we saw this glut, and and now there's this blockade, especially around supply chain. But it doesn't fundamentally, from retrofit, it it with good design. And Helen Helen could talk through this with with their work at Bride and Wood. Like you don't start with the technology; you start with the the building fabric, right? And and we're not and we're not addressing uh, insulation, 
double glazed windows, air tightness, all these things that are fundamental before you add the technology to the building. We could throw PV and, and heat pumps on buildings, but if they still leak like a sieve, it doesn't matter, right? Where they're still gonna be using lots of energy that could go to other things. So I think when we look at the retrofit, um, market. We've, we've got to address the things that, that aren't super sexy and like insulating houses isn't the sexiest thing in the world. It's not it's not the greatest technology. It's like you either insulate on the outside or you insulate on the inside and like either and, and if you do it on the outside, it's a planning issue. And if you do it on the inside, it's a it's a, a loss of space issue. So like, you know, what are you going to do? You got to do one of them. Um, and then same with with windows and same with air tightness. So I think from a from a product standpoint, honestly today right now it's probably a supply chain issue and that just goes back to fix or mend and right you know we live in a globalized world where stuff doesn't get made here anymore um and so you know when when boats go sideways in the suez canal and wars break out and and everything else um it shows the how how fragile um our, our whole ecosystem is in terms of supply chain and product. If we can't physically get those heat pumps that are manufactured from, you know, 15 different countries to make the components to bring here, it's, it's, a, it's a tough thing. But if, when that gets solved, cause it will, you know, the, the market will create itself. I, I, I'm confident, I, I'm confident in, in what Aiden said there. Um, but I just think we're solving the wrong problem. I think we got to look at insulation and fabric first. It's the same as we would look at as a new building. Like let's let's use that same approach. Yeah. So pitch time, um, Helen, you've got uh, this is your uh, pitch to be the new minister of construction to actually convince um, uh, uh, Boris that you can get your um, uh, his the the the, the COP26 uh, report with the ten things in uh, can actually be be, be made real. So what are the three or four things you would do in your pitch uh, to turn the dial and make the industry vastly better? First of all, I would never be construction minister, ever. Um, <laughs> politics is just not my thing. Um, but I, I think there's been a lot of development in the well, I mean, you, you, you are number 2,427th on the list, so... Uh, okay, all right then. Um, so I think there's been a lot of work towards decarbonizing new builds getting towards net zero carbon i don't necessarily agree that we're the 100 percent of the way there but at least on the roadmap and it's moving and um, so i think um we've just had loads of conversation about retrofit so for me it's all about retrofit um passive design of the retrofit so uh improving insulation uh, air tightness uh the quality of occupant comfort because as soon as we make something more airtight we're going to run the risk of overheating so getting that balance right and um, so retrofit is probably number one um supporting the circular economy and material passports we've had loads of conversations today about that and i think that's really super important um doing both of those things for regulation probably is the way forward um but also there's Big industry groups, things such as Letty, which has got people, um, experts from the construction industry, from all the way from architects, engineers, um, supply chains, construction, everything together. And they're working through a lot of these problems. They're putting out guides um, to help us as an industry. And actually, if the government could take some or a bit of more involvement in that, I think that would, um, groups such as that would help to do a lot of the sort of legwork if you like and collectively we can come to better decision making. Brilliant. So do you have any, any particular policies you would do, um, particular levers you would do to make those really good things happen? I mean what, what, what are the hard levers you would pull? I mean part Z which is the potential embodied carbon building regs that might come into play at some point. That's an obvious one. Um, but extending that into circular economy would be a really good idea. And I think the other regulation would be something towards retrofit. What that would look like, I'm not entirely sure because it's such a big area. Um, but encouraging the use of more decarbonised heat sources, um, a fabric first approach, all those kind of things um, would be really good. And also just retaining buildings um, instead of knocking them down and rebuilding. Okay. 
Aidan, over to you. Here's your pitch. Oh, I'll look forward to becoming the most left-wing um, Tory minister in history. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, I think that, like everything Helen said, is incredibly sensible. I think in terms of, I was trying to think of stuff you could do around legislation that isn't just immediately money costing, because it's it's quite like. I would be going to the Chancellor Exchequer, who I don't even know who that is anymore, but whoever that is all the time, and um, begging them for money um, for various programmes. Because So around retrofit, we've already got the stuff where landlords have to bring it up to a level D on their EPC in order to be, in order to uh, rent it to private tenants. I think another thing you could do that's similar to that to speed it along would be a point of sale, but it has to be a certain point because a vast, a, a decent chunk of housing is never actually shipped onwards. So you could move that up to a D or you could move it up to the sort of within a, a few points of maximum as well if it can't get to a D because a lot of historical houses can't necessarily get there or houses can't get there. Um, so you could do something around that in order to force private money to solve it. Uh, um, you, might do, you might need to tighten up the assessors around something like that as well. Um, because I, I know back in the day when we were doing solar, like anecdotally, let's say anecdotally, you could definitely get EPCs favourably if you needed to. Um, but so that might need to be tightened up. Um, I think you would, uh, in terms of, I would probably try and do something to ensure harmonisation with the EU in many ways, because where um, with EU legislation and EU standards, because. I think that, as as we've talked about here, standardization is actually super key to everything in the manufacturing for product manufacturers. And to have, you've got your three big standard blocks in the world of the US, the EU, and China. The last thing that the last thing the UK wants to do is try and go its own way because it will be late. It will be later to have the newer products coming to us. So I think, like I know it's a bad thing at the moment, and I know we've, we're getting Brexit done and everything, but actually standardization across that would probably be good for uh, sustainability. Um, something that's uh, I think would be interesting to look at how to legislate around or to create would be um, at the moment we obviously have to design to certain like uh, you were designing to certain standards in terms of energy use. I think what would be interesting would be to force people rather than design to a specific standard is to have it measured as it was after five years of use and have it then back analyzed and to then have a penal like some kind of penalty imposed if because we all know about the gap analysis uh, we yeah. all know that it's not designed in some way it's used so okay well we need to be better than that let's know how it's used and design to how it is actually used and then sort of like solve it that way and then have a um some kind of some kind of something coming back if it's not right and i don't know exactly what that is it might need to be redesigned you might have to pay for your own upgrades it might be a financial something like that um I think I, I, I'm, going to cut, I'm going to cut you there, and I, but I agree with it. I mean, Paul Morell this morning spoke about the gap analysis on buildings, oh, and it's huge. And, and, and technology must be better than that. Our industry must be better. Um, so, and you also raised the point of the um, compulsory retrofit when you sell a house, which is in the six carbon budget, um, but has not got the popular um, uh, sort of it hasn't it hasn't made the um, technical press yet. Um, I, I think it could be another poll tax because it just basically I, I wonder how the Great British Public will deal with losing 20 30 grand to fix every house however i don't know of any other way of doing it so i think it's a hugely interesting political point um and i i, I hope we have politicians brave enough to follow that one through chris over to you for our last three minutes um for your pitch for uh, a construction minister which are the levers you'd pull to make a very quick good change on decarbonization i i, I mean much like helen i have no interest in being a, a construction minister <laughs> Um, I'm very happy not being in politics. Um, going last is, is is good and bad. All the all the good ideas seem to have, have gone, but you have time to formulate new ones, and and my brain's not firing that quickly today. The 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 thing I keep coming back to is planning, um, and and looking at um, an overhaul of planning regulations around requirements. Um, we've got. I don't even know how many uh, planning uh, departments we now have in, in England, let alone the UK, but they're, they're all slightly nuanced and that just makes life um, incredibly more difficult when we talked about standardization and productization, like starting there as well. So having having councils and, and planning departments um, overhauled so that maybe we can look at pre-approvals for, for a productized approach where if buildings have 
are productized or standardized approach that meet certain metrics, then then they go through quicker, and maybe that'll get us to again affordable housing quicker at a price we can afford at at a carbon zero. Um, part Part Z, absolutely. I think that's a bare minimum. I think I'd pair that with a carbon tax, um, and and you know carrot and stick, or maybe stick and stick. Um, <laughs> Like at some point we have to get real about about a carbon tax in this country and actually you know start to start to enact something that looks and acts like a carbon tax in a real way. Um, and again, around retrofits, there's 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 something there. Helen Helen and Aiden both talked around it. I don't know, know what the mechanism is, but there's a lot of good. Um, oh gosh, what's the? There's a. Uh, um, a standard out of the Netherlands for retrofits that a number of the councils are starting to utilize on their own stock, but starting to utilize programs like that that are trying to drive towards passive house style on retrofits as a as a construction method. I think would be would be would 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 backfill that that um, uh, performance that we're seeing from a carbon standpoint in all the existing housing stock. So. I think those are the three big things: planning, Part Z with a carbon tax, and then and then en enacting some sort of retrofit legislation. Excellent. Thank you for your pitches. Um, we'll get back to you later on today after the next round of resignations to let you know where you sit in the pecking order. Um, thank you hugely to Helen, Aidan, and Chris for massively insightful thoughts all the way through. Um, it's been a really fascinating conversation, and thank you for the really great ideas. Um, with that, I'm going to hand back to Dan um, for ready for the break, I think, Dan. Uh, yes, you're correct, Tim. Thank you for that. Uh, the excellent housekeeping. And I won't lie, I'm going to steal the um, the uh, you know the minister pitch question for, for future things, because I thought it worked very well. And it's a nice way of summing up. So, so well done, you. And thank you, everyone, for that very interesting talk. Um, my, I think my notes for this one are quite long. Um, so yes, so as, as mentioned, we are going into our final break of the day now. So what we're going to do is we are going to return at 20 to 4, where we're going to talk about the economic value the digital can help provide, uh, and then we'll be finishing off the day. So I think everyone, if you're listening, make sure you get outside, stretch your legs. At the very least, walk down to the end of your garden and back if you need to. But I think a screen break is always beneficial, and I just want to thank Aidan, Helen, Chris and Tim for, for one, providing a really interesting discourse there about everything that's happening and two, for helping out with the event. So thank you all for coming. I hope you enjoy the rest of your, your day and we will see the rest of you after our break for our final session. Thank you. Thanks, Tim. Thanks, Tim. Thank you. Thanks, folks. No. Cheers, Aidan. Thank you. for the final session. Uh, so what we're going to do now is we are going to move on to a discussion uh, on the economic value, productivity and efficiency. So what I'd like to do is um, I invite Jonathan to join me. Um, if you want to turn on your camera and say hello fella. And while you find the buttons and sort that, um, we may also have a special guest joining us in a minute or two, but we'll see what happens then. Um, and then the idea now is we'll round off the sessions that we've been doing and then from that then we will move forward with everything else. Um, now Jonathan, I see you're in the chat, so I know you are around. It's just whether you're able to find the button to unmute yourself and put your webcam on. Right, uh, well, Jonathan obviously might be pulling himself up a cup of tea or something. So in the interim, what I will do is just mention a few quick things. Um, ah, perfect. There you are. I can't hear you, fella. Hello. There you go. Ah, sorry about that. That is all right. Um, so um, how are we doing? Very well, thank you. You done? How has the day been so far for you? It's been really good. Um, there's been lots of interesting things that, that, that have come up today. Um, I think it's been quite interesting. I think weirdly when, as we 
slowly meander into the productivity conversation. Um, I think, you know, when we're talking about social value and the environment and stuff, all of it is, there's a subtext of productivity in there always anyway, in terms of trying to achieve outcomes and do those bits and pieces. Um, but, you know, one of the interesting things I think Paul Morrell talked about was that we can't expect government to, to solve these problems for us. We've got to solve them ourselves. Um, just in terms of you know, innovating and doing things better, you can't just always expect handouts. Um, but I think interestingly, finding where we can use things for our own personal benefit is where that fits in a bit. Because you know, if you're, I mean, you work for you know a large multinational corporation. Um, you know, I imagine if someone said to you, "We need you to do this digital thing. It's cool." And then the first answer would be, "Well, okay. Well, you know, how does it help us?" Um, so, you know, how, it might be interesting first if you want to introduce yourself properly um, and then maybe talk about how digital new things might come into WSP in that way. Yeah, so hi, uh, Jonathan Monkley. I head up the digital team or digital services team at WSP. I'm also a co-host on the Digital Twin Fan Club podcast uh, and a founder of something called Zero Construct. I've I'm an architect by training, but I've been involved in kind of the UK digital movement since kind of 2009 when I first graduated. Um, so it was interesting before this uh, this event, uh, I did some kind of traditional Googling as my entire career is based on Google on, on productivity and what kind of uh, drove me into the BIM space. And I remember it, draw, it drove me back to the... Um, 2011, I think. Um, what the government strategy report with the, yeah. the quote. Yeah. Yeah. Hi, Reese. Uh, Hello. 50% faster delivery through BIM of projects. 33% um, lower costs and 50% improvement in exports. But I think what that highlighted to me was the, the fact that sometimes I think we're a little bit over ambitious with things like innovation and productivity. And I think sometimes you just need, like, as you mentioned, what, what brings innovation at WSP? Um, I think there is improvement in being a corporate, we are shareholder driven, we're profit driven, money driven. So unless like um, productivity and innovation comes in through better ways of doing stuff, adding a new service, uh, something we focus on a lot, um, is, using the the term cautiously but digital twin is something that is 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 new to us and we're exploring what that means to us as a business and, and what services we can offer around that but i think more importantly for clients and and like macro level uh on operator on operator of assets there's a potential productivity gain there for them they can reduce that the increased energy efficiency of their assets across if they own 100 buildings uh, they can they can knock five grand a year off the energy use through through smart, um, and that's that's a gain for them. So there's various different ways I think productivity comes into play. No, that sounds interesting. I think we'll conversationally we'll I think we'll jump on those targets you mentioned. It's probably a good place to jump because they're they're interesting. But before that, then um, we'll we'll introduce Reese properly. So thank you for joining us, Fala. I appreciate you've uh, you've you've been jet set in and you've you've flown today and you've done all sorts. So it's it's great to have you here. Oh, my pleasure. Always always a uh, an honour to share the, the the digital screen with you, gentlemen, and uh, and talk shop. So uh, yeah, I just got back from a trip with a team in uh, in Switzerland, which is where our H H HQ is. But I'm actually in somewhere far more prettier in sunny South Wales in Merthyr Tydfil, not too far away from Dan. So uh, yeah, I'm uh, I'm Rhys Lewis. I'm uh, one of the directors at a company a company called Revisto. Uh, we're a technology provider, a cloud-based collaboration tool, uh, all focused around bringing uh, productivity and efficiency gains to construction projects, as John just detailed out for us. And uh, I'm also the UK BIM Alliance uh, Community Chair for, for Wales, um, which Dan is also part of. So that, that that's me. No, good. And um, I guess I'll we'll, we'll start that same question I asked Jonathan to you as well, Fatter, which is, I guess, around... You know how does it's broadly around that that personal level of productivity because if, if the idea of this session is you know how do people get economic value from doing digital stuff and you know without 
without going into the um, into the details of what Revista do, I think a lot of what your stuff is is directly around productivity improvements. Mm -hmm. um, and actually, yeah, yeah. from from a from a customer point of view, what are they? I assume they're not after faster horses, but how do they? How does that conversation come in about digital support in their productivity? A yeah, big question, I think. As a a technology provider, but mainly as a, an advocate, coming back to what what John said about these these, these so-called benefits of embracing BIM and, and all things digital. Twin, I, I'm just a firm believer that technology can help us as an industry move forwards, uh, and and everyone really from a productivity um, perspective. So, what our clients are telling us, or why they look at our tool is because they want to deliver more projects um, effectively we're all in this looking at the bottom line right so if we can help all of our clients um, deliver more projects then that's a big win that's a win-win for us, us both so i think what we still see a lot of is people still working in a very you know, traditional way i'll say with inverted commas because that means different things to different people but just doing things uh, a, a lot longer than they potentially could should be um, when their competitors are using digital tools to to get things done much much quicker so that's where we really see the benefits of how technology can help with productivity if we can help you get back to doing the the, the engineering stuff that you you've studied to, to to do or you've been doing for the last 15 20 years wouldn't it be nice if we could take some of those very manual um painful tasks away from you and allow you to, to get back on to, to the stuff that you're you're employed and to do and enjoy doing no that's that's interesting because uh i don't well i will i will flip it over to, to how jonathan sees it as well because i think i remember years ago i did a, a presentation in what used to be um eco build at the time where i think i talked about this idea that with digital it allows the robots to be more robotic and the people to be more people in, in that essence because like you're talking about there you know if you want to do computational dynamics or something you let the machine do that but actually you know what you're professionally trained to do you can then focus on and there was an interesting stat i remember seeing which is people in an office roughly spend a fifth of their time looking for files um so wow. yeah i know it's it's it, it was it it was a there was a white paper at some point that mentioned it and i i was i was shocked by it and but i can imagine actually how many times do i click in a folder to look for something instead of hitting you know my windows button you know other buttons may be available um but the idea of just typing the search in to find it is 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 more of an attitude we need because you can't go on the internet go into a folder that says fiction go in a folder that says non-fiction or something and then find your website you have to search for it um quite often if you don't know the address and i think that as you say it's an interesting idea that what you're coming towards is digital is allowing someone to do more of their job more of the time and i guess from a wsp point of view maybe i, I don't it's a cheeky question what is utilization like in the office and how much of it is maybe spent on finding stuff or admin tasks and things that the age-old battle of utilization targets. Um, being a being a, being a big company, utilization is one of one of our metrics, and it's interesting how much people do, dwell on that as a and they get everyone is pushed for utilization. In my opinion, utilization doesn't always mean productivity. I don't think. Um, but you're right. Things like take take for example pre-pandemic, face-to-face -face meetings were massive. Everyone travelled everyone would head to offices um and i was in a, a my role years before that was very virtualized so i was already pushing and my teams were already pushing the idea of using teams and and meeting virtually and it was a that was a very productive thing for us so um not traveling you get more time in the day to do work be productive earn money deliver your clients projects i think during the pandemic um teams has gone the other way in some cases i think you get invited to too many virtual meetings because everyone can invite you and it's it's gone the opposite way it's become less productive because your diary is just jam-packed with teams meetings nine mm -hmm. eight till five o'clock uh we've had a big push to get people back in the office to get as reset get people doing people stuff again rather than just sit, sitting at home but then you look at people's diaries they go to the office, they stick a headset on and they're on Teams till five o'clock. 
with people <laughs> in other parts of the world. Yeah. So you, you give, you're forcing them to do half an hour commute there, half an hour commute back, sometimes longer, to collaborate with people outside of the offices. So that's been an interesting kind of productivity slash utilization battle that, that we're currently dealing with. Our team in particular is um, is very virtualized because our, 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 as a team, we're all over the place. We're not in one location. Our clients are in the UK, uh, Israel, Middle East, uh, London. Yeah. But I went to a, a face-to-face meeting on Monday, weirdly. Um, and that hour and a half with a client felt 10 times more productive from a relationship perspective than five virtual meetings over over a few months just because you can read people's body language you can see their energy you can see when they're going to speak it's and i yeah i think you forget that element of uh of like human interaction and the technology piece uh and thinking about like my drivers for going back to the 2011 bin piece it was like how do you draw some it was the it I got into into BIM originally, I think it was in my second ever lecture at uni, when a Chilean lecturer said, um, you can either go to all of the CAD classes and learn how to use AutoCAD on this random 3D tool I can't even remember. And he said, ignore all that and learn ARCHICAD and it'll do 3D models and produce drawings for you at the same time. And I was like, well, why would I be taught, why would I teach myself two things when I can do one thing to get twice as much output? And that was literally how I got into kind of my digital journey because that was like instantly more efficient. And that you, you kind of take, yeah, I've taken that into my career. And you look at, I remember in the early days of Revit and Revit adoption, it was how can you get an output through the least amount of clicks? So automated schedules. That to me, that that's how digital can drive productivity through automating what you would be a very mond- mundane task. Take the stuff, restores. Um, that digital element you would historically be putting drawings over a light table and getting some guy to check whether the drawings line up and marking it up with a red pen and sending them back to be amended and then again whereas restuffs will do that in seconds and auto automate it for you and then automatically tell the people uh that they need to fix stuff that that's mm-hmm. productivity but it's interesting how con- why construction isn't insanely more productive and I still can't get my head around that. Mm-hmm. It's, uh, I'm going to jump in there as well, John, because you've just said a couple of things that have made me think of the last couple of days coming back from our team meeting in person, uh, because we're, we're a much smaller company than yourselves, but I have the same challenge where people are remote, right? So like yourself, we've been geared up since we started to work remotely. So we've been able to support our clients, but uh, it was interesting having members of my team together for the first time you know, and they've been with the company for two years but have just not met their colleagues and I think to, it, looking at the people and the productivity piece it, it really made me appreciate how much we appreciate our people and seeing them together uh, it just felt like you know looking at this productivity piece if you can have your uh, your staff your the organization just feeling valued then i think that that will really help in that productivity piece as well because they want to work smarter and harder and more efficiently so i think that 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 potentially is uh, a big part of playing this as well you know it's not just product process it's it, it's people as well right so and i think we've all missed being back in person and the second thing you said john was about having that meeting with your client that was much more productive than uh, any online session. I was uh, I was giving a lecture down at UWE a couple of months back and I stopped in to see um, one of our clients. And that, I just felt, you know, being sat in the room with somebody, they were just so much more open to talk openly rather than being sat in another Zoom Teams go to meeting call whereby you know something's recording and I've got to be so careful what what I say what I what I can and can't say and this was just it was a human conversation again which I think was uh, which was much more productive. No, and it's it's interesting, isn't it? Because I think it's inter- And while we're swapping in persons, my first in person for ages was literally yesterday. We had an all day planning meeting for something, and it was well we had been in person. And I think what it's what it's telling me, and at least this is seems to be what we're circling around, is that ultimately you need to use the right tool for the job some of those tools might be digital some of those might be physical and actually what we should be doing is that meetings are a last resort because you should be able to solve it via email or teams chat or something first and if you can't solve it in a quick exchange 
you know, you then go, right, what's the next tool we need to use to try and solve this problem? What's the next tool we need to use to solve this problem? And then the meeting is like the last tool in that list. But mm -hmm. because, you know, you can sit there and go, right, we have an hour meeting, you know, look at our day rates. This meeting has cost X thousand pounds for us to sit there and say, yeah, good idea. You go off and, and do what you thought. Um, so I think it's trying to weave it into process. So I think, as you said, Reese, there, that the people element is quite important because mm -hmm. it's not just about magpie in and saying, right, we've got this new piece of software. You know, it, it does drone photo uh, photogrammetry and you can get 4,000 pictures every square inch and you can get something super <laughs> precise. And then you say, yeah, but we're a digital marketing company. What are we going to use that for? Um, <laughs> I appreciate it won't be that extreme, but if people don't think about how the tool actually helps them or how they can integrate it to make their lives smarter, not harder, then I think that's where the real value comes in. I think, you again, being, uh, I think I also think that the construction sector has it's got to a point of like technology saturation where people just can't take on any more tech because there's a tool for everything and uh, I think people need to either it's something we've been pushing like really focusing on becoming good at what you are using and improving what you are using or refocusing on the why you're adopting something uh, particularly from like the digital piece like there is a tool or there's 10 tools for everything and the, it one of the interesting things I noticed in digital construction week and other, other events that are available um, was that new startups uh, in the tech space don't even necessarily necessarily sell, necessarily sell themselves as a service. They just point to who they're similar to, mm. which was a little bit disappointed. <laughs> and it's like, oh, we're just the same as them. It's like, great, well, um, <laughs> that they're not coming in with you. There's just so much tech available now. I think individuals and businesses and projects. I mean, take take like 4D as an example. Um, properly adopted digital rehearsal and program optimization through like a really good 4D process can have huge impacts on productivity on site and just lack, just getting rid of mistakes, uh, stopping waste that has a, um, a carbon reduction element in there as well, which is obviously super important to everyone at the minute. But it's not, it's not a widely, a widely adopted thing. It's kind of, there's some of the major tier ones do it, uh, they might pick it up at Reva stage three. But they don't embed it as a process as business as usual from end to end. It's kind of, oh, we've done a pretty 4D, it's quite cool. Some major projects really push the adoption of it, but it's not adopted widely. And there's a huge productivity. I think the four, there's a the 4D construction group will say 5% reduction in cost and mistakes through 4D at a basic level. So that's 5% productivity gain, I think. Um, I don't know how you define productivity. That. Well, I mean, let's let's make this slightly more personal because I think you'll both have an answer to this, which is give me an example of something that your digital tools have picked up, like in that digital rehearsal. Give me something, you don't have to name the project, but you can just say on a project, someone noticed this and it must have say X months or X pounds Ooh, because of a per personal what they feel. Yeah, go on, let's have it. Right. So working on a, a data center, um, doing some 4D stuff digital rehearsal um the program manager had done a a program of the entire site it was a ten thousand long gantt chart um we produced a simulation of that um the way we did that was taking that gantt chart we also started speaking to the guys on site that were actually going to like do the thing so the program manager produced um how, how the foundation should be poured. We then went and spoke to the guy that was going to pour them and said, how are you going to do it? Is it the same as this? He then got a highlighter uh, from his printed PDF from his really intense uh, BIM project and then marked up how he was going to pour them. Uh, and it was entirely different um, to what the program manager had outlined that the rest of the project team was working to. We then used the digital tools to present that problem and stop that error occurring before it ever got to site. Now, that could have probably 150 grand a day run rate on that on that project per day. Just that. So if you if you you're knocking a couple of days off because the foundations are poured right, or the steel guy turned up and the foundation weren't poured, then that's that's it's quite a hard one to quantify. But mm -hmm. having the foundations poured right at the right time is definitely um, saving somebody some money somewhere. But it would have probably come out of the contract as risk pop, but 
because the error wasn't there, the risk was removed. But showing that breakdown in communication and showing the fact that there was a discrepancy in the program uh, from the guy who was massive, not massively removed, but was looking at a huge complex program to the guy that was taking labor, materials, plant equipment, um, and site logistics into, into play was, was, was very impressive as a super basic, but a really good way to remove errors. Yeah, I think we've got some similar examples, but and, and for us, of course, if if the the teams are using a platform like ours, then hopefully that that won't happen. But it's only when those things happen that these things get exposed as issues and problems that sh we want to avoid on future projects. So yeah, you know, I've heard all sorts of stats that vary drastically from tens of thousands to hundreds of thousands from projects all over the world, from you know thirty, forty million pound schemes in in sunny south wales to you know hundreds of millions of pounds worth of uh, you know, airports in, in in hong kong so it's uh yeah I, i've heard all sorts that, and the idea is that in moving forward so that that won't happen unfortunately these things need to happen for the decision makers on those projects to realize that they need to embrace these digital tools and move away from as you said john the the highlighter and the uh, the paper which is something for us as a vendor could, to consider because you you need to help people engage on that digital transformation journey and not feel like you're just picking them up out of one place and dropping them into a completely new sphere because they, they just won't embrace it. You know, these systems need to be uh, user friendly somewhat to help with that, uh, you know, that transformation piece. And then I remember being with a, a local authority um, just on the road from me doing a site walk with a client where they were uh, almost completed on one of the new uh, one of their new projects, one of their new schemes, and the contractor had um, left some mechanical equipment exposed in the the mail locker rooms. And I won't repeat what what the the client said, but he wasn't happy, and it was just a shame because, you know, coming back to what you just said, John, that breakdown in communication, he'd asked somebody uh, to change that, but it had just got lost in the mess, which is why we'd got brought in. So that didn't happen in the future. But what the issue. I felt bad for the, the contractor because they, they'd done an amazing job, but there was just that bit of taste in the client's mouth and when there just didn't really need to be, you know, and there wasn't really a massive cost on that, but it, the cost really was that uh, uh, client that wasn't too happy. So how do you quantify that? No, it's, it's interesting. And I think, you know, for the, for the purpose of this conversation, I'm not too worried about the, mon the money numbers, but I think from both both those sort of stories, the interesting bit for me is that, what's happened there is the digital tool has helped with communication because I think that from from the, from your anecdote there Jonathan about the, the foundations you know there's no reason why that program manager couldn't have spoken to the guy on site and actually understood that beforehand mm -hmm. uh, almost what's happened the bad version of the story is that he didn't do that and then you managed to flag it thankfully in time to intervene before it happened but the, the 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 right way that should have happened is that that communication should have happened in the first place and then you would have had a valid program to run mm. with so what you've done there is, is that you've managed to prevent an issue by reintroducing communication that should have been there and you know interestingly then again from your story there Reese, it's the same sort of problem whereby there was a comms that should have happened which was this track change audit trail based on the client request but it didn't happen and now you're using digital tools to catch an absence of communication. Mm -hmm. So is so from a, an economic value productivity point of view, is is that primarily where the digital tools sit? Is that they're helping to catch mistakes or they they or where processes fall down? Digital tools are the safety net. I mean, it, it's interesting that both of you have got uh, whether it's just by happenstance, there's they're all the similar examples with a similar kind of nut issue in there. I think at a micro level the communication and the, and the error picking up and massively at a, a kind of macro level i do think there's bigger picture pieces involved in things like where you could go really deep down the digital twin rabbit hole um but the idea of just assets being healthier um like the the office space being a nicer place to be having cleaner air having a better temperature having the right kind of uh, mix of space for people, understanding how people are feeling in that space. There's a there's an economic product productivity piece there. 
I know the the original um, like mandate to the National Digital Twin was like reduce the NHS bill, and you can kind of start to see that in the way clients are adopting smart to improve in just the quality of the spaces that they're offering their operators, so people are less stressed. The idea is something that the pandemic's pushed of office spaces being more flexible and people spending more time at home. I think it looks like we're all at home today. Um, the, the idea of office spaces being more about collaboration spaces than places you just go to sit. I think that the macro piece is different to the micro piece. Like the, the adoption of digital tools and projects is about resolving errors. But I think the point that the communication piece, Dan, but it's about the people and getting and making and getting the people to engage with the thing. So like my example, it was just highlighting communicating information to the right people. Like I could look at that program and go, yeah, that's all right, fine. But I'm not a program manager. I'm not I'm not a foundation pourer. The ability to kind of get the right people to see the information in a way that's consumable for them and take like clash detection in in the in the BIM process. Like we offer clash, we produce clash reports daily for teams, but all we do is hide the problems. Then it's then we need the right people to look at them and say, oh, that we need to resolve that. This is how we resolve this. It's still about the people and the people's training and the people's knowledge and experience that that's needed. I think Reese highlighted that point as well. It's about putting, letting people do the engineering bit and letting the computers do the hard work, and that then ties up to your piece, Dan, from Eco Build of getting computers to do the computational fluid dynamics bit and letting the people do the people bit. Mm -hmm. Well, no, exactly. And I'll, I'll just remind the audience as well, feel free to throw questions in in between as well that we can we can help address. Um, but I guess an interesting one with the class detection bit is that, you know, for, if we're talking about economic value and productivity, is that should it, shouldn't it come to you coordinated already i mean shouldn't the process be and, and i appreciate this is this is me and my british standards ivory tower but the point shouldn't you know if the structural engineer is going to share something shouldn't they have checked it against the other information that's already made available and i, I would have flagged at that point i can't share it because it isn't coordinated and they do the spatial coordination at their level and what you're catching is the mis the mistake bids, not the two million clashes clash report that tells someone there's a big piece of steel in the middle of a staircase. And actually, you know, again, is is are these digital tools making up for bad processes at times as well as helping good processes? I th this is very much, I got to say on that, but I think Reese will probably want to get the gloves off I, on this one. No, I think uh, it's probably. <laughs> led to, to you, John, because, I mean, we're, we're an enabler to try and help with that process, but whose responsibility is, anyway, yeah. that, that's definitely one for, for yourself. I think there's lots of different angles to that, Dan, and you, you're probably right, and it's the, I think the first piece that we need to get over is the idea of every building and every piece of construction within vertical and linear assets is generally still a prototype, like, so everything's being designed from scratch again, so there's going to be problems, and humans still make errors a uh, big push from us as a and me personally as an individual to really support a dfma and platform approach to construction because that allows you to stop the prototyping piece um someone i'm working with is this is not my statement but uh the idea of reba stage three in the future will be 30 seconds because you won't need to design it again it'll just all be already designed for you and I think that the idea of stuff being a prototype, there's always going to be errors in it. And it's just the nature of the human being. Procurement ties into the idea of errors. Procurement and project stages uh, tie into the idea of errors as well. Um, I think if you go back to kind of consultant fees from like the 2008 crash, they're still very tight. People want to do um, the, not, not being nasty, but sometimes they they just need to get what they need out the door to get paid a lot of the time and the idea of people being not getting innovated at reba stage three to the contractor they don't necessarily want to design it as it's going to be built they want to design it to what they have to deliver at that stage so they're designing errors um <coughs> sadly. so the, i mean some of the most successful digital projects i've worked on is when 
the, the entire team, including the contractor, knows they're going to work from a blank sheet of paper to hand over. So they, 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 there's a want to actually not make mistakes. When, a, when an architect is being forced to work, not forced, but is working for free for a client on a, on a speculative bid that they might get some work out of, they tend to just design it quickly to try and make something look visually good, but they don't necessarily work out the structure or the MEP requirements or the plant room. And then when the, the developer says, yeah, we might build something, they bring people on board, but they've already designed in a lot of errors. So there's, there's, there's a, lot of, a lot of different angles on it. And then that's when other tools come into play to highlight all the mistakes we've made in our design. Yeah, but the prototype, John, I guess, right? I, I like that, uh, uh, that explanation. And I think that's what we, the challenge I think we hear from a lot of projects when we're brought in is that sort of nervousness to share information because it, it's a prototype, as you said, or it's not ready and things are evolving. But uh, just coming back to the topic around productiv productivity and efficiency, where th that's been a massive focus for us as a company these last couple of years is listening to industry to understand how we can make that process better for, for everybody. And I've got some really interesting stats from, yeah, I can quote these because they've, they've already been reference elsewhere. So uh, multiplex mentioned by becoming more um, efficient in, in their processes from a uh, computers doing the computer stuff and the people doing the people stuff. Um, they, on average on each project now they're saving around 200,000 pounds. So that as a business, they've seen a, a massive uh, interest from you know, senior people to do more of the, to, to work in, in that smarter way, which is, which is tremendous. And then another one, ISG, they, they quoted a 50% time saving in coordination. And I think that sends a message out to the rest of the project team then, which sometimes can be blockers because of that nervousness to say, hey, look, we're collaborating. This is a prototype, as you said, John. And if we, if we get this together sooner rather than later, then it, it will hopefully benefit us all. But you know, that's, that's a barrier each project has to overcome individually. Um, but it's great to hear some of those golden nuggets which encourage people to do it. But I think we have more of the, um, the previous stories, John and Dan, than the, the, the golden nuggets at this point in time. Um, so we've got that transition. Hopefully we'll hear more and more of the good stuff, we'll, which means more people will embrace digital tech and all see the the efficiency and productivity gains others are no brilliant and i think what i'm going to do is i'm going to i'm going to move it on to almost the last point of our little discussion because we've got to finish at 20 past and i'm going to steal what tim chapman did earlier um which will be in which so don't panic it'll be interesting um, i'm just claiming it because i thought it was quite good um and so like you did with the environmental stuff so the context for for both of you is that you're about to pitch elevator pitch wise to the to the construction minister um and as a postcard who that will be now um as i'm just watching the news and seeing very interesting things <laughs> happen on my other screen um but you know you i want you to pitch what is the you know some of the the key takeaway for if for around productivity and using tech to help with economic value for a business and in particular you know there are we've got an audience here this webinar becomes on demand afterwards where the people can kind of view and watch it so if they're watching us talk through this and we're talking about all these interesting you know savings like you've mentioned from multiplex and others you know what what should someone take away as an elevator pitch as to why digital tools can help them and what's the either the pitfall to avoid or the, the mantra to follow or something similar and i have a cheeky one to finish with which we'll see We lost your sound, John, did we? I keep muting myself just to make there life a little bit easier. I think, so being involved in various kind of digital transformation projects in businesses at like corporate level, at team level, and the, the biggest lesson I've learned is always start with the problem that you're trying to solve and, and build your solution back from that. So what, what any if any business takes that approach, then you can generally have a good output and you can pick a solution or a technology stack or a process stack uh, that, that, that solves that. I think a mistake our industry has made a lot is it just throws technology at a problem it doesn't actually understand or know what problem it's trying to solve. It just thinks technology can solve it. And I, th I, th I think in a lot of ways, the original kind of BIM mandate 
did a lot of that because it threw a lot of technology at us and everyone spent millions of pounds on adopting tech and it didn't it hasn't necessarily adopted addressed a lot of the problems that we're trying to solve like even on our most advanced digital projects the pdf is still the ultimate thing that everyone is, is about that's the contract of deliverable they're the control documents we spend millions of pounds on developing the digital models and then it's the pdf and we we, we need to kind of in a lot of ways look at the why again and look at the problems that we are trying to solve and it's always the same things it's it's collaboration, it's investment and innovation, it's problem solving, it's people. Uh, procurement always comes to the top of the list. Um, mm -hmm. But it's not an easy, it's not an easy thing. It's a very complex project with a lot of money and a lot of people. But it's still an awesome industry with some really cool people working in it. No, yeah, really I'll, I'll, I'll be sure that sure. a bit of a ramble. I'll try and spice it up a little bit, John. Um, I, I, listening to the conversation, I think there, there, there's been a number of figures mentioned, and I think what we could do by you know, embracing these uh, these tools and processes is, is flip to the very similar figures that we, we talked about problems in two hundred thousand um, pound lawsuits or, or whatever it may be to two hundred k's worth pounds of uh, in saving by in, uh, embracing digital tools and building a a better built environment for us all. Um, which only hopefully encourages more spend in, in this area for, for everybody. So no, brilliant, thank you. And my, my, my slightly tongue in cheek one to end with is I think that we also need to make sure that when we invest in these tools, that the training comes along with them. Uh, and I remember a, a a slightly silly story I heard from someone once, which was um when they were called into a business and demanded our, our ideas on how to improve productivity. They opened their bag and they pulled out a touch typing lesson CD and said, there you go, give that to every member of your staff and you will have a three to five percent productivity improvement. And I think that, you know, when you actually look at what we do, the two most used pieces of software on my screen at the moment are Outlook and PowerPoint. And I can say, honestly, I've never been professionally trained on how to use either of those tools. And there might be a button in PowerPoint that would save me hours of writing a deck for my next presentation. I hope there isn't, because then I'll cry knowing I should have known that four years ago. But you know, the point is that you know there are there are tools that we use all day, every day as part of uh, digital tools that are meant to help us. You know, develop reports, do presentations, do class detection, uh, you know, produce schedules and everything else. But if you're not actually shown how to exploit that tool properly, are you actually hindering the productivity improvement? But you're still bearing the full cost of that tool and the process that's in there. A great point. But but then is training seen as productive to the company that you work for? Because you, then your utilization drops because you're spending half a day or three days getting trained. It's it's a tough battle. But I remember in one of my first senior BIM roles, the training uh, in tech versus investment split was something like ninety nine point four percent investment in tech, point four percent investment in training. So there was insane amounts of tech. But no one, no, no one was trained in using it. So it was, the split was mental. It should be 50 50, really. If you get given a tool, you should be at least be offered to be trained to be competent in it. Oh, yeah. I mean, that was, that was a long oh, time ago. Oh, yeah. was back in the day. Couldn't agree more, but we, we could talk for, for a lot longer on that, Dan. But yeah, totally agree with that point. No, we could, but, but, but no, thank you both for that. I think that's been really interesting. So what I'll do is I'll release you both back to the rest of, you, of your day. So thank you for that. That's been super helpful and insightful. Uh, Reese, you probably need some us. rest after all your traveling, but thank uh, you for joining us. Ready to go again. Life. Thanks for having me. Thanks for joining, Reese. Right. Cheers, guys. Right, well, thank you, John. You. Take care. Thanks, Dan. Fab. And so what I'm going to do is I'm just going to finish off our day um, and do a quick bit of summing up. Uh, somehow we've managed to stay exactly on time as well. So I just thank you to all our speakers who have who have kept both innovation and insight uh, and time management all together as part of one thing. Um, and you know, don't worry, I'm not going to spend ten minutes summing up either. So uh, I'll if you just give me a couple of minutes to sum up, um, we will finish for today. Um, at the start, I promised you this idea of a narrative where we would talk through various parts of the day around how digital can support the built environment. Uh, we started with the idea that we had Paul Morrell come and talk and give us various insights about some of the problems in the built environment. 
um, some things that are unique to us and issues that we have. Um, I won't dwell on them too much because I did that in the, the, the morning sum up, but certainly things like lack of foreign competition and some other bits mean that actually often we don't typically want to innovate. And sometimes even when we're told to innovate, we, we're not even sure what the benefit is um, to try and solve some of those things. Um, interestingly then, when we heard from um, the later sessions, including the one then that uh, Mo chaired around reshape and disruption with a number of the startups, was actually talking about this idea of changing behaviors in organizations and actually looking at a communication piece. Because quite often the process and the things that are changing is actually about talking to people and getting that language and the interchange understood between them and uh, understanding the values of those you were trying to change. Uh, so, so it's quite difficult to go in and you know, speak a, a foreign language or use jargon from another industry because people want to feel comfortable and there's this tough balance between change and comfort that needs to be addressed. Before lunch then we had this conversation about what other industries are doing and there's lots of interesting things from uh, both Hamzen and Margareta on that, you know, particularly including things like how some of the novel stuff we're talking around uh, in relation to project alliance in and kind of that, that stakeholder element on projects are things that have been discussed in other sectors, you know, since the 20s. And then actually there are some things that we might consider quite novel that are just done as the norm in other sectors. Uh, we heard very briefly then from Jonathan Reese, where we were teasing the idea of things like digital twins, which we know, you know NASA have done since the 90s from an aerospace point of view. So I think there are lots of um, areas that other sectors can show us, but at the same time, there are similar problems happening that are shared collectively, which come from things like lack of skills, um, brain drains from people leaving industries, and actually just a lack of resource being pulled in who are competent and capable to do the work. This afternoon then we had a nice little array of different value capitals and how things can come about from them. Um, Gavin and I, um, well, Gavin mainly spoke about you know, a lot of the social stuff and actually drew it into that city and community level, talking about things like travel distances, supporting neighborhoods, and it was a very much a very outcome-based approach, looking at what are the societal needs of those areas and how digital can help to achieve them where that being, you know, trying to prevent damp and cold in, part, in various buildings using sensors and similar to look at the internal environments, to actually looking at how to deal, use technology to actually deal with loneliness or how to integrate transport systems, other things together. Um, conversely, then looking at the environmental aspects and somehow digital can help there. Um, interestingly, you know, this idea that before the 1950s, we would actually fix and repair things, but actually post 1950s, we typically replaced with new and how that changed the way that from an environmental point of view, we were designing for obsolescence and we now need to focus more on that circular economy based um, model, but don't have the trust in those products necessarily in the way they've been kept. So could we use digital tools and processes to understand whether that bean has been overstressed, what projects has it been before, but actually so you can understand the performance and the, the strain that have gone on to them so that we can move things forwards. And ultimately changing some of the models whereby, you know, should we be designing hospitals more like we do things like iPhones and uh, other smart devices where we actually iterate on a standardized design or standardized parts of that design at the, the piece, space or component level um, and you know, have that sort of model instead of treating everything as it's unique and as various different prototypes as we heard about there. And then ultimately then as we finished off then talking about productivity, it's about trying to work out really how digital fits into your process. We heard then about this idea that you know, digital tools have saved people an awful lot of money uh, and that's by weaving it into the way that people do design um, and construction, they're able to actually put the process in so it achieves a real result. It creates an outcome. And by only by looking at your processes and how you can weave those in, make sure people are competent to use those tools, we can ultimately get there. Uh, and I think that hopefully is a sufficient sum up for the day. So what remains for me to say is thank you very much for joining us um, for today's webinar. I've certainly found it very interesting. I hope you have too. Um, and as a call to action then, if you wanted to find out more about some of the stuff that we do in BSI, two uh, key things. I think the first will be to go see what we do 
from our knowledge services and our built environment side. We do lots of interesting work in the built environment. Feel free to go explore that. Uh, more interestingly, are things like our monthly webinar series, which we spoke about earlier, where we have things coming up around the, the competency program to support the Build and Safety Act, things like the digital management of fire safety information and the launch of the S99001, which is looking at quality specifically in the built environment. So there's lots of stuff going on. There are many um, free events that we're putting on to help inform the industry about what's happening as well as the other work that we are doing. So please have a look at those links and explore things further. And other than that, I just wish you safe travels, a good rest of the day, and all the best for the future. Thank you.